throughout my life, until the Japanese invasion, I believed that I was one of the luckiest people in the world to be born in the British Empire and to live under the British flag. And it is no exaggeration that every night when I say my prayers, we were all Roman Catholics, I used to thank Jesus for his great, great gift to me of being born in the British Empire. But when the Japanese invaders, Malaya and Singapore, and when the unconditional surrender of 100,000 British soldiers to 30,000 little Japanese soldiers took place, this whole world in which I had been living until then was completely shattered. In the 19th century, the heyday of empire, Britain used to send a gunboat or a regiment to stamp on any threat to its colonial interests. The Ashanti in Africa, the Sepoys in India, the Egyptians in Alexandria. In 1982, Britain sent a task force to seize back the Falklands, one of its last and most distant colonies. This expedition aroused again the spirit of an empire ready and able to look after its own. I'm very glad that we had a sense of honor. We weren't going to let the British territory be overrun. I'm glad that we had still the almost Elizabethan sense of gamble of being prepared to send a task force 8,000 miles away without assured air cover to recover what we lost? Well, we said we would do it. We then proceeded to do it, and the world was amazed. And I think there is no doubt at all that it put the bee bra back into Britain. I was very disturbed because it really meant a restoration of colonialist feeling. Uh, oh, it was hardly hidden in the case of Mrs. Thatcher and mem members of the government. But it in, in indicated again uh, a readiness uh, to go to war in order to maintain a, a, a distant part of the world as part of the British Empire. Until the start of this century, the empire flourished thanks to the occasional use of brute force. This allowed the guardians of empire to conduct their business like gentlemen. When Sir Edward Elgar composed his imperial theme song, a few Britons ruled a quarter of mankind. It was the biggest empire the world has ever known and seemed as permanent as the waves. I was very proud to be part of the empire. I used to love seeing the map with the red on it. And uh, I was also proud of being an Australian, of course, but we were part of the empire, a very important part of it too. England was home to us. In fact, people here in my day referred, when they were going to England, they always referred to it as we were going home. So it was as close as that. And our loyalties very much lay in England. I wasn't directly aware of the pressure of the imperialist government. It merely was an atmosphere in which they controlled everything and told you everything. And as you knew nothing else, you went along. Uh, colonialism then was so integrated with the West 
that those of us who urged that uh, imperialism should be ended were regarded as crazy. Aden, Bahamas, Barbados, the Suto land, Bechuanaland, Bermuda, British Guiana, British Honduras, Brunei, Cyprus, Leo, Singapore, Somaliland, Tanganyika, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, Western Pacific Islands, the Windward Islands, Zanzibar. The empire was too much to take in. To some it meant a sacred trust, justice and democracy, progress and civilization. To others it meant vicious oppression, alien autocracy, exploitation. To Noel Coward, it was all just a bit ridiculous. It's such a surprise to the Eastern eyes to see that though the English are a seat, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides, every native hides in glee because the simple creatures hope he will impale his solar topi on a tree. It seems such a shame when the English claim the earth that they give rise to such hilarity and mirth. <laughs> but mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday, 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 out in the midday sun. That sun, they used to say, never set on the British Empire. When the new King Emperor, George V, visited Delhi in 1911, he knew that behind the pomp and circumstance lay the unswerving loyalty of the Indian army. In the First World War, two and a half million colonials joined up. It was their readiness to die that gave the British Empire its victory. But the cost was so high that millions felt this must be the war to end all wars. We began the No More War movement after the war it was taken up amazingly throughout the world and we had uh, uh, simultaneous demonstrations oh, in the capital of very many countries indeed and of course we not only demanded no more war we demanded the end of imperialism which was so largely the cause of war the First World War led to nationalist uprisings against imperial control. In India, Britain rode out the storm. But near home in Ireland, and at the imperial crossroads in Egypt, Britain was forced to yield. The end of empire had begun. In 1920, Britain had responded with a propaganda gesture on a grand scale. The heir to the throne was put to work, together with his friend and relation, Lord Mountbatten, what did one really know about the empire? Very little. Most of it was hard to get at. There was no air travel in those days, and practically no films to reveal it to us. So all I knew was what I'd read and heard. My cousin, the Prince of Wales, was the most popular figure at that time. It was considered that nothing could be better for empire relations than a tour around it by the Prince of Wales. The Prince and Mountbatten sailed right round the world, even calling it tiny colonies like Trinidad. I was teaching at Queen's Royal College, and I achieved the honor of shaking the hand of the Prince, which a whole lot of people didn't, because you can't shake too many hands in a day or two. Wonderful, but it first made me what? What are they fussing about that? I shook his hand. I walked wrong with him and then he said goodbye. In fact, often it was a problem of protecting him from his enthusiastic admirers. Quite early on, he started the practice of shaking hands with his left hand because his right hand was almost crushed with the warmth of people's greetings. I was taken into town, of course, and the crowds were absolutely hilarious with excitement. And even then, he, 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 he was very young then, of course, with very golden hair, very attractive looking, and with great charm. And it came across even, even though you were watching him from a window, but everywhere he went, people were enchanted by him. And all the girls, of course, were charmed off their feet. 
After six months, the Prince and Mountbatten returned to Britain, secure in the belief that Britannia, or more exactly her Royal Navy, still ruled the waves. The British Empire had been built up by the superiority of British naval power over any other country, really dating back to the Armada. It took a little time to develop. But the British Navy was the link between the different parts of the English-speaking world. It was the self-governing dominions of India or the colonies. So it was absolutely central and vital. I suppose we regarded the Navy as being the cement of empire. I'm sure it, it was just that. It was our sure shield in those days, and we thought of it as such, and we were a part of it. The senior service expected to be taken seriously, at least most of the time. Behind the bravado, the awkward truth was that after World War I, Britain was deeply in debt. The British could not afford the naval supremacy they took for granted. Both Japan and America would soon be able to outrun and outgun the Royal Navy. So in 1922, a great conference was held at Washington, where the major maritime powers concluded a strange defense agreement. Britain broke off its treaty with World War I ally Japan, and all the powers agreed to limit the size of their navies. In a spirit of economy and no more war, many ships were scrapped. Well, more is a pity about the Washington Treaty, I think. As so often happens, we, the law-abiding citizens, stuck to it, others did as they liked. It was a, a disaster in many ways for us. We had to sink the Australia outside the heads. There's no more war. War for civilization has been won, and we could uh, relax and live, live under the Washington Treaty. The Washington Treaty, uh, in the words of my uh, great uh, boss, uh, Admiral Lord Cunningham, uh, he said, that was the end of the uh, Royal Navy and uh, of the British Empire as the first naval power of the world, the beginning of the end. And this meant that um, instead of having overwhelming superiority in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, we were really reduced to the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And so we built the base in Singapore so that we would be able to reinforce the Indian Ocean, and therefore Australia and New Zealand, as well as India and Malaysia, if there was a crisis. Key British bases had long locked up the globe. Gibraltar and Malta for the Mediterranean, Aden, the Cape, and Ceylon for the Indian Ocean, and at the foot of British Malaya, commanding the Oriental trade routes, Singapore. Now that Britain had neither the money nor the ships to maintain a Far East battle fleet, nor Japan as an ally to do the job, Singapore took on a new role. It was to become a base without a fleet. When British interests were threatened, a fleet would be sent from home waters and here fitted out for battle. We stopped uh, at the then completely undeveloped Singapore in those days, and I so particularly remember uh, going up uh, to what was eventually became the dockyard, the dock, and it was just like seeing a, a vast sort of sandcastle marked out like a child's thing, uh, marked out in what was already unkindly referred to as a mangrove swamp, and you could just see the, the lines laid out, you see, and uh, eventually from that the dock was developed. The centerpiece of the new naval base was to be a massive dry dock, built in Britain and towed the 8,000 miles to Singapore. But construction work was spasmodic, 
It was pushed ahead, then cut back by successive governments. Finally, in 1938, it was finished. It was the largest naval dock in the world at that time, and it was deliberately opened at a ceremony with great pomp and show and publicity in order to emphasize the stability of British rule in Southeast Asia and the forces available to support that position. Singapore was a totally imperial creation, and yet it was here that Britain's empire was to suffer its most stunning defeat. Singapore had been founded by Sir Stamford Raffles in 1819 to dominate the trade between India and China. It grew under British rule into a bustling commercial metropolis. In the pre-war era, even then, we were very important in the uh, economic life of the British. We supplied rubber, tin, and these were the two main export earners uh, for the British. Our country exported these. Uh, all the export earnings landed in London, and these were the British. They not only took away the, the wealth of this country, but the executives who were here then, their salaries used to run into thousands. And ours had lowly jobs. We went to English schools, sang God Save the King, uh, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. So it's a kind of love-hate relationship. We like the English language and literature and stories, but we find that we didn't like the people who spoke them or wrote them. I felt that um, Singapore had become so commercialized uh, that uh, all the commercial values were coming first. That the people who were living there, of course, were living under conditions of very great comfort. I mean, everybody had plenty of servants and one thing and another, you know. Oh, one splendid moment. We all enjoyed it. The Sunday morning jaunt to the Sea View Hotel. Charming, beautiful, such service. And we all got plastered on usually the hard stuff. And of course, every session had to end by a singing of that notable song. There'll always be an England. While there's a country What went wrong with the dream was the lack of realism in the 1930s of the British ruling circles who couldn't believe in the danger that Hitler and Mussolini presented. And uh, they couldn't believe that anybody would be so foolish or so unrealistic as to embark on a policy of aggression and risk another war. You see, from the point of view of the military planners, there were two possible enemies. One was Germany, and one was Japan. And the deployment in peacetime uh, enabled us to, uh, to accomplish both functions. We were able broadly to balance the, uh, the forces of Germany and Japan. With war in Europe only a year away, Britain still asserted that Singapore could deal with the growing threat from Japan. Aloft again and headed for Singapore. Our hearts beat proudly as the Empire flying boat comes in. Britain's far-sighted leaders for generations have maintained strong forces at the Empire's strategic crossroads. But Singapore's real greatness is its link in the chain of Empire's strength and communications. On land, air and sea, Singapore's units are symbols of an Empire that is as free as the air and as permanent as the sun. Now, we depended, of course, upon the arrival 
of the Eastern Fleet. Remember, there was no war on at all then. The European War uh, Party were very busy planning the European War, but we in the Eastern War had to depend upon a mythical Eastern Fleet. We had a whole set of plans, which I happen to be responsible for, as a matter of fact, uh, developed for moving the Mediterranean fleet to the Far East. But of course, uh, when uh, the Axis War developed and uh, our battles with the Mediterranean, in 1938 we had to abandon that policy, and that was the beginning, really, of all Singapore troubles. Our interests in the Far East, which were very great, uh, could not be defended. It was really a, a, a situation of bluff, more than anything else. Let's say that we, that we had forces out there, quite small ones. But uh, if we were really attacked, and if the Japanese began to build up their strength, uh, uh, we would be in very great difficulty. Britain's leaders feared the empire would not survive a war on both sides of the world at once. So, desperate for peace at almost any price, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain flew to Munich and appeasement. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. <laughs> We used to talk together about the problems of empire uh, very often. But it wasn't until, of course, the pressures in Europe built up to the point of near war that we had really to think in terms that we might have to concentrate everything on Europe and everything on our own survival and thereby, of course, uh, sacrifice uh, some of the uh, elements of defence which we've been able to deploy in defence of the empire, Australia, Singapore and the like. Uh, and so the, it was the, when the change came, um, and we had to concentrate everything on Europe, uh, Chamberlain, for example, had to telephone to the Prime Minister of Australia and say we could no longer provide the cover which we had done up till then. For England, it's the Far East. For us, it's the Near North. And we, as having been brought up in Australia, were always uh, aware of what we called in those days the Yellow Peril. Japan, the ally on whom Britain had turned its back after World War I, was now to take advantage of Hitler's aggression in Europe. At Singapore, Japan was to call Britain's bluff. While Europe was convulsed by war, Britain's Eastern Empire was still at peace. Singapore pursued its principal purpose, trade, confident of its own security. Here is striking and encouraging evidence of the tremendous British fighting power which guards the integrity of this bastion of empire. Wartime newsreels were principally morale boosters for beleaguered Britain. By passing on the optimism of official propaganda, they helped to spread the myth of Fortress Singapore. strategic points around the city, gun emplacements ring one of the most strongly fortified basins in the world. The garrison, which is being continually reinforced, is fully capable of maintaining Singapore as a city of the British Lion. Even the Americans, long the leading opponents of empire, put about the illusion. Long before the outbreak of World War II, the name Singapore had become symbolic of military might. For on this strategic island, Britain had built for its navy and those of its allies, the world's largest naval operating base. The facilities of Singapore, its machine shops and dry docks, were to be shared jointly by the allied navies. Some felt that the Japanese would not be so, so idiotic as to attack the Americans and ourselves uh, because if they did, they were bound in the end to lose. Uh, Churchill certainly felt that. And I heard him say to the Chief of Staff on more than one occasion, I do not believe that the Japanese will be so stupid as to do this. Even without the Japanese in the war, Churchill was desperate for American backing. 
He sailed in Britain's newest battleship, the Prince of Wales, to meet President Roosevelt. But the American president exacted a price. The two leaders signed the Atlantic Charter, declaring that they wished to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them. The subject peoples of the empire understood these words to be a promise of democracy and self-government for all, including themselves. And they were in the future to quote the Atlantic Charter back at Britain. But Churchill never acknowledged that meaning. For him, all that mattered was winning the war. The officers and men of the Prince of Wales will always be ready to add another stage to the glorious and long annals of the Royal Navy. Against Admiralty advice, Churchill insisted on sending the Prince of Wales to Singapore. She was to have had with her an aircraft carrier as protection. But in the event, the fleet that arrived in Singapore to scare off the Japanese was only a few destroyers, an elderly battle cruiser, the Repulse, and the Prince of Wales. We went to Changi Point, which is, as you, which, uh, is uh, on the coast in uh, Singapore Island. And we were there when, when somebody, somebody shouted, hey, look at those two ships. We looked and then we saw for the first time two large warships. And somebody said, oh, they must be the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. And of course, they were the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, the pride of the British Navy. They were sailing by majestically. The British then were showing the flag. And I can well remember, as we steamed up the Straits of Johor, people waving to us. And I think there was this feeling in the, in the colony that you know, the Navy had come to the rescue. Now, I think our feelings about the Prince of Wales were that um, uh, we had a slight chip on our shoulder about the Prince of Wales because uh, uh, she was a slight glamour puss. She'd, been, she'd taken the Prime Minister over to uh, America. She'd had this scrap with the Bismarck. Uh, she'd been on a very important and successful operation in the Mediterranean and had been attacked by torpedo bombers, which had not succeeded in their attempts. And uh, uh, so I think there was a chip on Repulsive's shoulders about this. Immediately prior to their arrival, I had been up country, as indeed had all the Mitrippen, staying with various uh, kind, hospitable planters. And one picked up a little bit of the local feel there, which really was very, very content, very uh, unalarmed. Uh, the Japanese were bluffing. They, they'd never dare do anything like invade the Great British Raj in Singapore uh, or Malaya, as it then was, at all. And when there were saber-rattling noises uh, from the other side, from Japan, uh, these were poo-pooed. Uh, they wouldn't have the nerve, they'd never done. And anyway, what could they do? The current conception then was, uh, these slant-eyed orientals, their eyesight is defective, they are no damn use as a fire, uh, fire, uh, as a fighting men, as a flying men, and they cannot fly a plane properly. At dawn on the 7th of December, 1941, the Japanese, until then at peace with the West, attacked. They landed troops here in Malaya and bombed Singapore. Simultaneously, they destroyed the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. When it happened, uh, the Prime Minister was delighted in, in a sense. Well, he, he was horrified at what happened. Uh, at um, Pearl Harbor, but he said, well, now nothing matters because the Americans are on our side and we're bound to win the war. Therefore, whatever we lose, we'll get back, which is perfectly true. And he had all along taken the attitude, rightly, that, uh, that getting the Americans on our side was the only thing that mattered. We had been told the Japanese couldn't fly at night. Was something to do with their eyesight. And I remember this red warning. We were at peace, remember? And I think this happened at about the same GMT as the attack on Pearl Harbor when suddenly the searchlights went on and there were nine Japanese bombers in perfect formation flying at night 
about Bomb Singapore and we opened fire with our 525s in fact from the dry dock at the time, first time we opened fire at the enemy. ちょうど新型ライエッジまして、ちょうど下で皆若い者でも男子でも調理すると思いまして、これは奇襲ができるなと思って喜びまして、見た途端にパッとその投下関数で消えまして、それからその残ってるま明かりを目標に。First pictures of Singapore's taste of aerial war reveal the damage done to Raffles Square in the heart of the island shopping center. Department stores, shops and business houses. The same old story with street clocks registering the early morning hour when death and destruction came at the hands of Hitler's yellow brothers. It's all very typical of the Nazi Nipponese Brotherhood. This part of the empire calls out for strong and immediate action. My father was the captain of the Prince of Wales. She was the flagship of Admiral Phillips. And uh, I had dinner on board with him uh, by invitation shortly after they got in. And I hadn't seen my father for nearly a year. And we had a very uh, relaxed uh, family dinner, supper, really, in his cabin, nobody else present. After dinner, uh, we sat on the sofa, and he turned to me and said, what do you think of the situation? And I, in my youthful extremity of ignorance, really, uh, said, let them come. Uh, let, let's have a crack at them. And I remember very clearly his then turning a most serious face to me and saying, I don't think you have any idea of the, the enormity of the odds we are up against. And the captain sent for me and he told us roughly, told me roughly what was going to happen. We were going out to try and intercept the transports which were landing troops in the north of Malaya and in Siam. And he said, I can remember, he said, I'm afraid it's going to be a pretty sticky party, guns. The Prince of Wales and Repulse set out to stop the invasion from Japan. What happened next was to inspire the Japanese to make a full-length feature film for their wartime propaganda. It accurately follows the accounts of the men who took part. のために敵の位置が大体分かりましたから雲の下に出てずっと旋回しながら構造を下げまして手伝ってみた時に敵の戦艦が前に見に行った時に一番私がドキッとしたのは味方の戦艦に間違えたんじゃないか特に日本の今
that sort of thing, but it didn't affect the ship in any way. That the next wave which arrived was an altogether different cup of tree. And these were the chaps who really did a mortal blow. It was the most brilliantly executed operation. One has to give them that. It was their first 11. Now, don don mie e maari nagara shitai shite orimashita ga watashi no watashi ya soju shite orimashite suichu wa mimasen de shita ga watashi no ushiro ni notte orimashita teisatsin no mai ka to ko hige o hayashita itto heiso desu ga tashou ga atarimashita ko itte meishu to itte ooki na koe de yorokon de shimashita they just kept coming really after that and um I think we were hit by five torpedoes and we gradually rolled over. Everything was firing. The chaps, it was very difficult to get them to break off a target once it had dropped its torpedo because they were, they were fighting mad by then, really. And I can remember her gradually capsizing. And it was just as if one was in the cinema. It was quite impersonal. I wasn't upset or anything. I was looking at something as if I wasn't there. This absolutely dead calm sea and this beautiful great ship, so many of one's friends in it, gradually rolling over and then capsizing. And then, of course, you know, there were masses of heads bobbing about in the water and, um, uh, and in true British style, everybody started to sing, roll out the barrel and uh, all this kind of thing. And I can remember swimming around, telling people to shut up and keep their mouths shut because every time they opened their mouths to seeing roll out the barrel and uh, a great slob of oil fill went down their throats and of course this was lethal because um, it, it just burnt your innards out and um, so I remember going round uh, destroying all this great elan by telling them to shut up and keep their mouths shut if they wanted to stay alive. Word came through that they were being attacked by air and of course we didn't have a carrier with us or they didn't have a carrier with them I was in the war room and very shortly afterwards just as we were trying to arrange for further tugs and things to go out to help them we had nothing else available word came through well the admiral who was in charge of the war room Admiral Palliser put his head through the scum and said Needn't worry about the tugs, they've both sunk. The Japanese celebrated the sinking of so formidable a foe, the pride of the British Navy. Eight hundred and forty men died in the two ships including Captain John Leach. I suppose in hindsight, it wasn't a very good gamble. And it, it must remain, I think, barely conceivable, inconceivable even, that just two ships like that could have deterred, let alone in the event stopped, the Japanese from doing almost anything they wished in the area. To that extent, it was utter waste. When Churchill sent the Repulse and the Prince of Wales, there was an electric shock throughout the country when they went down. But again, it was covered up. Business went on as usual in Singapore. Parties were held in Raffles Hotel, New Year parties and Christmas parties. They went on and... Uh, the European community just had complete faith in the British and so had we. The British had always been supreme and we just couldn't envisage the British being defeated and we accepted. Oh, the Jeff and the Wolf and the Hun They'll be sorry for the war that they began They must pay the price, those three blind lies The Jeff and the Wolf and the Hun Germany and Italy, not Japan, were Britain's front line. For Churchill, the Far East came a poor second to Europe. He could not spare the equipment Singapore needed. The Japanese swept through Malaya, even though they were outnumbered and often fiercely resisted by combined British Empire troops. 
Within seven weeks, they were poised for the final assault on Singapore. Churchill ordered the British commander, General Arthur Percival, to fight to the last man. The situation as it was here, with uh, over two million civilian population, all the essential services broken down, the dead weren't being buried, uh, the fire services broken down, the police and so on, uh, and no water supply. Uh, once the causeway was blown up, then we had no water. And in the last days, there's no doubt that Percival was a very, very worried man. I've seen him many times sitting at his desk with his head in his hands, and he obviously, you know. In the early evening of Sunday the 15th of February, 1942, a weary British command made their way to the Ford car factory, the Japanese headquarters. General Yamashita arrived to accept the British surrender from a wretched General Percival. I speak to you all under the shadow of a far-reaching military defeat. It is a British and Imperial defeat. All the Malay Peninsula has been overrun. Singapore has fallen. The Japanese commander himself could hardly believe it. 130,000 British Empire troops had surrendered to a quarter as many Japanese. That night, there, there was an uncanny silence in, over the whole island. The shelling stopped, the sirens stopped, no more bombing, and everybody had fear in, 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 in their heart. To us, that you know, we, that seemed to be the end of the world. There was no hope, no future. And when uh, capitulation came, it was a traumatic shock. Uh, uh, an unbelievable shock. It's uh, a ghastly end of the world that just didn't penetrate. We were frozen. We were like zombies. Well, before the, uh, Singapore uh, 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 surrendered, before the fall of Singapore, most people thought the British, you know, were very wonderful. They could uh, protect Singapore. And we were, in fact, we were given to understand that Singapore was impregnable. And in the end, Singapore really fell. And that exploded the myth of the British, you know, they could do everything. In military terms, the fall of Singapore was not crucial. But for the empire, its effect was shattering. Belief in British superiority crumbled. Australia had been the first to react. Australia looks to America, free of any pangs as to our traditional links with the United Kingdom, announced Prime Minister John Curtin. Now I confess to you frankly, but with the sincerest devotion to the cause of the British Empire in the world, I have fought as hard as I can for our state. It is perfectly true that I made a direct and definite appeal to the United States of America. I think it was a very, very brave and a very uh, clever adjustment to his thinking that he made, and I give him full marks for it. I was uh, personally delighted, of course, because I have such high regard for the Americans, and I'd just as soon almost be saved by an American as saved by a Briton. I mean, there it was. Somebody had to save us. Industrial and independent, Australians have been turning to new markets and new interests outside the empire. When war touched their continent for the first time, Australians found that for their defense against Japan, they must look to the United States more than to the Empire. And in the very presence of and need for American defense forces, they glimpsed a future inevitably bound up, not with the Empire alone, but with the United States as well. 
Thousands of Indians were led by the fall of Singapore to support Japan against Britain. Well, I think the impact was tremendous. Uh, as I said, you see that uh, an Asian power could just do this. Particularly the close upon the sinking of these two warships, the reduction of what Winston Churchill described as the impregnable fortress sea, you see. Uh, naturally, and he had talked in those terms in just a few days before the event. Once that fell, you see, so uh, the British prestige you know, here in India was just, uh, well, I mean, actually it was just mud. For 170 years, the tradition of British authority and invincibility was accepted by the Indian people and respected throughout the Orient. Yet the Indians have felt that for all it has accomplished, British rule has been the rule of a conqueror. They have resented reactionary Britishers, who in defiance of a policy favoring greater equality and more independence, sought to keep the Indians in an inferior social and economic status. But to the complacency of the colonial British, there came an abrupt and shocking end. The Japanese overran Burma and even bombed Australia and India. The British Raj quaked as the new imperial rivals stood at their gates. India's nationalist leaders, Gandhi and Nehru, had at the outbreak of war wanted to back Britain. Now they demanded that the British quit India. Eventually, the Japanese found themselves too far stretched. The British pushed them back through Burma. Then the Americans, in August 1945, delivered the final blow. American atom bombs preempted British plans to reconquer Malaya and Singapore. All that was left for Lord Louis Mountbatten, Supreme Commander Southeast Asia, was to accept the Japanese surrender here in Singapore. Well, when the British came back, of course, we felt very happy. And uh, the, my happiest moment was when uh, the late uh, Lady Mountbatten invited me to the city hall to, to witness the surrender. That was a great moment for me. I have today received the surrender of the Supreme Commander of the Japanese forces as you have been fighting. And I have accepted the surrender on behalf of all of you. This was the moment the colonial peoples had been waiting for. Now the British would honor the promise Churchill had made in the Atlantic Charter. Well, frankly, I cheered that the British returned uh, for a whole lot of reasons. One, it would mean the end of the Japanese conquest. It would also mean the beginning of the end of colonialism and the road to independence. And of course, the return of players, cigarettes and three fives and so on. The Japanese cigarettes were pretty horrible. And, uh, but after the reoccupation, we did notice that the British were less arrogant. They had been educated during the war years. A bit more conscious that the world uh, did not altogether depend on Britain. Uh, the war changed the whole political climate of the world. Uh, it had been stressed so much that it was a war against dictatorship and fascism and for democracy that uh, that feeling spread throughout the world and uh, I would say that it was the impact of the war which had which made the great change. Victorious Britain was in no hurry to keep its wartime promises. The British recovered every inch of the empire, which Churchill said, stands more united and powerful than at any time in its long romantic history. He was wrong. 
Britain was exhausted, on the brink of bankruptcy and overshadowed by its wartime allies, Russia and America. A wind of change was blowing through the empire, arousing nationalist demands Britain would prove powerless to resist. continues next week with a detailed examination of India's part in the British Empire. Stay in view now for a news break, followed by our first Sunday stereo special. Leonard Bernstein conducts a brilliant recording of West Side Story. Delhi, 1939. Two months after Britain declared war on Germany, the eldest daughter of India's Viceroy was getting married. Many felt the celebration, in public at least, should be restrained. Lord Linlithgow, the Viceroy, the man who ruled India, took a different view. The king in Buckingham Palace said there would be no drinks during the war and austerity was sort of clamped down on the, the British as far as we could gather from the newspapers from the minute uh, the, the war began here in India uh, we were being encouraged to go on just the same as before and we had this vice regal wedding and we had this scene of a great pomp and splendor it was meant to impress the Indians with the fact that uh, we weren't frightened which was a matter of deliberate policy but it did shock me it was a scene of great luxury as the vice-regal occasions always were. India, one-fifth of humanity, the biggest possession ever held by any empire, itself shaped much of imperial policy. The government of India was every bit as majestic, on occasions nearly as powerful, as the government in Britain. India was the second pillar of the empire. At the wedding, the talk was about the European war. The old white dominions chose to join the allies. Linlithgow announced India was at war without consulting one of her 400 million people. Unasked. India was at war with Germany. Uh, then Lithgow must be admired, I think, for his, his courage to stick to his guns and saying that he would continue just as though nothing had happened. You see, a stiff upper lip, the policy of a stiff upper lip. And it was magnificent, perhaps, as in the old phrase, magnificent but not war. As the young couple left the imperial palace, modestly called Viceroy's house, though bigger than Versailles. The honeymoon between Britain and India's elite had long been over. Imperial Britain had promised a free and united India. By 1939, India was already halfway along the road to independence, supervised by only a thin line, the Indian Civil Service, down to just 600 Britons. Indian ministers ran the 11 provinces of British India, nearly two-thirds of the country. The war in Europe changed imperial priorities. Britain now had only one purpose, her own defence and that of her empire. But for Indians, the war posed a cruel dilemma. Wedged between Nazism and imperialism, they felt that the path to independence was blocked on either side. Some of them would not have minded Hitler winning. Most of them would not have liked it. But they didn't see why they should be the fall guys. 
who were to support one imperialism against another. And so the purely nationalist feeling, a plague on both your houses, was the ascendant, I thought. People were not pro or anti-Hitler, they were against, they were for freedom. Since the 1920s, the symbol of Indian freedom had been the puckish figure of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the Pied Piper of the four million strong Congress party. The Mahatma, the great soul, though trained as a barrister in London, was Indian in everything else. Congress, India's largest independence movement, had, till Gandhi joined, been a westernized middle-class party. Gandhi changed all that. Congress became a mass party. Swaraj, self-rule, became his slogan. Civil disobedience, his weapon. Gandhi spent as much time at prayer as he did at politics. In a few years, he turned Congress back to the ancient culture of India's 300 million Hindus. He opposed modern technology. The spinning wheel was his symbol. Gandhi's vision of a free India was rural, conservative, and in essence, religious. I want to connect that story with what I want to see. That if you really want to see India at its best, you have to find it in a cottage, in a humble home. But behind the scenes, Gandhi was backed by India's richest men. While he fought for the downtrodden, he defended India's caste system. He recruited soldiers in the First World War, then turned pacifist. Millions hailed him as a saint. Most British called him a troublemaker. Some thought he was mad. Wiser officials welcomed Gandhi's pacifism. They saw it as a break on Congress hotheads. The empire preferred non-violence to revolution. Gandhi's main precept was, hate imperialism, but not the imperialists. They're nice people. So don't kill them, don't hate them. Have a regard for them, but tell, you, tell them you're doing something wrong. And I'm going to stop you doing it. It's the action that is wrong, not the people. In November 1939, the same month as the wedding, Congress forced their ministers in the provinces to resign. They demanded that Britain concede immediate independence. The British were secretly pleased. Without interfering congressmen, they could run the war in their own way. But Gandhi's view of the war was a mystery. His blend of Hindu mysticism and practical politics was a purely Gandhian cocktail. It was unique. He lived on these two dimensions at once. The moment um, he started to get a little bit uh, as it were, bewildered or mixed up in politics, he retreated at once into mysticism, you see. And that was his inevitable get-out. Now, this isn't to say that I didn't deeply admire him. I think he was probably one of the real, really significant figures of the 20th century. But at the same time, he'd got this tremendously unique get-out. He, <laughs> he lived in two worlds at the same time, and he could nip from one to the other the drop of a hat if he'd ever had a hat. His followers, like Nehru, did have hats, Gandhi caps. By 1939, Nehru was number two to Gandhi. Women act as stewards at a political meeting on Bombay's Maidan, and the speaker is the pundit Jawaharlal Nehru, product of Harrow and Cambridge. Nehru differed sharply from Gandhi. Non-religious, Western and progressive, he was for the Allies. But Gandhi still dominated Congress. Nehru could only make speeches against the dictators. Some Indians wondered where Nehru's sympathy did lie. My brother, of course, all his views were tinged with his background, his knowledge of the English, his uh, desire uh, uh, to certainly participate in the ending of imperialism, but not to create any sort of, uh, of uh, bitterness or situation which would damage friendship ultimately and so on. Was there a feeling that perhaps Nehru, for some of them, had too much of the West in him? Oh, with all of them. They all thought that. I think every one of them, at some time or the other, thought that, that Nehru had uh, more than was necessary of 
uh, the West did him. When the war came, there was no doubt about Nehru or his family's sympathy. My father saw fascism and Nazism not merely as they were affecting the Jews or the leftists or somebody in Europe, but as the sh that the shadow would fall on the world as a whole. So he, he saw our problems in that larger setting always, whether it were economic problems or the political problems. In this, he differed because most of the other Indian leadership tended to see just the Indian side of it. And they were not too much concerned about what was happening abroad. Some saw the war as their chance to seize power. Nehru would hear none of it, nor would his colleague, Maulana Azad. Azad and Nehru led the anti-fascists. They wanted a deal with Britain. Help in the war for independence when it was over. They tried to persuade Congress. But Gandhi, the pacifist, said no. They were talking about violence and non-violence and the ethics of war and all the rest. And Gandhi was sitting on the ground. And um, Azad, who had some trouble with his knees, he always used to sit on the chair. So he was sitting and putting his hand on Gandhi's head, he said, I am sitting in this fact, what do I have to do? Is it with my heart or with my heart? He said, I am sitting confused. What am I to do? Should I leave my beloved? Or should I leave the calling of my heart? That the inside, the feeling is to, to go to war and not to bother about violence and non-violence. But if I do decide anything contrary to non-violence, then I lose my beloved. That was uh, Gandhi. While Congress argued, the British priority was clear. Over a million Indians had fought in the First World War. Now, whether Gandhi approved or not, that effort was doubled. India expanded her army from less than 200,000 to over two and a half million. This is the largest volunteer army in the world. It could be larger still, so far as the men are concerned. There's been no shortage of volunteers, but only of equipment and instructors to train them. In London, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. A passionate imperialist, for years he had fought to keep India under British rule. For Churchill, India's job was to help win the war. Gandhi he despised. He would make no deal with Congress, that Hindu priesthood he called them. Churchill's only concern was for men and supplies from India. The Oriental barracks in an eastern sea. Despite Gandhi, Congress followed Nehru. They offered Britain a deal. When Churchill turned them down, Congress went off in a huff. for the war. Part of his plan was to use the princely states whose survival depended on the British. The princes had given up effective power. In return, Britain allowed them to run nearly a third of India. A few were modern and progressive. Some were little more than local dictators. The British could count on them to parade, 
and give cash and men. Like medieval barons, they lorded it over some of the most backward areas in the country. Some ruled little more than a village. The princely state of Hyderabad was as big as Spain. princes were afraid of Congress, and most of them banded from their states. They hoped the British would stay in India to protect them. The British found them admirably loyal. The Indian princes were making a positive contribution to the war, and there were other people uh, besides the, the Congress who could speak for India. Congress was a very important party, but uh, they made the great mistake of insisting that they spoke for the whole of India. Not only the princes rejected Congress, the Muslims felt the same, and there were 90 million of them. They had not taken to Western education as readily as the Hindus. They were afraid the 300 million Hindus would beat them at the game of competitive examinations and ballot boxes. With Britain at war, the Muslims were now vital to Churchill's plans. Muslims were nearly a third of the army, and to most British officials, easy to get on with. Many people did have this feeling with, um, uh, with Muslims. I think probably more people felt more at home with Muslims. It was easier, of course, um, because they, you could eat with Muslims. I mean, they would ask one out for a meal, and you could go and eat with them. And it was only, of course, uh, with a Hindu who'd been to England, uh, or who'd become a, a barrister or something of that kind, that you could really sit down and eat in the same way. I, I, mean, I had Hindu friends in one, one village I remember very vividly, um, where uh, they always used to ask me to a meal. But they stood around and watched, and they didn't eat with you. The rulers of India before the British came were Muslim. They dreamed of past glories and of the day when the British would go and they could revive a Muslim empire. All over India, Hindus worshipped the sacred cow. The Muslims killed and ate them. In the towns and villages, people drank Muslim water and Hindu water. We were so far apart that although we lived next door to each other, uh, we uh, didn't intermarry, we didn't eat together, we were not called to each other's ceremonies. Our heroes, the heroes of one were, so to speak, the villains of the other. And, and so, you know, we became quite distinct we were socially distinct although it took, took, took a long time it was an am ambiguous situation because for 700 years the Muslims ruled and so a Muslim in India did not really quite know whether he's basically a Muslim or an Indian to face this problem Muslims had set up a political party of their own the Muslim League they asked for and got protection separate voting rights from Hindus. This was bitterly opposed by Congress. Mohammed Ali Jinnah was a most unusual Muslim, thoroughly westernized. As a young man, he backed a united India under Congress. 
he supported Hindu-Muslim marriages. But Jinnah felt Gandhi was turning Congress into a Hindu party. He had hoped to achieve high office in the movement, but Gandhi outshone him. When his effort to build a bridge between Congress and the League was rejected, he quit Indian politics. Jinnah left Congress and India and settled in England, far removed from Gandhi and his peasant loincloth. In 1936, the Muslim League invited him back to be their leader. Jinnah, still nursing deep resentment of Congress, came home to claim his place in India. A man had gone through a lot of ups and downs in life. A man who gets married, and within two days of marriage, before marriage is consummated, he goes to England and he hears that his wife had died of fever. Then, what happened? He hears that his father has gone bankrupt. He's an honest man, he's a stick, upright fellow, he wants to pay every penny of his father's debtors. Came and took a job as presidency magistrate, didn't suit him, walked down the corridors of Bombay High Court till he became a leading lawyer. And he paid every single penny of his father's debts. Then he fell in love with a girl, got married to her. They were estranged after two years. Uh, and when they made up in Paris, within two days, she died in his arms. Then he comes back, he sees how Muslims have been uh, treated by his old friends, the Congress Hindus. He was a completely shaken man. He was a disappointed man, completely disappointed. Here was a man who put on a mask, this thin, elegant dandy, who rose to his feet and began to speak very quietly so that everybody listened to him. And everybody sort of leaned forward, you know, and listening hard as they could to hear him. But he would hardly raise his voice at all. Um, uh, it was great arrogance, really, but it was an effective arrogance. And um, in slow, incisive terms, he would put his point across. But I was talking to him once, and there he was talking about um, high politics and so on. And then, quite abruptly, he stopped talking and literally went really quite pale and said, you'll have to excuse me for a moment. And I truly thought he'd been taken ill. Because he rose and he left the room, and in five minutes, he came back full of beans, full of bonhomie, and said, you know, that fool of a bearer of mine put the wrong cufflinks in my shirt. And that had totally thrown him. So that was a strange sort of superficiality about the bearer, in a way. By the start of the war, Jinnah had become a stern enemy of Congress. He feared the British were going to hand over the Muslims to majority rule under Congress and Gandhi. He saw that as dangerously Hindu. Once he had been called the ambassador of Muslim Hindu unity. Now he proclaimed that the Muslims of India were a separate nation. Why had Jinnah changed? I think I can best answer that by telling you of an occasion when I dined in company with him the friend's house. He said, you British, you're interesting people. As long as it's just a question of administration, you run a country well. When it comes to the business of understanding local movements, local feelings, communal feeling, national feeling, you haven't a clue. And he said, you talk about preserving the unity of India. There never is and never has been any unity in India at all except the beneficial unity that you forced on us for the time being. Uh, you're dreaming when you talk about the unity of India. Jinnah wanted power. To get it, he had to unite the Muslims behind the League. Islam in danger was his answer to Gandhi's Hindu appeal. For both sides, religion would bring in the masses. Jinnah revitalized the Muslim League and the British, faced by a hostile Congress, were ready to play along with him. Although the Muslims never gave 
official support as a Muslim league to the war effort. In practice, they, uh, they did help in the war effort. Whereas the Congress, which meant the great body of the Hindu people, didn't. And therefore the British naturally regarded the one as friends and the other as hostile. By 1940, Jinnah and the Muslim League were on the move. In the last provincial election, three years before, they captured only 5% of the Muslim vote. The League needed a touch of Gandhi's magic, a political slogan to inspire the Muslims. Jinnah found it, an idea thrown up by a Muslim student at Cambridge ten years earlier. The name Pakistan contained the first letters of the areas to be included in the new Muslim homeland Jinnah wanted carved out of India. Pakistan would include P for Punjab, A for Afghania, called Northwest Frontier by the British, K for Kashmir, S for Sindh, and Tan from Baluchistan, Pakistan. To this, Jinnah added two other provinces, Bengal and Assam. The League first demanded Pakistan, the partitioning of India, at Lahore in March 1940. The Muslims, the League argued, were not Indians, but a separate nation. They needed their own state to protect them from a Hindu Raj. Once Pakistan cry had been raised, there was always the danger that unless some alternative was put forward, everybody would swing towards Pakistan, because it had an enormous appeal to the Muslim masses. In fact, we had foreseen in 1940, when the Pakistan resolution was first put forward, that if it was not stopped early, it would become unstoppable. We should, if possible, have found some alternative to lay before them and let them know very clearly that Pakistan of Jinnah's conception was not on and never would be on. Many British dismissed the Pakistan demand as simply a political gimmick. Some thought it just propaganda by the League or a tactic to boost Jinnah's popularity. It was both. Pakistan was to become Jinnah's rallying cry. Just how powerful he and the Pakistan idea would be, few could then imagine. In early 1942, the war was going badly for Britain, especially in the Far East. After the Japanese air attack on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, it was Britain's turn. First Malaya, then Singapore were overrun by Japan. When the British commander surrendered Singapore, 80,000 men of the Indian army were lost. the Japanese poured into India's eastern neighbor, Burma, and quickly overran it. Thousands of refugees and British soldiers began the hazardous trek back into India. By now, every British possession east of India had fallen. Panic swept Calcutta and Madras. Thousands fled their homes in fear of invasion. The Americans were alarmed. Roosevelt feared India was the next British domino, ready to fall. He told Churchill that her people must be stiffened by a firm promise of independence. The United States, the first colony to reject the empire, did not want to fight a war to restore British imperialism. At home, the Labour members of the War Cabinet also wanted progress to Indian independence. To Churchill, that meant a surrender to Congress. He thought Indians in government would argue about everything and hold up the war effort. The King.
King honored the 4th Indian Division when he inspected, in the inner quadrangle of Buckingham Palace, the contingent which is now visiting this country. Colonel Scott, who commands these splendid warriors from India, presents them to their majesties. Talking to them, the King and Queen heard again about some of the exploits which won the division glory in Libya and Tunisia. Indian troops drove home the message from the Labour Party and the Americans that a genuine offer to leave India would bring even more men to help the empire to resist a Japanese invasion. Churchill took the opposite view. The obvious policy to be pursued was to stop anyone rocking the boat. India was an important part, not only of the empire, but of the strategic sea. The Japanese were at its gates, the um, Germans hadn't been so far off. And it was extremely important that um, uh, in India should be kept relatively quiet during the war. Roosevelt sent so many envoys to Delhi that the Viceroy was moved to write to Churchill. Please arrest, at least for a time, this flow of well-meaning sentimentalists from the USA to India so that we may mind here what is still, I suppose, our own business. But American delegations continued to proffer advice, while American newsreels mounted a propaganda campaign. For under British rule, the security of India, half as big as the United States and three times as populous, has never been entrusted to the Indian people but reserved as a function of Great Britain and its viceroys, who one after another have ruled India in the name of the distant King Emperor. American opinion undoubtedly felt that British rule of India was out of date and that they were hanging back on self-government for India. It was, a, if you like, a sentimental uh, attitude, but it was a characteristic American attitude. And I think that worked through to the British uh, cabinet and, of course, to Churchill, for whom Anglo-American relations were supremely important. Churchill resisted the pressure for months and then caved in so suddenly that the Viceroy and his staff had no time to react. I used to handle this cipher in which the Secretary of State and the Viceroy used to carry on their personal correspondence. One morning, a telegram began, take strong whiskey pig before continuing. Well, it was very early in the morning, so I, I thought I wouldn't do that, but I knew that some shock was coming, and it was to tell us that uh, the cabinet had decided to send Stafford Cripps out. The scheme which the British government has got out and which I'm taking with me to India is one which may successfully settle for all time the future of India as a great uh, free partner in the British Commonwealth of Nations. And once that's solved, I believe we shall be able to rally all the peoples of India to the defense of their own native land, which now is so urgently being threatened. Sir Stafford Cripps brought to India an offer that Churchill had not wanted to make. In return for cooperation in the war, Indians were promised independence when it was over. Cripps, a leading Labour Party member of the cabinet, believed this was what Congress wanted and that it would tempt them into the government at Delhi. Roosevelt and the Labour Party wanted Congress to accept the offer of post-war freedom. But Churchill and his Secretary of State for India, Leo Amory, had other ideas. Well, I asked uh, Leo Amory, why didn't you go? instead of Cripps. He said, well, it was a time, you see, when Cripps was extremely popular in the country, not long come back from being ambassador in Moscow, and some people even thought that he might be able to displace Churchill as prime minister. So he said, well, Churchill and I, we thought that the thing was going to fail anyway, there was no hope in it, and it would be better that Cripps failed with it than I did, because that would fix him afterwards. Well, uh, of course, uh, Churchill never expected it to succeed. Churchill and regarded it as primarily a propaganda exercise. Congress knew that Cripps was a friend,
but his Prime Minister Churchill was not. Could Cripps persuade them to do a deal with Britain, or would Churchill scupper his own emissary? The Indian nationalist leadership was in a dilemma. They didn't want to support Hitler, even in a roundabout way. On the other hand, they couldn't support Churchill, who represented British imperialism and giving in to, to the empire continuing to the end of the war. So when Cripps arrived, the Indian Congress leadership was divided in its own mind, in its own heart. But Gandhi had no doubt. When he came to meet Cripps, he asked, is this all you've come 7,000 miles to give us? He suggested Cripps take the next flight home. Then the unpredictable Gandhi withdrew. He did not condemn the offer openly. Nehru and Azad hoped for Congress jobs in the government. Gandhi, this time, stood aside. Gandhi thought the Congress leadership would rather negotiate and make a bargain with the British, giving support for the war effort in return for getting independence. He felt that the Indian people as a whole wanted this exchange on nationalist grounds, and it would be doing violence to the Indian people if he, on grounds of non-violence or pacifism, were to oppose the war effort in a, on principle. So he said he would remain passive and let the Congress Working Committee and the British free to negotiate what would appeal to the Indian people. Cripps made good progress in his meetings with Nehru and Azad. With his approval, they drew up a list of names for the new Indian government which Cripps hoped to bring into being. The envoy tried to carry the Viceroy with him, but Linlithgow felt Cripps was stepping into his territory. He undoubtedly, in my view, went uh, beyond his brief in discussing matters which were essentially matters for the Viceroy to settle. But if they went beyond into his sphere, he said to me, I think Cripps is uh, baiting the trap with my cheese. Cripps thought he had acted properly. But Linlithgow complained to London. That gave Churchill his opportunity. He bounced the cabinet into forcing Cripps to withdraw the idea of Indian ministers in the government. He came and he spoke that the position in India will be the same as of the Prime Minister in England vis-à-vis vis vis the Queen. But later on it went on changing until it came to just supervising some canteens run for the soldiers. So naturally Nehru was very hurt about it. What we found here, it was nothing, it was just a big joke, what was offered. So that was a disappointment, because uh, Cripps was regarded as a friend of India, he was very friendly with Nehru, and he had uh, come earlier in 1939 on his own and spoken and talked about uh, the Indian freedom movement and India's struggle and that uh, the British and the Indians have to work together and all that. And to see a man like that go back on his declared uh, policies so quickly, within a few days, and uh, that was a disappointment for many people. Churchill's maneuver worked. Within days, Congress rejected the entire offer. Cripps' failure was total. Churchill was delighted and blamed Congress. American pressure died down. The Labour Party were silenced. Nehru was forced onto the defensive. Yet it is said that this attempt has failed. We tried our utmost. Indeed, we went to further lengths than I could have dreamt myself going. Yet there were limits beyond, we could, beyond which we could not go because that would have meant our breaking all the pledges we had given ourselves and to our people and upsetting everything and every scheme that we had in our minds. When Congress rejected the offer, Jenner publicly followed suit. We gave our earnest and most careful consideration to the proposals that Sir Stafford Cripps brought to India on behalf of His Majesty's government. But the differences are so vital and fundamental, and the constitutional problem of India is so complex that it was not possible to secure agreement and dissolve the differences and find a satisfactory solution to all concerned. But privately, Jinnah was delighted. 
British need for Muslim soldiers, vital to the war, had produced a windfall for the Muslim League. Part of the Crips offer was designed to encourage and protect the Muslims. Provinces unwilling to join an independent India could opt out and the British would help them. The way was open for a Muslim majority province to say it wouldn't have any part uh, of the new constitution and therefore uh, would, was able to form at least a, a fragment of a Pakistan. Uh, and once you had committed yourself to that, and it remained the statement of British policy, although the declaration was never declared, uh, it was only a draft, once it had become British policy, uh, the separatists could fall back on that at least uh, as being part of their, the, the Bible from which they went forward and developed their theology. The offer conceded the right of an Indian province for secession from the center, which meant if one province can get that right, four provinces can they get that right, six provinces can get that right, half a dozen provinces can get that right. So therefore, indirectly, the British cabinet, you see, conceded the right of the Muslim League. And to that Pakistan. gave, to Pakistan, and that gave confidence to the Muslim League leadership. How far, though, at that point, did Mr. Jinnah really want Pakistan in 1942 when Crips came here? Well, I think uh, till then they were not very serious about it, but when this came, when Mr. Cripps came and he offered that, you see, then naturally uh, Muslim League leadership became more confident and uh, started uh, uh, talking from the position of strength, you see. They thought uh, the Congress party wants freedom and the only way to delay freedom is to support another group which will be with, stand by us. And uh, so by supporting the Muslims, Muslim League, uh, they could delay the transfer of power. It was a very good excuse. Without uh, any uh, putting, um, at, at least they could say that in the, to the others in the world. That what are we going to do if we are carrying a heavy burden? Uh, India is, uh, if we leave India, there will be trouble and all that kind of thing. Churchill had got what he wanted. Cripps' honesty had served his purpose. You must not feel unduly discouraged or disappointed by the result. An exultant Churchill wrote to him. The effect throughout Britain and in the United States has been wholly beneficial. Cripps now knew he had been cynically used by Churchill. Publicly, he had to cover it up and blame Congress. The draft declaration, which I brought to India on behalf of the war cabinet, and which I explained to you last time I spoke over the wireless, has been rejected by your leaders. I am sad that this great opportunity of rallying India for her defense and her freedom has been missed. Those of Gandhi's followers who had opposed the mission felt vindicated. What is the meaning of it? Take everything from us and then afterwards they can say, oh, go home. Who could trust the British? They are known as perfidious beaten. That is what politicians are known about. Well, we didn't believe in that kind of politics. That's what Gandhiji taught us. A post-dated check on the bank, only a foolish man will accept it. Gandhi, it is said, called the offer a post-dated check on a crashing bank. With the Japanese at the borders of India, Gandhi thought a British defeat was a real possibility. India, he believed, might soon have Asian masters. After Cripps failure, Gandhi turned quickly to positive action. Well, I would say that by 9th August 1942, the patience of most of the Majority was exhausted and Gandhi came into his own. That is, Gandhi could control the Congress and lead it to oppose the war effort completely because by that time everyone was fed up with the British inability to come to terms. Congress met in Bombay. Nehru reluctantly proposed the resolution that Gandhi wanted. 
that the British should quit India. The next day, Gandhi was to outline a program of passive resistance. He never arrived. In the early hours, he was arrested with all the other top leaders, including Nehru. As news of the arrests filtered out, rebellion erupted in India. Despite the newsreel's attempts to play down the uprising, not since the Indian mutiny had British rule been challenged so seriously. The first pictures to arrive in England since the arrest of Gandhi and the Congress Working Committee. Prompt action by the authorities and the removal of the organizers of civil disobedience did much to quiet in India. With the Japanese at the very gates of the country, the Congress party made their demands, hoping to press them at a time of crisis. Shopkeepers were called upon to help by closing their shops. Only quick, decisive action by the government could prevent serious sabotage to the whole war effort. That action was taken. There were demonstrations in many places, but on duty were Indian troops and police, loyal as ever, and symbolic of the determination of India as a whole. In France, in Libya, and in Burma, Indian troops have given their lives fighting for a cause they know to be just. They represent the spirit of India, not the Congress mob. A mob swayed by the eloquence of their leaders into falsely believing that an India without England would be an India for the Indian. It was very unplanned. Gandhi did not plan what was to happen after he was locked up. The result was that when he and the national leadership were locked up, the planning of the campaign fell to the hands of my friends who were mostly Congress socialists and militant nationalists. And they took over the running of the campaign underground. Then they planned it, and they planned uh, the uprooting of railway tracks, cutting of telegraph wires, what you might call sabotage of a slightly gentle kind. The main railway supplying the Burma front was destroyed. Military operations against the Japanese were delayed. For nearly two weeks, the governor of Bihar province was cut off in his capital, at Patna. So well, then we decided that the British government may reinforce the restraint in Patna by bringing armed forces. So it was better to isolate the headquarters, Patna, so that they could not bring their forces. And that could be possible only if we destroy train. We learned that we can get dynamite from the coal fields, so he brought dynamite. And he said, this is the last train that will run. Two hundred and seventy-nine railway stations and five hundred and fifty post offices were attacked. Thirty trains, many carrying vital war supplies for the Japanese front, were derailed, never to arrive. England knew very little about what happened in August 1942 when the main line railway between Delhi and Calcutta was broken. I think it didn't run for about two weeks when for quite a long time the rule of government didn't run in the province of Bihar, when there were uh, outrages of various sorts all over the country, when in Delhi itself it was as much as a white man's life was worth, unless perhaps he was a priest in his priestly robes, to show himself. In the summer of 1942, the British were stretched to the limit. The victorious Japanese were threatening India. Now India itself was on the edge of insurrection. Just three years ago, at the wedding of the Viceroy's daughter, the fabric of empire appeared unshakable. Now, disaster was just round the corner. back book, End of Empire, at the ABC shop in your capital city.
India was home to more Muslims than any other country on earth. Yet here, they were a minority. Britain's wartime need for allies was to give the Muslims the power to redraw the map of India. of a fire-swept Burmese town by night. The awful result of a Japanese attack on a completely undefended town from which the population fled as the place is gutted by a wholesale fire. Summer 1942. The Second World War was going badly for Britain. The Japanese had overrun Malaya, Singapore, and now Burma. The war had reached the frontier of India. Burma, India's neighbor, had no rail links with India. No proper roads. British troops, with no experience of tropical warfare, were forced into a long retreat back into India. By May, the Japanese loomed over the subcontinent. In one week, they sank a hundred ships off the east coast. Their bombers terrified India's eastern cities. When the raids came, the Japanese had carrier-borne uh, aircraft <coughs> who attacked Ceylon, and we had a, a squadron of hurricanes uh, and um, no Spitfires. I remember talking to the officer who commanded this uh, squadron. And he told me that after that, he hadn't got one hurricane that could take the air. There was really um, absolutely nothing at that stage at all. If the Japanese had had the strength to march into India, uh, you know, there was nothing to stop them. India had eight anti-aircraft guns. Invasion was expected daily. A million people fled Calcutta. Wavell came in, Commander-in-Chief, and uh, <clears throat> uh, he stood in front of the map. Uh, he was just going to go home, and he was uh, just leaving office. He just came in and said, um, uh, any, anything for me before I go? And he stood in front of the map and ruminated about the map. And he said, just imagine how stretched the Japanese must be at this moment. Um, They've pushed on much quicker than they thought they could. They've taken all this enormous area uh, from us and from the Dutch. Uh, and uh, they've been right down to uh, Singapore. And they've come right up to Burma. They must be stretched absolutely to the limit. If I had anything, I'd go for them now. I remember he said, if I had, if I had one division fit to fight, I'd go for them now. He said, look, I'm standing there like a little terrier in front of a, in front of a rat, I thought. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, but I haven't, I haven't got one division fit to fight. You see, we'd, we'd sent two divisions to Egypt by this time. Uh, we'd got the 4th and 5th Indian divisions in Egypt. We'd sent a, an army to Malaya, which had got into the bag almost as soon as it got there. Uh, and we'd lost uh, an army in Burma. Um, and um, we were really absolutely down to the bone. Indians, too, were in a dilemma. They disliked Hitler but they didn't trust Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. 
Congress, India's largest independence movement, were divided. Some wanted action against the British. Others wanted to fight for Britain in return for a guarantee of independence. Congress turned to the Mahatma, the great soul, Mohandas K. Gandhi. He was the inspired leader of non-violent protest, which his followers repeatedly turned to violence. The head of British security showed the Viceroy, Lord Linlithgow, detailed evidence of Congress plans for disruption. The Viceroy decided he must act fast. He showed me files showing, and how they had it, I don't know, but reports of committee meetings of Congress in various parts of the country in which assaults on police stations and on uh, railways and so on were, were, were being planned. Uh, after which I said to Lynn Lithgow, I'm entirely convinced, I think you've no alternative. Congress, at their August 1942 meeting, followed Gandhi. They demanded that the British should quit India. The next day, all the top leaders were arrested at dawn. Overnight, the head and shoulders were chopped off India's largest political party. Young congressmen woke up not knowing which way to turn. I rushed to a telephone talk. All lines disconnected. So we could not get contact with anybody. In the early morning, we had to walk up to the roads. We found all the roads deserted. Went up, went up to some extent on the Kalwa Devi road. And people were moving. And then we learned that all our leaders have been arrested. And Gandhiji has been given the message that every worker is a leader by himself. He has to take action as he chooses. Gandhi's followers wanted to hear his instructions. But his final words before his arrest only confused them. Each man his own leader. Do or die. The British must leave India, if need be, to God. If that is too much, then leave her to anarchy. On August the 9th, 1942, as Gandhi and the Congress leaders were arrested, rebellion erupted in the north of the country. India's biggest steel plant stopped work. And after the burning down of a parachute factory, a worried viceroy wrote to Churchill about this widespread sabotage of our war effort. If we bungle this business now, we shall damage India irretrievably as a base for future Allied operations. In late August, telephone lines were cut between the commercial capital, Calcutta, and the government at Delhi. The rebellion turned many liberal-minded Englishmen into Congress haters. Their anger increased by the taunts of Congress radio. We used to shift from one place to another because the police were chasing us. So in all, we operated for about six months. And in the, during this time, we changed six to seven places. Every 15 days or 16 days, we used to change. We had our own call sign, and the reception also was very good. We used to begin like this, that this is Congress radio calling from somewhere in India on 42.34 meters. The All India Congress Committee assures students who have left their British-controlled studies to take part in the Freedom Revolution that laws and ordinances now being promulgated by the tottering Indian branch of the British state will have no validity or application in the free state of India. The All India Congress Committee congratulates workers on strike for their unretreating determination not to resume work until freedom of India is achieved. 
The British were hard pressed everywhere in 1942. No more Indian troops to Africa. The offensive to recapture Burma was delayed. The Quit India Rebellion took a month to suppress. Most British now hated Congress. They were not alone. Muslims feared and loathed both Congress and the 300 million Hindu majority. The Muslims now became Britain's ally in the war. Britain's about face, playing the Muslim card, was to change India forever. There's no doubt that the British at that time were pretty angry with the, with the Congress and the Hindus, and pretty friendly with the Muslims. Well, you know, understandable, the Muslims were, he were helping, although they never officially supported the war effort, they were in fact helping, and the Congress were not. And that's where the ordinary British are said to hell with the Congress. The only All India Muslim Party, the Muslim League, had patchy support from the 90 million Muslims. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, its leader, now saw his chance to make the League the champion of Muslim India. With Congress leaders in jail, Jinnah could win British support. But he had to be careful. The League must appear as a nationalist party. Jinnah's best tactic was to demand a separate Muslim state in India, Pakistan. It was to be a haven in the northwest and the northeast, where the Muslims were a majority. It would be a Muslim homeland, freedom from Hindu Congress domination. Pakistan was a rallying cry, a slogan with mass appeal. Jinnah began to swing Muslim India behind him. Jinnah never lost his nerve. But on the more general field, his great strength was his complete intransigence. His philosophy of life was never compromised. If you start giving way at, uh, at one point, you give way everywhere. Fight the walls, fight the battle on the ramparts, and not on the citadels. Uh, and that, of course, very often meant being unreasonable. But I think if Jinnah had spoken frankly, he'd said you have to be unreasonable in order to get your own way. Jinnah got his way more and more. He was determined that the Muslims of India would show a united front for the League and Pakistan. That suited the British. They too wanted the Muslims united, but behind the war effort. Only in India, the reserve barracks, were there millions of men ready to fight for Britain worldwide. Britain could not afford to antagonize the Muslims, who made up a third of India's army. One person in eight of everybody living in the Royal Pindi area is a soldier. So the Premier of the Punjab, having thanked them for what they've done for the country, told them what the country was going to do for them. The British drew closer to the Muslims. Meanwhile, Jinnah took advantage of the Empire's wartime need for Muslim soldiers to advance the League. So the field was open for the Muslim Leaguers to go and uh, explain their point of view to the Indian Muslims as such and to the people at large. And there Mr. Jinnah used to talk, uh, sometimes he used to talk, I remember one speech of his which he made in Gujarat and he said, why not we and the Congress join hands together and face the John Bull? You see, that type of speeches he also used to make those days, you see. And that's why he became more popular. That used to satisfy the anti-British uh, sentiments of the Indian Muslims also. And uh, his demand for Pakistan, his emotional I mean, appeal and all that, made him more popular and indirectly the British government, when they left them uh, in the field single-handedly, openly, that uh, means that the British government, you see, encouraged them, you see, indirectly, not openly, indirectly, by giving them the open field. A free hand. A free point. hand, you see, in explaining their point of view to the people at large. The British thought Pakistan was just a harmless slogan to boost the League's popularity. Few took the demand seriously, or even believed Jinnah was serious about it. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Jinnah was cooperative. So, behind the scenes, the British offered the League a helping hand. Jinnah 
now growing in popularity, sent his number two, Liaquat Ali Khan, to talk to the British. He wanted to start a Muslim League newspaper, but he needed money. The Muslims were helping the war effort. They wanted to start a paper, a paper called Dawn. And, and we helped it by giving them advertisements. No, no direct subsidy, but giving them all kinds of government advertisements. Who approached you from the Muslims? Liaquat Ali Khan himself. And what happened? Oh, we gave, them, gave him, we gave him the advertisements. On a regular basis? Yes. Large sums of money? Enough to get the paper launched, sir, is what it really came to. Was it agreed that both sides would keep quiet about this? I don't think we ever came to any... Uh, uh, tacit agreement about it. But it was obviously to the interest of both sides not to talk about it. Churchill was determined to maintain the support of the Muslims. In June 1943, he appointed a new viceroy. Lord Wavell had been commander-in-chief of the Indian Army. Wavell immediately gave Churchill a surprise. The war was now going well. Wavell pressed for Congress and the League to be brought into the government at Delhi, while Britain still had power to shape events in India. He wanted Congress leaders out of jail and into government. The cabinet in London said no. Wavell wrote in his diary, I do not believe these men face their fences honestly. They profess anxiety to give India self-government, but will take no risk to make it possible. The cabinet is not honest in its expressed desire to make progress in India. Wavell soon released Gandhi from detention. He was sick and his wife had died. Pakistan was the talking point of India. Jinnah was now the undisputed leader of the Muslims. Gandhi left his prison cell and immediately went to meet his arch rival. It was a turning point for the Muslim League. I remember distinctly that after every meeting, I used to give him a sort of resume of what was happening and then he would ask me, well, what is Mr. Gandhi doing? Because Gandhi had only recently then been released from jail and uh, they were each, both of them trying to keep track of each other's footsteps. So that made me aware of the fact that uh, Mr. Jinnah was uh, always very keen to know every move, every step that Gandhi took, every word that he uttered, every little statement of Gandhi was kept recorded, pasted in a separate scrapbook. Gandhi, the master of publicity, had made a mistake. By simply talking to Jinnah, he forced the world's press to treat them as equals. Gandhi brought the Muslim League the public attention that Jinnah himself could never have won. Mr. Gandhi uh, told Mr. Jinnah, well, Jinnah, you have mesmerized the Muslims. He said, so what? You have hypnotized the Hindus. Naturally, the Gandhi Jinnah talks attracted the whole world. It gave Mr. Jinnah a very good opportunity to tell the world what he wanted and explain to the world the stand of the Muslim nation. And Mr. Gandhi, at the same time, uh, also, I think, got an argument that he tried his best. Gandhi reluctantly moved some way towards the Pakistan idea. Jinnah said no, it was not enough. While Gandhi put on a brave smile, the triumph was Jinnah's. They had nothing to give to one another, except future promises and good hopes, maybe. The deadlock confirmed Wavell's view that Indians excluded from government would argue forever. He wrote to Churchill, I am bound to say, after a year's experience in my present office, I feel that the vital problems of India are being treated by His Majesty's government with neglect, sometimes even with hostility and contempt. Wavell wanted to come home to put his case. Churchill refused. When he finally agreed, he kept the Viceroy waiting for two months before seeing him. The unfortunate Wavell couldn't even arrange an interview with any of the Indian political leaders without asking the permission of Churchill, who in fact 
grand Indian policy and decided what Wavell should and should not do. Churchill's own view about I India was that we should hold on as long as possible and, um, he, and only make concessions to Indian constitutional advance if the pressure became so strong that we couldn't do otherwise. Wavell found his position untenable in the sense that he was trying to carry out a policy in India uh, which was directly contrary to the policy that was desired by his political masters. In May 1945, the European war ended. Churchill faced a general election in Britain. If Wavell resigned, India would become an election issue. So Churchill let Wavell release the rest of the Congress leaders from jail and invite Indian politicians to a conference to discuss a new government in Delhi that would prepare the way for independence. Churchill's wartime policy had weakened Congress and helped unite the Muslims behind Jinnah. Congress emerged to find the Muslim League on the move. Shouting and cheering, the public gave Nehru a terrific welcome. Nehru could still bring out the crowds, but he knew that Congress was now a rusty machine. He started at once the difficult task of rebuilding the party, both its membership and organization. Wavell called the Indian leaders to the Viceroy's summer retreat at Simla in June 1945. He hoped that the conference would create a united government of Muslims and Hindus. With the British election set for July, Wavell tried to push India forward before a new government at home took office. Meanwhile at Dada, Pandit Nehru addressed a mammoth gathering. History was in the making. Indian leaders were about to discuss a plan which was calculated to change India's destiny and place her more prominently on the map of the world. Similar, Indian leaders met to discuss Lord Wavell's solution of the political deadlock. Mr. Gandhi, invited by Lord Wavell for a preliminary discussion, arrives by car and enters the compound of Manaville, residence of his hostess, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur. Wavell's plan was a bold one. A government composed entirely of Indian politicians, except for the Viceroy and Army Commander-in-Chief, would pave the way for a transfer of power to Indian hands. But Churchill's wartime encouragement of the Muslims had changed the political balance in India. All eyes were now not on Gandhi, but on Jinnah. Similar citizens turned out in large numbers to cheer the leaders whose deliberations would mould India's destiny. Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, president of the Muslim League, met the Viceroy soon after Mr. Gandhi. On that fateful day, many wondered what stand this brilliant lawyer would take. The atmosphere was charged with expectancy. He felt that the Muslims were the weakest of the three. The British held the power, they held the strings of power, the Hindus held the majority. So if there was a democratic system in a free united India, the Hindus would, would gain everything. So the Muslims could not sort of afford to annoy both. But Mr. Jinnah, he had a bit of a gambler in him. He took the risk. Wavell was generous to the Muslims. Though only a quarter of India's population they were offered as many places in his new executive council as the Hindus. The proposed new council would represent the main communities and would include equal proportions of caste Hindus and Muslims. Congress accepted this, despite their overwhelming majority in the country. They hoped for a share of real power at last. Jinnah then dropped a bombshell. He said only League Muslims could sit in the Viceroy's council. But Congress, too, had Muslim members. Its president, Maulana Azad, was a Muslim. Jinnah said even he must be kept out. 
His audacity shocked everyone. Mr. Jinnah spent three hours explaining to me the Muslims are a separate nation. As a separate nation, they require a separate homeland and they have a separate party. That is the Muslim League. The Hindus are a separate nation. They want a separate homeland. They have got one party, that is the Congress. The moment I, I, I give in to the view that the Muslims have different views about the fate of India, that there can be a representative, a genuine popular representative of the Muslims who is not a Muslim leaguer and not committed to Pakistan, then I give up my whole strength as the third force in India. And I completely understood that point. His strategy at that time was to get the Congress to acknowledge this fact that the Muslims were represented by the Muslim League and that the only the sole authoritative representative body of the Muslims of India was the Muslim League. But the Congress was not willing to do it. The Congress, of course, had uh, its own reasons because of its nationalism and because Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, who happened to be a Muslim, was the president of the Congress, so they found it very difficult. And Mr. Jinnah's main aim in the 1945 talks with Lord Wavell was to establish his sole authoritative capacity. Congress leaders argued that millions of Muslims supported them. Jinnah's claim to represent all India's Muslims had no basis. But the reason was very simple. Because all the Muslims of the country did not accept Jinnah as their leader. And so long as there were Muslims who did not accept him as their leader, it was not honest on our part to accept Jinnah as the sole representative of the Muslim community in this country. Congress insisted on the freedom to nominate anyone. Wavell agreed that Jinnah's demand to choose all the Muslims was unreasonable, and he rejected it. Jinnah then refused to join the council. Wavell knew that a council without Jinnah would be vetoed by Churchill, so Wavell could do nothing. Jinnah had a veto. They tried to overawe him, they tried to browbeat him, they tried to threaten him, they tried to purchase him, but he proved impervious to all threats and all uh, uh, inducements, which proved to the Muslims generally that he was a man who cannot let them down. And he was therefore their only leader, accepted leader, who could be followed right to the end. The crowds danced in Piccadilly. The war was over at last. city which for the whole duration of the war had been in the front line of battle, this was deliverance indeed. The men and women of the home front rejoiced with their allies of the United Nations in a tidal wave of emotion too deep for words. The British could now turn their attention to home affairs. The Labour Party had won the election. They promised domestic reform. Imperial greatness was on the way out, the welfare state on the way in. Another great cheer greeted the forces of India, whose magnificent fighting record is now saluted by Britain and her people. Gurkhas, Sikhs, Marathas, all were there. The men for whom this triumphal march was the fulfillment of all their hard-won victories. London gave these men from the hills and plains of India a very special cheer. Hopes were high that India might now be cut loose from the empire. In July 1945, Clement Attlee became Prime Minister. Labour's promise that India would be given her independence seemed close to fulfilment. But despite the cheers and victory parades, Britain was exhausted by six years of fighting. The huge conscript army were clamouring to get out of uniform. 
soldiers wanted to come home from India and from all over the world. Well, the most visible evidence, I suppose, was the rapid departure of British troops from, the, from India, which built up to a rate of about one division a month. They were visibly going, and there was no way by which a Labour government or the troops themselves would have been willing to delay their departure. Just as soon as shipping was available, they wanted out. So you're talking of a crumbling of the British element of force, the British element of, in the administration, the Indian police. This would produce impossible tensions and was not a thing we could rely on carrying forward. The new Labour government wanted to leave quickly. Britain was proud of the unity the Raj had imposed on India. Congress wanted the country to stay united, but Jinnah demanded Pakistan, which meant partition. Many millions of Muslims were now behind him. Just how many, the government in Delhi did not at first realize. When I got there at the end of, towards the, in the autumn of 45, I was astonished when I was asked, how, it, what about this Pakistan demand? Is this to be taken seriously? And I said, yes, it is, in my opinion. And I was surprised at the fact that that reply ca caused some astonishment. Because to me, it was perfectly obvious, coming from this very Muslim part of, of India, as it then was, the northwest frontier, there was an insistent demand building up for Pakistan. It wasn't yet final, but it was very strong and it was there. Attlee decided to test this demand by elections. Jinnah's claim and his demand for Pakistan were put to India's voters. In the cool weather early in 1946, the campaign was bitter and often violent. The Muslim League fought the election on a platform of one word, Pakistan. There's no doubt about it that at that time the atmosphere was very much, it had swung very much in favour of Mr Jinnah as far as the Muslims were concerned. He had just a public meeting where at least one million people were collected. The Muslims wanted to come and see him and just to see his face. They knew what he was talking, without understanding. I think they had established sort of a wavelength. Jinnah was not an impressive personality at long distance. He was a stick-like man. In other words, he was ascetic, he was very thin. He had a sort of Lazarus-type appearance, bloodless. He had a rapier-like mind. He was very fanatical in his pursuit of Pakistan, uh, but he didn't seem to be able to speak the language. He addressed his congregation in English. Uh, not more than half a percent could have understood English, but not a single man uttered a word. You couldn't hear a pin drop. Mr. Jinnah, wherever he went, was taken in royal processions. People would organize deceptions, setting up huge canopies and uh, organizing parties, receptions. The election split India. Congress did spectacularly well, but the League won nearly 90% of the seats reserved for Muslims. Attlee knew that this success would make Jinnah even more difficult to handle. Two months later, the Indian Navy mutinied. Then the British were forced to abandon the trials of Indian soldiers who had fought for the Japanese. British control was slipping. Attlee decided the time had come for London to take charge of events. He told Sir Stafford Cripps, an old India hand, to go there immediately, with A.V. Alexander and Lord Pethick Lawrence, the Secretary of State for India. The cabinet mission arrived in March 1946. Their job, to secure a peaceful British exit. Almost any arrangement the Indians could agree on would do. Pethick Lawrence at 75 was quickly dubbed Pathetic Lawrence. The cabinet mission hoped to safeguard British defense and trade worldwide. For that, Indian unity, one strong country, 
not partition into two, was the British aim. At New Delhi, the three-member cabinet mission begins its historic quest to find a solution to India's political deadlock. One of the largest press conferences in Indian newspaper history, with reporters from many countries present, was held as a preliminary to the talks. Lord Pethick Lawrence, in his opening remarks, underlined the principles which would guide them during the talks. Britain's need was urgent. A weakened post-war Britain needed the Congress and the League to agree quickly on a transfer of power to Indian hands. The mission has declared that it has come with no set plan for action. Already invitations have been sent to all prominent political leaders, asking them to explain their points of view to the cabinet ministers. And as we go on the screen, prominent leaders are reported to be on their way to Delhi. The cabinet mission arrived to break the deadlock left by Jinnah's unyielding demands at the Simla conference. Lord Wavell joined them in a task he had warned for three years would become harder the longer it was delayed. The Muslims had been Churchill's allies in the war. Now, by demanding partition and Pakistan, they became the cabinet mission's main problem. Jinnah was the obstacle to the united independent India that Attlee wanted. Congress, wartime villains, were now in agreement with the British government. Both wanted to keep India as one country. The more the cabinet mission examined the fine print of partition and understood what Pakistan would mean, the more they saw the virtue of Indian unity. From the official statements that have been made, a few important facts emerge. The Muslim League demand for Pakistan is the crucial problem and much of the discussion will center around this point. After sweating it out in the Delhi heat, the three Magi, as Wavell called them, withdrew to the cool hill station at Simla. There they met Gandhi, whose influence over the masses was still immense. Cripps made particular efforts to secure Gandhi's agreement, though by now he was not even a member of Congress. So Gandhi arrived, I mean, he said, uh, because I'm not really taking part in the discussion, he said, but uh, I have appointed myself as advisor to the British nation through the cabinet mission. Cripps was terrified of Gandhi. He admired him and he felt he ought to like him. Cripps was a marvelous man, a very moral man, and Gandhi's speciality was, of course, morality. Somehow or other, Gandhi got under his skin and he could never quite cope with him. And once when Cripps was taken ill, during the period of the cabinet mission and being taken to hospital. He said to me, for goodness sake, don't let that awful man come and see me in hospital. <laughs> the mission were not sure who to talk to in Congress. Some advised that Nehru was now the key figure. Others said that the president, Azad, spoke for them. Cripps felt that Gandhi was still the driving force, though as usual, Gandhi was quite unpredictable. There was a pair of German negotiations when Gandhi declined to, to have anything further to do with it. All that the cabinet mission had to do was to quit India, and if it was going to be a civil war, it was God's will, and on the whole, he thought it was God's will. But after a lot of pleading, he said, all right, I'll come and see you on Thursday morning. So he arrived at one of these uh, kind of Sunningdale houses on the vice regal estate, sat in a very English type of drawing room, sitting up on the sofa, and these three uh, cabinet members, uh, quite old they were, quite distinguished, come 5,000 miles, sat facing him and they started talking to him. And uh, we spent on for some time, they got no answer. Then he handed them a piece of paper. This is my day of silence, but please go on talking. And then <laughs> they went on talking and all they got were little notes saying things like, uh, he who gives quickly gives twice. Jinnah, like Gandhi, gave little away. He was now the bigger puzzle. Did he really want Pakistan? Would he settle for less? He used his old tactic of not budging an inch, confident of concessions by others. He was waiting. He was waiting because he was not sure whether the British government were prepared to disclose their hand. He had to wait because he was not sure of the Congress. And of course he had to wait because if he called his hand too early, he could have just exposed himself. Or if it was too late, then it would have been just too late. The Muslim League was the weakest party, but Jinnah controlled it completely. 
Unlike the Congress negotiators, he could demand whatever he wanted. He, he would always say he wanted the whole thing and nothing but uh, the whole of Pakistan. And when you said to him, but how are you going to run this economically and it's going to be very difficult, he would say, oh, just leave it to me. Give me the Pakistan and we'll see how well we'll run it. How much was that a politician's gambit, not to spell out what he wanted? Very much a politician's gambit. He was a very tough negotiator and he was very uh, determined to stick to saying one thing the whole time and not to be trapped into uh, concessions and complications and all the rest of it. The mission finally hammered out an agreement for independence. An Indian government in Delhi would keep control over taxation and defence. The provinces would be given generous powers and they could form into groups, almost giving the Muslims Pakistan. It was a loose federation, a united India which preserved Muslim interests. And it very nearly worked, you see, for 24 hours or more both Congress and the Muslim League had accepted it. And I said to Jinnah, well, at least you've got some way. He said, but how can I say to my people, uh, this is Pakistan? I said, well, you can say to them, it's the first step anyway, and you'll see how it works. And so he said, all right, I'll buy that, and he sold it to them. Jinnah's agreeing to a united India was a surprise. When the cabinet mission made plain Britain's determination to quit, he dropped his demand for Pakistan. What he had won was a larger share for the Muslims in the government of United India than anyone had thought possible. Congress leaders, especially Gandhi, thought he had won too much. Then I was asked to go and see Gandhi, and Gandhi said to me, oh, he said, um, you're a very mischievous man, you're a lovely man, actually, very funny. Uh, he said, um, um, you have a system in England whereby Parliament passes the laws, but the courts interpret them. And they may say uh, that what Parliament think they have passed is not at all what they have passed, and alter the law. He said, well, he said, I've been apply applying my aged lawyer's brain to this document, and I don't think it means what the Cabinet mission thinks it means. And then we knew we were done for. Congress acceptance did not last long. They tried to change the terms. Nehru and other Congress leaders made statements that amounted to rejection. But Jinnah had committed himself to a united India. He had given up Pakistan. When Congress backed away from the cabinet mission plan, Jinnah was convinced they were out to double-cross him. Angrily, he changed tactics. He declared, We have forged a pistol. We bid goodbye to constitutional methods. August the 16th, he called a day of action. In Calcutta, the League held a demonstration. Then the Muslims began three days of mass slaughter, the Calcutta killings. Hindu retaliation was swift and bloody. When the killings were over, four to five thousand lay dead, putrefying in the monsoon heat. A week later, when the army had put a stop to the looting and murder, the stench of death still hung over Calcutta. The Muslim flag is much in evidence in certain areas, though of course in some districts, Muslims and Hindus literally live on opposite sides of the same street. However futile and distressing, it's really not surprising that communal clashes still occur. British troops, these are infantrymen of the Yorks and Lanks driving Stuart tanks in a Muslim area, are regarded as a reassuring asset in this tense situation. The killing sparked retaliation far and wide. The murder launched by Jinnah's day of action continued in other parts of India for 16 months. Atli knew that he had to propel India forward to independence before anarchy engulfed the whole country. In September 1946, the Viceroy set up an interim government with Nehru as chief minister. The Muslim League refused to join and boycotted it. The interim government was duly sworn in and Mr Nehru presided over the first cabinet meeting. Mr. Nehru emphasized the vital importance of cooperation among all Indians. 
But when he and his colleagues assembled on the balcony of the Viceroy's house, they had a mixed reception, though it's reported that cheering almost drowned the Muslim cries of long live Pakistan. The following months, the League reluctantly agreed to join. The Muslims went in to protect themselves from being isolated from negotiations with the British. It didn't go in a spirit of cooperation of running a smooth federal government of United India with the, with the Hindus, because that would have been a complete negation of what we had always been saying is impossible. The Muslim League Minister Abdul Rab Nashtar was in charge of communications. Naturally, he wanted to be informed of what was going on inside the Congress Party. The easiest way was to, to him was for him to organize bugging at the telephone exchange. So the Muslim members of the interim government, or one of them at least, was bugging the telephones of a Congress member of the same government. Of all the Congress ministers, he had got. All the telephones bugged. And I'm not sure whether even the Viceroy's telephone was not bugged by him. The interim government, intended as a coalition, was now two warring groups. Wavell was near to despair. One day, towards the end of August, when I was riding with him, he said that next month I finished three years in this job. And I said to him, how do these three years compare with the earlier three years you had in the Middle East? He said, there's no comparison. I knew something about that job. Did he really feel out of his depth like that? I think he was beginning to feel that the situation was getting beyond his resolution, his powers of resolving it. Do you think London felt that as well? Yes, I think London began to feel that too. And I think, I don't know at what point they began thinking of a successor, but I would guess it was from that autumn. In December 1946, Attlee summoned the Viceroy and the Indian leaders to London in a desperate effort to get the League and Congress to cooperate. I am very happy that I am at this function and uh, already I had the opportunity of meeting some friends, and uh, I might yet find more friends, but you give me no time to do anything else. <laughs> the talks got nowhere. Attlee decided on drastic action. When this complete impasse had been reached, we decided that the only hope was to send out another viceroy. If we were putting all our faith in the possibility of persuading the Indian leaders uh, to agree about the future of India, we had to send someone out with the personality that was most likely to achieve our objective. There were two telegrams. There was a, a, a first one which explained that there was going to be a new Viceroy and certain of the practical details about it. And then, uh, they were cipher telegrams, of course, and then it said at the end, uh, name follows in, uh, name, name in my following telegram. And then the follow-up telegram simply had the one word, Mountbatten. you can't afford to miss returns to ABC this Wednesday at 8 o'clock. The Investigators. As a wave of killing swept across North India, Britain announced the date of her departure. The Raj would end in just 16 months, June 1948.
For the overstretched British of the Indian police, the Indian Empire, after 150 years, could not end fast enough. Certainly I was almost at the end of my tether. We've been rioting since November 1946, with practically no rest, no sleep. And day after day, there was one crisis or another to deal with. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led 90 million Muslims, a quarter of the population, who feared Britain would hand them over to the 300 million Hindus. The Muslims dreaded a Hindu Raj. Civil war now threatened. I felt that we were stretched to the limit of our resources. And my police were having to operate in such appalling conditions. And there were mob confrontations. And uh, I got terribly worried about my police because whereas before all this boiled up, it was anti-British. Now they realized, the crowds realized that, it was, that we were determined to grant independence. And it became virulently a case of hatred between the communities. The violence engulfed five huge provinces of northern India. The Hindu majority in one village, hearing of their kinsfolk killed in another, turned on the few Muslims in their midst. Rumor spread the infection of slaughter. The province of the Punjab was to be the heart of Pakistan, the homeland the Muslims wanted carved out of India. Around the capital, Lahore, Muslims were the majority. Here they felt secure. But the east of the Punjab was dominated by Sikhs. They had a warrior tradition and were close allies of the Hindus. Sikh fear of being swept into Pakistan now raised their hatred of Muslims to a frenzy. The smell of death hung over the Punjab. As the British prepared to go, the killing threatened to become organized mass slaughter. My Sikh and Hindu police were being singled out by the Muslim mobs for, uh, for violence. And in fact, they came along to me saying, you British and your Muslim police could do what they like to us, but we're not going to have your Hindus and Sikhs. We won't answer for the consequences. So it was a very worrying situation because we were a thoroughly integrated force. Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee decided that he must himself take charge. Attlee had one objective. Britain must quit India. The mood of the government at home was to decolonialize. Uh, so far as I was concerned, I was impressed by the fervor of, of the nationalist movement in India, and I thought, if there's no disposition at home, and it just wasn't on in the political climate of the times to maintain our rule in India by force, uh, the sooner we got out, the better. Britain's capacity to dominate India had been drained by six years of war. The British presence had been cut to the bone. Half the district officers were Indian now. With the violence between the two communities, Hindus and Sikhs on the one side, Muslims on the other, getting worse, the British felt it was essential to go quickly before they totally lost control. The danger was worst in Lahore. The Muslims got up on their roofs and they were shouting to each other across the rooftops the Urdu word for beware, khabadar, khabadar. This sounded almost like a pack of jackals. I think people were simply scared to death. People who had been living quite peacefully for many years, uh, Muslims at one end of the street, Hindus or Sikhs at the other, uh, they suddenly found they couldn't trust uh, their neighbors. They were really terrified of being bombed or shot at or having a house set fire to. There was a sort of snowball effect of fear spreading right through the city in the hall. And the same thing, I think, happened in Amritsar and other uh, big cities in, in the Punjab. It was really awful to watch it happen. 
The killings and destruction were now straining the meager British administration to breaking point. I personally saw a lorry load of corpses. There were women who had been stripped naked, appallingly mutilated, and left on the side of the road in the whole city. Uh, since they were Muslim women, I could only assume that they had been murdered by Sikhs or Hindus. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led the Muslim League, the dominant voice of Islam in India. He demanded the partition of India to create Pakistan. The British had persuaded Jinnah to abandon his demand for Pakistan in return for a large share of power in a united India. But Jawaharlal Nehru, the leader of Congress, India's largest political movement, feared that the deal had given Jinnah too much. Congress backed away. Jinnah was furious. His Muslim supporters started the killings that threatened to destroy any solution. The British were now desperate to leave. Civil war was a near certainty and less Britain moved quickly. In December 1946, Attlee decided to appoint a new viceroy. His inspired choice took everyone by surprise. Lord Louis Mountbatten, cousin of the king, was appointed to end British rule in India. Mountbatten insisted on the time limit of just 16 months. He was to secure agreement between Muslims and Hindus. If he could not, Britain would leave in June 1948, come what may. When Mr. Attlee asked me to take on this job, he rather took my breath away. This wasn't something that could be decided straight off. And in fact, we had several meetings about it. I asked to see the king. As king emperor, he kept very close touch with Indian affairs. I pointed out to him that the chances of complete failure were very great. And it would be bad for him to have a member of his family fail. He replied, but think how good it would be for the monarchy if you succeed. And he then asked me formally to accept the appointment. The scene is Northolt Airfield, the occasion the departure of Lord Mountbatten of Burma, who was leaving for India with his wife. Before the new Viceroy, there lay the task of holding office for the brief but obviously difficult period of just over a year until the date when Indians are to take full control of India. Lord Mountbatten's recently married daughter, Lady Brabourne, was there with her husband to see them off. So too was Lieutenant Mountbatten, formerly Prince Philip of Greece. Everyone in Britain, I'm certain, wishes the Viceroy all possible success in India. Uh, and you see, it was a great thing to send a, a member of the royal family as the last Viceroy to India. It was a brilliant notion of Atlas because it very greatly pleased them. Uh, and they thought, well, at least sort of the royal family itself is taking part in this uh, uh, historic handover and stuff. Before he went, you know, Mark Batten said to me, uh, do you think uh, I should go just in sort of plain clothes and arrive as Viceroy like that? Because after all, they're all very left wing and so on. I said, good Lord, no. Put on your best admiral's uniform, all your medals. Do the lot. Have bands playing when you arrive. Oh, good, he said. I'm so glad. But <laughs> he loved uniform. That's exactly what he did. And of course, he went down a tree. Mountbatten was one of the most uh, ambitious people in the world. He was one of the most egoistical, too. He thought a great deal of himself. And above all, he wanted to do brilliantly. This was the apotheosis of his career, and he knew it. And he wasn't going to make a ball of it if he possibly could. And of course, he didn't. He became really, I wouldn't say loved, but uh, respected over and beyond the call of duty by most Indians, particularly by Nehru, who, who formed a, a very considerable attachment, not so much to him, but to his wife, but nonetheless, it, 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 it helped. 
And uh, no, I think he will be remembered as the most successful amateur politician. <laughs> Mountbatten had driven a hard political bargain with an increasingly desperate Prime Minister. He had insisted on a free hand, the right to make decisions on the spot without reference to London. His predecessor, Lord Wavell, never had a free hand. Batten had been a senior war commander. Attlee banked on him to avert a disaster. On March the 22nd, 1947, Mount Batten was installed as the last British Viceroy of India moved so well and it was because they themselves were both very proficient. He had this German quality of extreme discipline and, and proficiency and everything had to be perfect. It was a very social household. There were dinner parties and drink parties and um, we knew that it was the end of an era. Everybody in that house knew that when Mountbatten left there was going to be prohibition so that everybody was determined to drink the Viceroy's cellar dry. And that didn't make for a clear head early in the morning, except that Lord Louis, as we called him, and Lady Louis always were clear-headed and knew exactly what they were going to do with the rest of the day. And we would follow rather bleary-eyed and often muddled and do the best we could. He was very vain. He was extremely good-looking. And he had only to walk into a room and every female heart fluttered. And he knew that, and he'd stand there with a very look-at-me sort of uh, attitude and, and charm everybody in, in the room. He enjoyed the way he looked and the fact that the ADC who walked behind him would generally carry a comb so that when Lord Louis stepped out of a plane or a car, he could see that his hair was in place. And in sharp contrast, she never really cared how she looked. She didn't care whether her hair looked right or whether her makeup was all right or not. And very often friends of hers who came out from England would say, well, she's, you've only got two dresses, it seems to me. Don't you think you ought to have a few more? And it, she, she never cared about that sort of thing. And that, too, was very endearing. I think Mark Batten's personal glory was probably never very far from his mind. He brought out with him two young women whose sole job was to cut out and paste into enormous portfolios all the pictures and references to him that appeared in the Indian press. And I would guess that now at Rumsey is the best documented life of anybody who's ever lived in this country. I don't know, but I would think that there is a beautifully and completely documented life of Mount Batten. Had he chosen to go on the stage, he, he would have outshone Laurence Olivier. I could see that everything was going to depend upon personal relationships. If I could build up an atmosphere of trust and understanding with the key figures, I might succeed. If I couldn't do that, I knew I hadn't got a hope. And of course, all this had to be done in such a way that none of them could think that the others were being privileged or getting away with backstairs methods. Most lacking in trust was Jinnah. He had won the support of the Muslims with a simple battle cry, Pakistan, a separate Muslim state. But it hardly looked a practical idea. The League was asking for four provinces in the northwest and two in the east, which would make a Pakistan suspended in two halves, with almost nothing in common and 800 miles of India in between. Jinnah refused to discuss these drawbacks to Pakistan or any matters that might have caused divisions within the Muslim League. He was used to being in control, 
and before meeting Mountbatten, he prepared himself with care. It was generally regarded that Jinnah was a remote and rather cold personality. And uh, before the meeting took place, uh, we went out uh, into the garden uh, for, a, for a official photograph, and Jinnah did his very best to be charming. He stood with Lord and Lady Louis, the idea being, of course, that Lady Louis would be in the middle and Mr. Jinnah and Mountbatten on both sides. And Jinnah made his first effort at the charming remark, describing, saying that she was a rose between two thorns. Unfortunately, he was in the middle. What did he say to you after his first meeting with Jinnah? Well, he said, by God, he is cold. Which he was. Uh, uh, Jinnah uh, was a very remote, very uh, austere figure. And uh, I don't think he was going to be charmed in quite the same way as some of the other leaders were. Jinnah had few friends. No one knew him well. And he kept one secret that might have changed history. In early 1947, Jinnah learned his life was nearly over. He had incurable TB. Had Congress or the British known, they would have redoubled their efforts to keep India united. Gandhi, above all, hated the idea of partition. Without Jinnah, he would have vetoed it. He could still cause trouble. When he started calling Edwina and me his dear friends, I began to have the feeling that we were halfway home. It was characteristic of Gandhi that at our very next meeting, the next day in fact, he proposed as a solution to India's problems that I should ask Jinnah to form an administration. He really meant it, even though he must have realized that this meant giving the Muslims virtual control. Anything rather than see India divided or have a civil war. Of course, it was quite impractical. I told him he must first get the support of the Congress party. And this, he naturally failed to get. But that was Gandhi. Nehru was already a friend, of course, my first meeting with him had been almost exactly a year before when he visited Singapore whilst I was still Supreme Commander, Southeast Asia. He knew now that he would get a fair deal from me. With Nehru, the trust I was trying to build up with the leaders was already there, and more than trust, friendship. It was not only between him and me, but with Edwina, and my daughters Patricia and Pamela too. He believed that our whole family loved India and would try and do what was right for India. You see, my father was rather starved. Uh, when you have a, a rather rich personality, a many-sided personality, you need a number of different relationships in order to, um, you know, feel fully alive. And I think that he was missing that type of conversation earlier, which he got with the Mountbatten. And, and a, a closer touch with the newer ideas of the Western world. Mountbatten had the great merit of perceiving from the outset and sticking firmly to it, perceiving at the outset that he must keep Nero on his side. He perceived that and never lost sight of it. That was partly the secret of his success. It's rather a terrible thing for me to say. My brother's colleagues, uh, for many years being men, who, s who were identified in spirit, loyalty, love, spoke a different language. And here was this Englishman who was closer to him, vis-a-vis -vis the background, you know, and a very sophisticated and clever man who knew just how far to go with Nehru. Nehru led Congress, the government in waiting. The problem was Jinnah. The state of Pakistan that he had led the Muslims to demand would include millions of Hindus and Sikhs. The province of Bengal was slightly more than half Muslim, but it was almost half non-Muslim, and its capital, Calcutta, was the largest Hindu city in India. The Punjab was similar half Muslim, but containing millions of Sikhs, who defiantly launched their own claim for a state. And in the rest of India, another 40 million Muslims were scattered. If Jinnah's Pakistan was created, they would be left out. He argued 
There must be partition. Otherwise, as a minority community, the Muslims would be swamped in Hindu India. Right, I said. Then by the same argument, the two provinces you want in Pakistan with large non-Muslim minorities will also have to be partitioned. Oh no, you can't do that. Punjabi unity and Bengali unity are much more important than Hindu-Muslim differences. In that case, I said, surely Indian unity is much more important than Hindu-Muslim differences. Oh no, said Jenna, we must have Pakistan. And so it went on. A circular argument, round and round the mulberry bush. I never met anybody who could say no so persistently and so effectively. Jenna was now the prisoner of his own propaganda. He could not withdraw the Pakistan demand or persuade the British to give it to him in full. He had to wait till the moment when the time came for the real distribution of power. He wouldn't like to disclose his hand beforehand because that would expose him. He wouldn't like to overcall because the bluff could always be uh, exposed. So he had to wait till the decisive moment. And I think that was the correct strategy, as far as I see, as a student of politics also, and as one who has happened to work with him, that was the correct strategy at the time, to wait till the last minute. Because the British were all, we were not sure about the British also. When they would leave? When they would leave. And naturally, when they decided to leave, then he disclosed his hand. Even before Mountbatten arrived, Congress leaders, except Gandhi, had accepted partition. Congress were desperate to secure an effective government in Delhi. But if United India included Jinnah, it looked increasingly ungovernable. They called Jinnah's bluff and agreed to Pakistan. What else could be done? You see, when you get gangrene in your leg, you have to cut it off, isn't it? If you allow it to remain, the whole body gets gangrene. Congress feared a civil war. The leaders were worried that Britain might delay independence until no governable India was left for anyone to take over. They're getting on, you see. And none of them young men. I was young, so I could take a different view, younger than them. But they probably felt this was it. How long were they going to be in the wilderness? Not everyone likes being in the wilderness. I think they had, had enough. They want to settle for what was possible. Nehru wanted a strong India. To get it, a partition that removed some Muslim areas was necessary. It was a price he was reluctantly prepared to pay. Oh, very reluctant. There was no acceptance in any sense of the word as, a, as something that was right. It was just something that had to be, and well, let's make it as good as we can. Gandhi, the father figure of Congress, had always opposed any partition of India. Now, in June 1947, he chose to remain silent and say nothing. He began to realize that he was not at the center of the, uh, at this moment in time, of the Congress negotiating position. And so, being a master of symbolism, which he always was, uh, he used uh, his realization of this by when he saw Mountbatten at a key moment in the negotiations to say to him that this is my day of silence. And by, you know, on his day of silence, he had to write notes. He didn't say anything. He wrote it on the back of an envelope that, it, that Mountbatten would realize that he, Gandhi, today could say nothing because it was his day of silence. That was his, if you like, uh, symbolic way of saying that he was no longer going to take a, a veto position or a central position in the, in the discussion. Gandhi, who had repeatedly frustrated British policy by well-publicized fasts unto death, now chose not to protest. Gandhi pushed himself aside. He had asserted himself in moments when he wanted to. Why did he at that time not stand up and say, kill me, and then take Pakistan? He didn't. Mountbatten's award followed the plan Congress had already outlined. Jinnah was given Pakistan, but it was much smaller than he had demanded. Instead of the whole of Bengal, he would get the Muslim area only. And in the Punjab, he would receive only the West. Jinnah had called this a truncated and moth-eaten Pakistan. 
He had said he would never accept it. Now, in the closing days of the Raj, would Jinnah fight on or give in? The meetings with Jinnah were very difficult on these matters. He was legalistic, he was formal. And on one occasion, during one of these discussions, when Mountbatten thought he was carrying, with, carrying him with him, Jinnah said, no, Your Excellency, he said, I can't agree, but I accept. So Mountbatten said, well, Mr. Jinnah, you're playing with words. It really it needs, it is a serious matter, and uh, I really can't follow that kind of uh, distinction. But he left it at that. Came the day of the actual key meeting, the meeting of the leaders for, in effect, passing a fifth of the human race into new, new into a new order, a very great moment. Now, Baden opened the proceedings to say that this was a very great moment in history. The leaders were now assembled for this great responsibility. He said, I think we have reached a moment, and he looked at Mr. Jinnah, he said, not where we will all agree, but where we must all accept what is going to happen. Jinnah nodded his head and said, today, agreement is accepted. I must say that I feel the Viceroy has battled against various forces very bravely. And the impression that he has left on my mind is he was actuated by high sense of fairness and impartiality. And it is up to us to make his task less difficult. But behind Jinnah's diplomatic language lay a crushing defeat. Mountbatten and Congress had kept Pakistan to a bare minimum. We have therefore decided to accept these proposals. It is with no joy in my heart that I commend these proposals to you, though I have no doubt in my mind that this is the right course. The proposal to allow certain parts to secede is painful for any of us to contemplate. <coughs> Nevertheless, I am convinced that our present decision is the right one. We are little men serving great causes, but because the cause is great, something of that greatness falls upon us also. Mighty forces are at work in the world today and in India, and I have no doubt that we are ushering in a period of greatness for India. By June 1947, all parties had agreed on partition. But every day, the slaughter between Muslims and Hindus was getting worse. Bengal in the east was now the flashpoint. To prevent further killings, Gandhi went on a fast to death. During his fast, processions marched through the city with the people shouting, let Gandhi break his fast. And although the disturbances lasted for some time, the miracle, as many Indians describe it, was eventually accomplished. After about 73 hours, the city was reported as quiet and Gandhi ended his fast. Mountbatten feared that if he stayed the full year, a raging civil war would break out. The Raj, he decided, must be ended fast. With little ceremony for once, Mountbatten announced that Britain was about to leave and a year earlier than promised. It was uh, extremely well staged, managed, and there was this great number of foreign correspondents from all over the world. Uh, and when somebody asked about the date of handing over, because at that time, as you know, the whole idea was that June 48 was going to be. And so everybody was working roughly on that assumption. And he said, um, 14th, 15th, August. And there was a pin drop silence, pin drop silence. And everybody thought that he has not correctly what he'd forgotten. And, um, and after that, he turned around. Uh, 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 
and he said, uh, that is all what you wanted, freedom quickly, independence quickly, I've given it to you. Partition was now to be in seven weeks, not 12 months. Sir Cyril Radcliffe arrived in Delhi. He sat poring over outdated maps and population data. He had to decide the partition line in the two provinces, Punjab and Bengal. Radcliffe had just 37 days. It was so childish. You had a calendar and you took a page out. And you were dividing a subcontinent, or I should say continent. This continent is bigger than that of Europe. <laughs> and there it was. For Radcliffe, the partition of Bengal between Muslims and Hindus was difficult enough. But it was the other partition, the Punjab, that was the greater problem. There, the Muslims and Sikhs were hopelessly intermixed. Their crops depended on irrigation by canal. If the boundary cut a canal, the enemy controlled the lifeline. The killing now reached fever pitch. Muslims in East Punjab began moving out of India to the safety of their future homeland, Pakistan. In the west of the province, the Sikhs, fearful of being trapped in the Muslim state to be, headed east to India. For once, Mountbatten had slipped up. He himself had underestimated uh, the um, appalling consequences uh, of partition in the, in the north. He didn't realize that the Sikhs would fight as they did, and, and what appalling massacres would occur between the two communities. As each side began a mass slaughter of the other, Sikhs headed for Amritsar with its golden temple, the holy shrine of the Sikhs. The killing in North India, which was to overshadow the first months of independence, had begun. And twice to Lord Mountbatten, I told that we fear that the Sikhs are organizing um, um, a planned violence in the parts of in which they are in a majority and that we apprehend very grave uh, consequences, to which Lord Mountbatten said that I should not bother about it for a second. They will have the situation completely in control. That, no. that need not trouble me in the least. Millions were on the move. Every family desperate to be on the right side of the boundary line. Whether on foot or crammed into trains or buses, the refugees were easy prey to armed bands from the other side. The killing went on till November 1947. I was reporting for the BBC and I had a microphone recorder, a small portable recorder. And I remember that I was, had a jeep going up. And again and again, I used to sing of these massacres taking place, certainly on the, on the Grand Trunk Road itself, when people tried to tap people down. I'd lift up the microphone and said, the BBC is watching you, BBC watching you, and they'd stop. The next ordinary thing was in the middle of all these scenes, nobody for a moment touched me or any European. We were the untouchables, in the nicest possible way. I remember one afternoon there was a convoy which came across from Firozpur in India. And these refugees were in a very miserable condition. Uh, 
it was not uncommon to find as many as 200 or 300 men, women and children coming along stark naked without a stitch of clothing on them. They were horribly mutilated, maimed. Some of them had broken limbs. Uh, the women had their breasts cut off. Uh, there were children carrying dead children just for the sake of burying them in the soil of Pakistan. And uh, all told, uh, it was not a very pretty sight, I can assure you. Lady Mountbatten has been paying visits to refugee camps and listening to many fearful stories of the fighting. At Jalanda and Amritsar, for example, thousands of refugees told her of their appalling experiences. As if the massacres were not enough, floods have added to the terrible tribulations of the people of the Punjab. The heavy rains have swollen the river Ravi, and many refugees have been stranded, unable to cross to safety. Some food has been dropped by air, but the tragedy is on too big a scale for such a solution. There is little safety even in travel by railway, for many trains have been attacked and the passengers killed. The trains ran a serious risk. They had to water the engines, and there were Anglo-Indian drivers who shunt the train into a siding, go off to water the engines, that gave the seat bands a chance. They'd come in and they'd go right through the train and kill everybody. The train would then shunt onto Lahore, where in the siding they'd have to take the dead out. And they were a terrible sight. I don't go into details, but you can imagine. And they could almost see them coming with the fly swarms around them. And when the bodies were taken out and laid down, and they would be about 2,000 at a time. I never forget one station official turning to me, who would obviously used to order the pride of, of uh, British India was the railways, it was a tremendous system. And he looked at that and he said to me, a voice I never forget. Sir, it is hardly worth issuing tickets anymore. A good man horrified by the collapse of water. And next door was the Walton railway station. We were taking these trains there because otherwise people were getting worked up in Lahore. And there you saw bodies of women, bloated bodies of women, some sucking their babies, and these uh, lances strike through the babies and the mothers. Bloated bodies, pulling them out, all, it was, you couldn't sort of get to those uh, compartments, number one, on account of the uh, smell that was there. And then, to look at those bodies, uh, you just, no human being could stand the sight of women in such, such condition, cut up and badly raped and badly uh, handled. I saw a railway station in Amritsar where I had gone to receive somebody that the local people got hold of a, a boy and when his pants were taken off, he was found to be circumcised and they said, you are a Muslim. And he uh, begged of them that he was not Muslim. His mother cried and she said, oh, we are Hindu and he is not a Muslim boy. But because of the circumcision, you know, he was killed right in the railway station. Our parents, they made us together in one room, locked us in one room, and brought kerosene aisle for us, there, in that room. And they said, okay, whenever there is any raid, we will burn you up there. And even we girls, we were prepared for that. We you were prepared to be burnt up rather than fall yes, in the hands of we, the Muslims? Yes, we preferred death to disgrace at that time. My own sister-in-law, she was uh, stabbed there, uh, by her own husband because he was, uh, mm, she was being removed by the Muslim people. So he just killed her there, right in our own house. In Walpur, where I was, most of the Sikhs in villages left of their own accord before anything had happened, very wisely. 
But once the turmoil had started, any Sikh in Balpur, I ultimately said to myself, he's a dead man unless he's under my direct eye. As I looked at each day's new results of communal discord, I realized that in their present mood, the religious groups were just not going to be able to live together. They were tearing their country to pieces. Mountbatten made only two visits to the riot areas. His priority was to get out before British prestige collapsed entirely amid the slaughter. I think that this was the only big mistake he, he, he made. I think that otherwise he was pretty well informed and he was, the important thing was that he, he did realize uh, that we had to keep to a very rapid timetable if we were to able, if we were going to be able to leave India uh, in peace and without a, a complete breakdown in the administration. In July, Mountbatten set up a Punjab boundary force to police the future dividing line. It had an impossible job. Its 55,000 soldiers could not cover hundreds of miles of countryside. Reduced to virtual spectators, its British officers could only send Mountbatten daily situation reports as the killings went on. 20th of June, 1947. Since last report, there have been 14 killed, 50 injured, 38 fires and three bomb explosions. Report number 697, 14th of July, 1947. A bomb exploded outside a Sikh canteen and there was immediately a free fight. Eight persons were killed and 35 injured. 8th of August 1947, Amritsar and Lahore cities continue to give trouble. Daily casualties running at between 50 and 100. Report number 704, 13th of August 1947. The Muslims in Amritsar district have hit back and in a village named Jalalabad have eliminated a local Hindu minority, killing probably over 70 people. Situation reports which were uh, made up and uh, sent in quintuplicate. Uh, one copy went to the cabinet, I know. Um, two or three copies were retained in India, and one, one always heard, went to Churchill. But these sit reps went in every day with an assessment of casualties uh, and were made up from reports from all over the, this very large area. Uh, it is true that. Um, they were difficult to assess, but based on what one saw oneself, there's no reason to, to think that something of the order of a million men, women and children, civilians, uh, was by no means unlikely. It's always been my own view and one which I personally have not departed from. It's impossible to conceive of, of 500,000 being, being slaughtered in that way. I just don't believe that and I think it was I would say at the outside, the people involved in casualties, killed, killed and wounded, would have been inside 250,000, inside it. How many people actually were killed since you were there as the body counter for the BBC? I think the massacre total has been seriously underestimated. I know a figure of a quarter of a million has been suggested and almost officially accepted. It's a long time ago now and I don't think I pain anybody by saying that that figure is seriously underestimated. I think it was certainly getting more towards the million. You couldn't make a, a possibly an accurate account because these massacres were taking place in lonely places, in all sorts of uh, villages, little towns, all through the Punjab and on, on in Sikistan. Yes, I think I would go on record, stick my neck out and say uh, nearly a million. Killed. Yes, I would say so. Mountbatten wanted to be the head of state, the governor general of both the two new Commonwealth members, India and Pakistan. Nehru suggested it. Jinnah said no. So on August the 13th, the last viceroy was in Karachi, to see Jinnah installed as Pakistan's first Governor General. Muslims of India have shown to the world that they are a united nation and their cause is just and righteous, which cannot be denied. But the celebrations couldn't hide the reality. Lacking an army and civil service, 
even government files and typewriters, Pakistan began life with few tangible assets. While the crowds cheered in Karachi, no one will ever know whether Jinnah felt happy at the Pakistan he had created. But in India the following day, everyone was happy. The scene in Delhi was typical of hundreds of towns throughout the vast territory that was about to become the dominion of India. Cows being held sacred by the Hindus are never driven off the pavements, and all the familiar activities to be witnessed in this teeming city were being carried on as usual. But there was an undercurrent of pent-up excitement, for everyone knew that India, Hindustan India, was now to be free and independent. Independence night was superb. We came out onto the balcony of the, uh, the, uh, the Legislative Assembly and looked straight down this huge avenue that again Lutyens had planned for great state occasions. There must have been a million people there, uh, no exaggeration. And there was a roar, a bubbling, a, a roar of utter happiness. And when the conch horn sounded and India was independent, that was the night, the very moment, 12 o'clock midnight. A roar came to that crowd such I've never heard before. And I've heard great many rallies, great crowds. In fact, I, I was at the Nuremberg rally when Hitler appeared. This was a different roar. This was a roar of utter happiness, content, and never were the British more popular. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. I happened to be outside the Parliament House when uh, Nehru made this famous Tryst with Destiny speech. It was, it was an enormous crowd and somehow one had forgotten all about what we'd been through in the killings and the riots all along uh, and one felt very elated at long last the country was free and we could manage our own affairs it was next morning near prince's place where mount battens went in there horse-drawn carriage to the Red Fort. I couldn't believe the crowd took the horses away and dragged this carriage themselves, cheering the British and very staid, stiff British officers in uniforms were lifted shoulder high and cheered. It seemed that 150 years of bitterness and all the anti-British feeling had totally vanished and uh, this nation become more pro-British than it had ever been since the British came. I take the view that Mountbatten is cut with He got all the British troops out without a single casualty Indians and Pakistanis murdered and butchered in the most cruel way. I think the withdrawal of British power was too sudden and uh, rather selfish. So I do not admire either the dignity or the grace. It was very popular then. Mountbatten became an Indian hero. So I would say, yes, Mountbatten did a very good job for Britain, did a very lousy job for India.
50 years ago, this man was the most wanted person in the British Empire. He has more than 30 aliases, but he is most commonly known as Chin Peng. All next train for a glimpse of the number one terrorist. There he is, that's him. Chin Peng, directly responsible for a brutal seven-year campaign of murder and terrorism against the ordinary people of Malaya. Earlier, he had been awarded the OBE for helping the British fight the Japanese in World War II. We are gathered together here today to honor the leaders who symbolize the magnificent struggle which the people of all communities in Malaya put up during the war. This film is the story of how one of Britain's most dependable wartime allies became one of her gravest post-war enemies. For 12 years, the British battled to crush Jin Peng's communists. They put in place a level of population control rarely seen before or since. Though a war by any other name, it was known throughout as the Malayan Emergency. A fictional Chin Peng has appeared in several films and novels. The man behind these new outbreaks is A Siong, late of the Chinese 136 group, trained by us to fight the Japs. <laughs> and believe it or not, he marched beside us in the victory parade. I'm A Siong. His fictional counterpart to know, usually comes to a sticky audience. end. But since the real Chin Peng came into the open in 1989, he has not given a full account of his career. Now, in his first major interview, he speaks for the first time about his role in the emergency. Do you now regret starting the war? I never regret. Because it was not we, CPM, who started the war. It was the British government who fired the first shot and we return or we retaliate with the second shot so the british government and its colonial its colonial policy should be responsible for all this it's turning language upside down I, he provoked the emergency by starting off by murdering a few rubber planters and other people uh, in eastern Malaya. It was they who were out to take over the country. We want to make some improvement. They want to drag back to what was in 1941, before the Japanese invasion. And he's talking absolute rubbish, quite frankly. I mean, British policy post-war was eventual independence. I don't think any time factor was involved in the early days, anyhow. So I don't see how he can think that at all. Before the war, Malaya was one of Britain's richest colonies. In 120 years, the British had developed two enormous industries rubber and tin. Both relied heavily on imported labor from China and India. By the 1930s, there were as many Chinese in British Malaya as there were Malays. But British rule was to end suddenly. In 54 days, the Japanese overran the country. In 54 days, they undid the work of more than a century. In 1942, the Japanese drove the British out of Malaya and the rest of Southeast Asia in humiliation. In Malaya, 
resistance to Japanese rule was spearheaded by the Communist Party. The Communists were used to working in secret. Before the war, they'd been banned by the British for demanding independence. But now both sides had a common interest, the defeat of Japan. The Communists organized a guerrilla army that grew to a strength of 10,000. The three stars on their caps stood for the three major races of Malaya. But the army was always predominantly Chinese. Their bases were deep in the jungle that covers most of the Malay Peninsula. And it was here that the British sent a team of officers to make contact with them. In December 1943, the two sides met to negotiate an alliance. The communists were represented by their secretary general, a shadowy figure by the name of Lai Tech. Lai Tech was accompanied by his right-hand man, 19-year-old Chin Peng. They agreed to cooperate with the British, even though their stated aim was an independent communist republic of Malaya after the war. But despite this agreement, Lai Tech set up another army. This army was to be kept secret from the British. In order to convince our people, we still have an army under our command. So he devised this secret army. And we readily accepted it. It seems a good, clever policy. The plan was that after the defeat of Japan, the secret army would try to take control of as much of Malaya as the British would allow. We didn't ask the question, but at our heart, I think we have to, uh, Eventually, we will have to fight with the forces. They will not let us occupy the town. The British dropped thousands of weapons and ammunition supplies to the guerrillas. The best of these were diverted straight to the secret army and they were never used to fight the Japanese. After the Japanese surrender, communist commanders issued instructions to their secret units to take control of the towns before the British returned. But within days, Lai Tech changed the plan. He ordered the secret army to be dissolved and their weapons buried in the jungle. The open army now cooperated fully with the victorious British. Chin Peng was among those decorated. Two months later, Lai Tech agreed to disband the rest of the anti-Japanese army, much to the dismay of the troops. We so why did Lai Tech abandon the plan to seize power in 1945? He told party members he did not believe the time was right. But the real reason may have had more to do with Litech's secret past. Someone from Special Branch brought Litech to Singapore. And from that point onwards, he had accelerated promotion within the party because Special Branch would conveniently knock off the next people above him so that in a very short time he became Secretary General of the Malayan Communist Party. When the Japanese invaded, Litech switched sides and became their agent. But what he did after the British returned is less clear, since the official files are still kept secret. One of the few historians to have had privileged access is Anthony Short. Do you believe he was controlled by Special Branch at this point? Um, I think the inference is that he was. So could that have influenced Communist Party policy? Yes, I think so. Um, there were quite a number of people in the party who wanted to resist the British return because this was a 
is the Vietnamese put it, a moment of great opportunity. Um, and I think the fact that Lai Tak is in position uh, with his reputation undiminished under the Japanese occupation, um, I think this probably had a major influence on the, on the party's decision to cooperate with the British rather than to oppose them. In 1947, Chin Peng was instrumental in exposing his former boss as a traitor to the party and later succeeded him as secretary general. As for Lai Tech, he disappeared before he could be confronted, taking with him most of the party's funds. He was never seen again, but the rumor is that he was tracked down and eliminated in Bangkok. Did you have him killed? Yes, he was liquidated in Bangkok by some people and not me, not our party, by some other people. But on your orders? Pardon? But on your orders? No. We came to know only after that. We will never know whether the rising that Lytek stopped in 1945 would have brought the communists success. But there is no doubt the next three years would see their advantage slip away from them. The post-war priority for the returning British was to restore the economy to pre-war levels. It had been virtually ruined. I mean, the, the basic prosperity of the Malay Peninsula was based on rubber and tin. During the Japanese occupation, those industries more or less came to a halt. Within two years, rubber and tin production were in full flow again. Malaya was now earning twice as many American dollars as the rest of Britain's colonies put together. The Malayan communists were by far the biggest political force in the country. But having disbanded their army, they were now campaigning legally for self-government. We thought we can force the British to make some concession. Especially when British Labour government is in power. We thought of that. You can say we have some illusion. The communists now concentrated on organizing trade unions throughout the country. Although production was higher than ever, wages were lower in real terms than in the 1930s. These conditions played into the communists' hands. There was a young trade union movement that had built up. They were very inexperienced, and they were targets for communist penetration. And the communists did penetrate the trade unions. And there was a lot of unrest on the two prime economic products of the country, rubber and tin. So it wasn't a happy situation. During 1947, there were over 300 strikes called throughout Malaya. The reaction of the authorities was at times severe. Wouldn't you say the shooting of strikers was a response to increasingly aggressive organizing of strikes by the communist trade unions? Perhaps so, but from our side, we consider the post-war period, we must have some more freedom, at least comparable to what the workers and peoples enjoy in Western Europe or in Britain. But we are denied that. As industrial unrest continued to critical levels, the communists moved towards a policy of armed violence. Exactly how they did this has been a mystery for 50 years. But according to Chin Peng, it began here, in Kuala Lumpur, with a meeting of the party's most secret organ, the Politburo, in late January 1948. Someone raised a question whether it is correct or not to pursue the peaceful tactic struggle. since there is 
after Charles has surrendered nearly three years, uh, we gain nothing. At the same time, at a rather different meeting on the other side of Kuala Lumpur, the British inaugurated a new constitution, the Federation of Malaya. We heard the booming of the artillery. That one who proposed it, uh, who, who raised the question, he said, you see, what happened now? The communists saw nothing for them in the new constitution, since it made no mention of independence. Furthermore, the constitution left over a million Malayan Chinese without rights of citizenship. It favoured Malays enormously. They were very conscious of uh, that Chinese economic prosperity might be turned into political domination. And therefore, the constitution does have quite a number of provisions which preserve the position of the Malays. In March, the Communist Central Committee met in Singapore and reached a fateful decision. According to Chin Peng, the committee believed the British were planning to ban all communist trade unions. We consider that a very serious step. Step by step, we will be driven out of the trade union and out of the political arena. Perhaps one day we will be banned. So that means we have to launch, to, to make some preparation uh, to launch our struggle if that happens. Some weeks later, the bill banning their trade unions was drafted by government officials. You must appreciate that this is very much an international issue. The Soviet Union were turning the heat on in the Far East. Communist parties in Burma, Malaya, Mao Zedong was advancing in China, taking over China, the Philippines, Indonesia. All the communist parties there were causing unrest and trouble. So, I mean, Malaya wasn't any different from that. But it wasn't just a local, local war, but it was fairly Soviet policy, basically. Did you receive any instructions from outside Malaya to launch this revolt? No. Did you receive any instructions from the Chinese Communist Party to revolt? No. What I say is that we didn't receive any order from either Moscow or Peking. But before they could start a guerrilla war, they first ordered their trade unions to adopt extreme measures. From April 1948, it was policy to kill those who opposed their strikes. Why was it okay to kill people in strikes? Because there were some, usually there were some strike breakers. Try to sabotage the strike. So, how to deal with them? Yeah. So, so that uh, if necessary, we can beat them. Probably we dare not beat them, you see. Or, kill them as a warning to other strike breakers. Actually, a uh, majority of workers were, were happy about that. They didn't say no. If workers said no, we dare not do that. They may have been too frightened to say no. I don't think so. By June, some sections of the British community wanted the government to go on the offensive. We and the police were trying to get the MCP, the Malayan Communist Party, banned. We knew who they were, we knew a lot about them, as a result, of course, of the war years. But the government wouldn't take any action. By now, 
Communists were slipping away secretly into the jungle. But the communist leadership believed they had some months yet to prepare for the coming conflict. We think British will launch a full scale attack the earliest in September. Perhaps the earliest, perhaps a bit late, perhaps much later. So before September, we have to get our nuclear force laid ready in every state. The timetable changed abruptly when armed communist guerrillas shot dead three British planters here at Songhai Seaput. My own reaction to it was then, this is something very serious. These armed terrorists had been marching down towards Sungi Seaput in the first estate they come to. Spence, the manager, was not at home. We carried on, and again, the manager was fortunate in not being around at the time. So the first estate, they found the manager, Wally Walker, sitting in his office, and they shot him from his office chair. We consider the European planters as a symbol of colonial rule. In general, they were hated by the workers. So, if they, if they want, they can kill it according to our policy, not against our policy. However, the local communist commander at Songhai Seaput claims the killing was not authorized. He says the planters had used police to disperse a recent strike. Some workers had been beaten and they called in a local communist killer squad to get revenge. Two days later, the government declared a nationwide state of emergency. Here was the all-out assault Chin Peng feared most, and three months earlier than he had expected. But shouldn't he have controlled his forces more tightly? If our policy laid down certain things that you cannot do, you cannot do, and that's forbidden, that would not be happened. Why didn't you lay that down? You can say we are inexperienced. Do you regret killing British planters now? I can say is that I'm sorry for those who were innocent. They have done nothing wrong. They have not suppressed the people or the workers. Under the new emergency powers, the British could arrest anyone they liked. They started immediately with dawn and dusk raids on the homes of political activists. Many were Malays, like Rashid Maidin. The political life of the Malayan people, especially the Malays, they rise up at that time. So the British uh, they consider this is very dangerous. So start the emergency law. British intelligence documents on the eve of the emergency stress the danger of Malays joining the revolt. The arrest of more than a thousand Malays did much to forestall that. If they were not arrested, they started their uh, struggle and joined hand with us, I think that would be a very powerful struggle. What, of course, helped us enormously was the fact that uh, Jinping's organization could never rid itself of its of being a Chinese image and not pan-racial. As the war got off to an uncertain start, both sides were guilty of reckless optimism. 
one British general claimed the job of beating the bandits, as they were termed in the early days, was the easiest task I've ever tackled. But there were others more cautious. Well, I took it seriously because I knew who they were. They weren't just rubber tappers, they were trained in guerrilla warfare. And one had to realize that one was going to be up against a first-class guerrilla-type enemy. On the communist side also, there were some who were overconfident. In withdrawing to the countryside, the communists were looking to rely on the support of around half a million people who were eking out an existence on the fringes of the jungle. They were known as the squatters. These people were mostly Chinese, but not all, uh, who had fled from the urban areas during the Japanese occupation. And uh, there was no control in those areas by any civil authority, including the police. They were therefore the obvious target for the Malayan Communist Party. The early months saw the repeated burning of villages by security forces in an attempt to smoke out the guerrillas. But if anything, this only served to increase recruitment for a time. The guerrilla army expanded quickly. Many felt their only chance lay with the communists. Most were Chinese, but there were Malays too. Reinforcements arrive at Singapore from Hong Kong as Britain promises full aid in the war against the bandits because that's what it is now, war. For many recruits, this was a new experience. You weren't allowed to wash your hands. You weren't allowed to blow cream your hair. You weren't allowed to brush your teeth. You weren't allowed to smoke. You weren't allowed to eat sweets, anything like that. Um, the grillers were like animals. They could smell you a mile off. For months, the war went badly for the British. There was continued pressure to put the country under martial law but the government remained firm. We never regarded any uh, prisoners who were caught as prisoners of war. This was a very important principle. We said, you're not prisoners of war. If you have committed acts of terrorism, you're common criminals and will be imprisoned as such. Under emergency powers, thousands of suspected sympathizers were detained. Since most were Chinese and had become ineligible for citizenship under the new constitution, they could be deported to China. In round figures, something a little over 40,000 people were deported. How was that seen by Malays? I think it's true to say they were delighted. And there has always been and an undercurrent, if that's the word, between Chinese and Malays. The British priority was to control the population. They imposed an identity card system throughout Malaya to stop the communists from moving freely among the people. The guerrillas would hit back by confiscating the cards. They sought to paralyze the country 
and destroy the economy. From the start, the war was a battle for information, and the guerrillas dealt with villagers who betrayed them without mercy. But there were stories too of atrocities, especially of members who betrayed the communists. They tied him up. They gouged out his eyes. They pulled out his teeth. Then they slit his tum tummy from top to bottom. And that was the sort of treatment that a traitor could expect. I never received a report that those who were killed by us, their body was mutilated. It was not our policy to harm the dead pe people, to, what, to mutilate them or to chop off their hands or heads. It was not our policy. If I can deny one or two cases happen, you see, maybe because government did those things to us. Maybe in some one place that they can't control their anger, they take revenge. I can't say that that, that would not happen. That maybe. Certainly the tactics used by both sides were brutal. When on patrol in deep jungle, security forces in the early years were permitted to cut off heads and hands of captured guerrillas for identification purposes. When this photograph of a Royal Marine commando appeared in the press, the government panicked. Official documents reveal the real reason for their concern. Such behavior is, under international law, a war crime. But since this was an emergency, not a war, there was nothing illegal in it. In 1950, after nearly two years of fighting, the situation was approaching stalemate. Both sides had lost around two and a half thousand people. Then the British came up with a plan that in the end would win them the war. In one sense, it was an obvious solution to all these people outside the control of the civil authorities and the police. Uh, the only thing to do was to bring them into protected areas where they could be policed. And uh, most of them were brought into what were called new villages. They were dawn raids, which were, of course, must have been dreadful shocks. These people suddenly find her surrounded by security forces and told to get out of your house and go take her somewhere else. None of these measures was uh, pleasant, but we were out to win a, a very important guerrilla war. There were strong controls, but at first there were not enough to stop those villagers determined to supply food to the guerrillas. <laughs> Reinforcements 
resettlement was well underway by 1951. Over a million people were eventually moved. The amenities provided were way beyond most villagers' dreams. Luckily for the government, another conflict, the Korean War, was creating a massive demand for Malaya's rubber and tin. The huge costs of resettling so many people were now more than offset by the growth in Malaya's economy. After three years of fighting, Chin Peng took a decision which would profoundly alter the course of the war. The communists decided their harsh tactics were losing them popular support. The new village policy was isolating them further. So to get the people on their side, they would now concentrate on their underground organization, inside the villages. British intelligence shifted accordingly. You have a terrorist in the jungle. Uh, we didn't try and get at them because their security was very, very good. I mean, you couldn't get agents into their camps and things like that. It was impossible to handle that. Therefore, their outside organizations were absolutely vital to us and to the terrorists. They supplied the food, the medicine, the money, or the general requirements of the terrorists in the jungle. So they were our number one targets. Gradually, the British forced the guerrillas more and more onto the defensive. And by 1954, the new village policy was making it very difficult indeed for guerrillas to get food. So by 1954, the communists decided they could not win the war militarily. To make things worse for them, they were now losing ground on the political front too. The largest Malay nationalist party, UMNO, had moved to a policy of demanding independence. Led by a Malay prince called Tunku Abdul Rahman, UMNO was Britain's preferred party of government. The British realized that while this struggle goes on, nobody is having the better of the say, the better of the fight. Uh, but they, in the end, perhaps they might have to give independence, so they might, ha they might as well choose the right party on whom they can trust uh, to accept independence and run the country uh, well. And that's why I think in the end the British supported us. Through an anonymous letter, Chin Peng offered peace talks and the Tunku readily agreed, much to the consternation of the British. Well, I think the chief concern was that um, our ministers, uh, Malayan ministers, were relatively inexperienced still. Uh, we felt perhaps they didn't really understand completely the communist objectives. And uh, the communists are clever people. And we didn't quite know how they would handle a bloke like Jin Peng. I was sitting in Kuala Lumpur, uh, rather afraid of what might happen. <laughs> The eyes of the world turned for a fateful two days on Baling near the Thai frontier for talks between government representatives and communist terrorist leaders. All necks crane for a glimpse of the number one terrorist. There he is, that's him. Chin Peng, director responsible for a brutal seven year campaign of murder and terrorism against the ordinary people of Malaya. Behind the scenes, the British were concerned to ensure the talks were restricted to surrender terms only. My bottom line is that we would not accept any term that implied surrender or 
or capitulation. For two days, the opposing sides talked, but made no progress. I was glad I met him because as a result of my meeting with him, he made it quite clear that he's a communist, I'm anti-communist, that the two of us can never work together. On that score, we ended our talk. At the last stage uh, of the talk, uh, Tunku said, you, you, you must realize you have to accept certain form of surrender. Then I told him, if so, we would prefer to fight to, to the end. Talks ended without resolution, and Chin Peng was led back to the jungle to continue the war. So I think I was disappointed. If during this talk we can achieve peace, it will mean all sides will suffer less. Less killing, death, less dying, and less hardship for the people. Over the next three years, the guerrillas were hit very hard by increasingly efficient security forces. Nearly half their number surrendered, but a dedicated hard core remained. Independence came in 1957, but still the communists fought on, and on, and on against the Malaysian and later even the Thai security forces, until in 1989, Chin Peng got what the British had denied him 34 years earlier, peace with honor. The communists, only around 1,200 by this time, laid down their arms and agreed to live in villages guarded by the Thai army in the border area they had made their stronghold for so many years. For many, the last few years have been their first ever taste of normality. But do they now think their decades-long jungle war achieved anything? <laughs> That is not a view shared by many in Malaysia or Britain. Nowadays, the jungle warfare of the emergency could not seem further away from the modern high-tech world of Kuala Lumpur. As for Chin Peng, he now leads a life of exile in Thailand, reflecting on the history that might have been. It stemmed the tide of communism. If the communists had got control of Malaya, where would it have ended? The mistake is that although we live in Malaya, we didn't understand the real situation in Malaya. Malaya is a small country, multiracial, multicultural background. So how to unite the people? This is a very complicated problem. Palestine was the British Empire's most dramatic failure. In the beginning, the British promised the Jewish people a home in an Arab country, a promise that led to hatred and bloodshed. Britain's undignified departure left the Palestinian people dispossessed and a Jewish state to fight for its life.
Jerusalem, 1946. The King David Hotel, British government headquarters, dominates a country of a million Arabs and half a million Jews. The Jews are determined to kick the British out and achieve the Zionist goal, a state of their own. They blow up the building. For 2,000 years, Jews worldwide have prayed, next year in Jerusalem, we shall return to Zion. Now Zionist shock troops of the Irgun Sfai Leomi take matters into their own hands. 91 die, British, Arab, and Jew. I don't accept there was any brutality in anything we did. We were fighting a war. And a war involves, of course, uh, force, and uh, it, it's not good, it's not nice. We should have preferred not to have it. But brutality as such, for the sake of brutality, I don't believe any, anybody could accuse us of that. We were hoping that Britain will help us save Palestine. Will help us save Palestine. All we wanted, we wanted to uh, Britain get out of Palestine and let us take it over and let democratic rule prevail there which recognizes the rights of everybody living in Palestine. My feeling was that we had had task to uh, try to force, uh, guide a country and its people towards a, a prosperous and a happy future. And here were one side of the equation who were using what we regarded, or what I regarded anyhow, as, as pretty unscrupulous means to uh, pressurize us through world opinion. Now. Uh, I, I imagine that uh, the Zionist cause in Palestine had a wider support in world opinion than any other colonial cause has ever had. Zionism was born in Europe in the late 19th century, a Jewish dream of freedom from persecution in the biblical land of milk and honey. But to settle in a country inhabited by Arabs, the Jews needed protection. The British were to provide it. The British Army captured the Holy Land in the First World War, driving the Turks from the Middle East. Britain had a vision of a great new imperial domain stretching from India to Egypt. The victorious powers carved new states out of the desert, appointing their rulers. The British wanted Palestine as a military base to protect the vital artery of the empire, the Suez Canal. For this, they needed international approval. The Zionists tipped the balance. The Zionists were the people who were lobbying all over the world in the Versailles Peace Conference and everywhere else to see that Britain did get this charge so that there was a contract here. Where we would help Britain become the ruling power and Britain would help us to develop the Jewish national home. إلا يهود وعرب مثل الإخوة وما في بيننا شيء اللي نعد حرابة لكن الإنجليز استعماري كان يجيب بالألوف من الهجرة من اليهود وحط في البلاد وحتى عمر وخلاهم يشتروا الأرض ويعملوا كل شيء ودخلت في الجيش عشر سنين وعارف السياسة تبحم the Jewish settlers arrived from Europe to be looked after by their own administration, the Jewish Agency. They brought with them Western ways and money to buy up land. Thousands of Palestinian peasants were evicted and in the towns many of the new jobs were for Jews only. In the 1930s, Palestinians took up arms against a colonial government that they believed was robbing them of the prospect of independence in their own country. These pictures from Pathé's own cameraman in the east show the height of the danger in Jerusalem when arson, murder and wanton destruction were making the Holy Land a land of terror. But behind the outward peace lies still the threat of rebellion and disorder. Britain still stands by. The British responded ruthlessly 
but it took them three years to crush the uprising. Palestinian leaders were exiled, their movement disarmed. Hitler's defeat in the Second World War revealed the unbelievable. Auschwitz and the annihilation by the Nazis of some 25 million people. Six million were Jews. The Holocaust was to break the back of Britain's Palestine policy. It won the Jews worldwide sympathy and the Zionists support in their demand for a Jewish state. They can smile now, these people who a few short weeks ago thought they would never smile again. Then the entire camp is torched off the face of the earth by British flamethrowers. The fires blot out the place, but not the memory. Well, I was in Auschwitz when I realized that the only solution Rather, the only hope of survival for the Jews, for us Jews, would be a, a state of our own, a country where we could live and work, a country that could protect us. Of course, I didn't really believe that I would survive Auschwitz. But should I survive, I decided I would be a very dedicated Zionist. From Britain and America, the Holocaust refugees got sympathy, but no offers of sanctuary. Undismayed, the Zionists called for them to be admitted to Palestine. They saw immigration as the key to a Jewish state, though they needed the new British Labour government to unlock the door. For Prime Minister Clement Attlee and his Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin, the request posed a dilemma. Jewish immigration to Palestine had been restricted before the war, and they were reluctant to lift the quotas. Bevin's view was that one of the reasons we had fought the war, uh, was uh, Nazi anti-Semitism. And one of the consequences of the war ought to be the possibility of Jews living uh, normal lives in Europe again. He said this in public several times. Why, uh, why now that uh, Nazism has been destroyed, uh, should the Jews not again contribute to the, to the cultural and economic life of Europe as they did before? Bevan suggested after World War II that the Jews should not worry so much about Palestine. We should help to rebuild Europe on the smoking ruins of our families. That's what he suggested. That was the humanity which was shown to us by Mr. Bevan. Of course, Ernie Bevan saw very clearly that if you were to have Palestine flooded by Jews, whatever the humanitarian reasons, this was going to cause immense trouble, not only with the Arabs of Palestine, but also with the whole Islamic world and the Arab countries, with whom he also wanted to establish a new relationship, which not, would not be the old relationship of protectorate and empire and all the rest of it. The Arab rulers of the Middle East were now seen as pillars of the empire. British oil supplies, strategic routes, bases like Palestine, and defense against communism all depended on good relations with the Arab states. But the Arab League were vocal opponents of Jewish immigration to Palestine. They feared the Zionists' intentions, as did the Palestinians. The problem is who have to suffer for the uh, Jewish immigration? Why do they insist to come only to Palestine? Why? It's a political thing. It's, uh, it's uh, far from humanitarian to be humanitarian. They had Britain to go to, they had the United States, they had all European countries. Why should we be the victimized by the victims of the Nazis? Why should they come to our country? Palestine was inhabited by Arabs. And we didn't want the Arabs to be uh, displaced or deprived of their homeland or of their right to self-determination, like the people of Lebanon, of Jordan, of Iraq, of all the rest of the Arab world. Though Palestinians still outnumbered Jews by two to one, they had no say in the government and had no influence on British public opinion. Palestinian communities in towns and villages, along with their cause, were either ignored by the Western camera 
or portrayed in biblical cliches. The traditional way of life of the Arabs was contrasted with an image of industrious and progressive Jews who'd concentrated their efforts in the fertile coastal areas. They built up a Western-style economy, drawing on powerful international support. They also had an underground army, 50,000 strong, the Haganah. By 1946, the Zionists were using all these resources to defy Britain's immigration quotas. I joined uh, the Bricha. Bricha means escape, which was a division of the Haganah, of the Jewish underground movement. And in fact, my job was to smuggle people from the uh, German border into Belgium or into France directly, or from Belgium into France. Most of the uh, DP, the displaced person camps, were in the British zone, and they wanted to stop the Jews from going to Palestine, and they realized that the Haganah was in fact taking them to Palestine. <laughs> Newsreels followed as thousands of refugees were shipped to Palestine. Most of the boats were arrested by the British Navy and escorted into Haifa. British soldiers sent the so-called illegals to detention camps. Britain was charged with inhumanity. A great many were persuaded that they should go to Palestine. And I think they're probably conned into it. Uh, in many ways, uh, because the Zionists wished to use them as instruments in securing their objectives. We felt that uh, if we had simply, out of a uh, great surge of humanitarianism, said, oh, you poor people, you'd better come in, it was going to fracture our entire policy, and we had to, well, harden our hearts a bit and turn them back, a lot of them, to Cyprus. Onto that British vessel, Zionists are transferred from a small Jewish refugee ship to be deported to Cyprus, and some try to resist. So near to Zion, and now to be taken away. Removed from their tiny craft, they leave what has been an ordeal of evil conditions, unsanitary overcrowding and thirst. But to them, internment on Cyprus is just another exile, and they have to be forced. Bevin wanted no more refugees in Palestine than the Arabs would agree to. But the Zionists demanded entry for 100,000 and had won the backing of the American president, Harry Truman. He controlled the aid that war-scarred Britain desperately needed. I remember in Bevin's absence once, I had to receive the American ambassador. And he said he had a message from the president for the Secretary of State. The president wished to repeat his urgent and earnest request to admit immediately 100,000 Jewish refugees into Palestine. And I said that, uh, according to my brief, I said that the Secretary of State's view was that this was simply a recipe for war. Well, the ambassador had uh, expected this, and he simply said, very deliberately, the fact is that the president believes that if uh, Mr. Bevin can accede to his request, that would help Britain's friends in Congress to get through the latest appropriation of British aid, which is how a diplomat says, I mean, there was bread rationing in Britain at that time, that's how a diplomat says, you do what we want uh, or you'll go hungry. And back here in Washington, domestic reflections of Palestine's days of crisis. President Truman meets with members of the Jewish war veterans, here to press demands for immediate admission of 100,000 refugees. America had the largest Jewish community in the world. For Truman, their votes were vital. Influential Zionists had regular access to the White House, and some contributed generously to Truman's campaign funds. President Truman's attitude toward Palestine uh, was made up of, a, of mixed motives. Uh, he had been deeply horrified by the full scope of the Holocaust when we got into Eastern Europe and found out what that meant. He, uh, of course, was heavily involved with Jewish people in the United States who were in support of Palestine from a political point of view. Before every election, the influence of the Zionists reached a peak. In the summer of 1946, they urged Truman to call for partition, 
to create an independent Jewish state in a divided Palestine. White House aides persuaded Truman to support the Zionists new demand. As time went on, uh, he concluded that the British were not going to solve the problem. He felt that there was substantial vacillation on the part of the British and he came to the conclusion that if there was ever to be a Jewish homeland, which he desired greatly, it would have to be accomplished through partition. Attlee and Bevin believed they were winning American support for a policy acceptable to the Arabs. The telegram from Truman telling them the opposite reached Attlee in Paris. The telegram was brought to us right in the middle of the night or early in the morning and hell before breakfast. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we read it and um, I took it to, uh, to Atle, who was having breakfast in bed. And, uh, and he, uh, he uh, read the telegram through and, um, and said, um, handed it back to me. He said, I'll send him a stinker. Go and draft it. <laughs> it made no difference to President Truman, though, whether they were upset or whether they weren't upset. He had a goal, and he uh, was determined to achieve it. In Palestine itself, the Zionists had turned to more direct methods. The campaign was led in secret by David Ben-Gurion and the leaders of the Jewish Agency, official advisers to the colonial government. Now they linked up with Menachem Begin, leader of the Irgun, and other extremists. This Irgun film helped raise money in America for secret shipments of arms. content with words alone, only thus shall we win our freedom. We have heard the speeches and tried every means. Now we fight. I and my fellow fighters in the Hebrew resistance are answering British guns with Hebrew guns. We did, of course, have an enormous amount of covered information about uh, the organization of Jewish terrorism and uh, the supply of arms, equipment, and so on, to the Jewish terrorists. The Jewish agency always denied that they were the policy makers in regard to acts of terrorism. But we knew a bit better than that. The British wanted to prove the Jewish agency's complicity in terrorism. In June 1946, troops arrested its leaders, rounded up some 3,000 people, and raided the Kibbutz Sim, the suspected arsenals of the underground army, the Haganah. Our infrastructure were the Kibbutzim. The Kibbutzim, like uh, the Kibbutz that we are just uh, now, uh, the Kibbutzim was a place where we uh, could uh, pass for just uh, civilians. We were working there for 15 days every month in order to make our living and 15 days we were trained. And in every kibbutz, we have a store, underground store for arms. One of the unit, in fact, who were searching an outhouse and toilet, uh, he had occasion, in fact, to use the toilet and uh, was quite surprised that once having pulled the chain and levered the seat in a particular direction, he started, in fact, to rise on his seat. And uh, this revealed a tunnel beneath, which led to an arms cache, which contained something in excess of 500 rifles and about 3,000 grenades. And uh, he was a very surprised man. Arms caches revealed an extensive network of military preparations. Ironically, it was the British who had first armed and trained Jewish settlers. Now, the guns were turned on their instructors, but the British were determined to keep their Palestine base. This is Jerusalem, a name in every day's headline news. Pathé takes you into this city to show you where and how the British soldier is carrying out the dirtiest, most dangerous and most thankless job in the world today. For him, Jerusalem has no glamour, no mystery and no rewards. Only hard work and constant, nerve-breaking suspense. Barbed wire, a people sullen and hostile. While Arab and Jew have a cause to battle for, the British soldier is there only because it is his job to keep the peace. That is the British Tommy's life in Palestine today. 
We salute him. Our armed forces were very, very, very strong in the Middle East. There was the base in, in, in Egypt and also a lot of troops in Palestine. Mainly used, of course, in dealing with Jewish and, and Arab uh, malcontents, but still also a military base. Uh, and so there was no question of our just, uh, just disappearing, as it were, rapidly. He was thinking in terms of, of a settlement, I think, which would have been acceptable to both Jews and Arabs, and which would have given us certain rights. Meanwhile, the Zionists pressed ahead, building new kibbutzim in strategic areas, the military foundation of a Jewish state. Their partition scheme would give them less land than they wanted, but still a stronghold in which Jews could settle freely. Faced with the overwhelming energy of the Zionists, a Palestinian leader appealed to the British. All we ask is to have the natural right of all nations, independence. We seek the setting up of a democratic government in which all genuine citizens will have the same rights and the same obligations. Although the Arab League backed the Palestinian demand, Britain rejected it. But the Arabs still relied on Britain to withstand Zionist pressure. Compared with the Zionists, they were separated by the totally different culture and procedures and politics of their countries and ours. I mean, uh, if they did make uh, some kind of submission in writing, it would be wrongly worded, the arguments would be wrong, it would be sent to the wrong person. Whereas, of course, the Zionist lobby was right in among British politics, and there were Zionists so close to the cabinet that uh, there have been instances where cabinet ministers actually telephoned the result of a cabinet meeting straight to the Zionist concern. Well, uh, the, the fact is that the Arab states had never accurately estimated nor realized the, the power of Zionism. And they thought the Zionists were just a few Jews who were in Palestine and a few Jews who we know in Iraq and around. They didn't realize the power of Zionism in the United States, nor the influence of Zionism on the United States government. At the end of 1946, Bevin went to America, knowing that many British cabinet ministers supported the Zionist plan for partition of Palestine. But in his talks with the Americans, he remained adamant that Britain would not risk antagonizing the Arabs. Bevin devised a new way out of the dilemma. Winning the cabinet over, he asked the United Nations to advise Britain on a solution. We were ambivalent on the one hand, we wanted to get out of Mr. Bevin's clutches. On the other hand, when he said, I'll put it to the United Nations, he said this in a rather threatening voice. You think I'm bad, uh, all right, I'm gonna suggest somebody who will hit you even harder and uh, you'll see, you'll get nothing out of the UN at all. Oh, we thought we, the United Nations, we were quite optimistic. We thought the United Nations would really act by the, char the spirit of the Charter. And the spirit of the Charter certainly would have protected the rights of the Palestinians, the inhabitants of the country. But, of course, uh, what happened was uh, the, the, the cart was turned over by Truman. From Palestine, first pictures of the latest bomb outrage. Jewish terrorists blow up the Goldsmith Officers Club in Jerusalem. 13 Britons were killed and 16 injured. Says Palestine Commander-in-Chief General Macmillan, the men responsible for these killings are not terrorists. They're just plain thugs and murderers. Is he still alive, General Macmillan? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, you could call us anything. <laughs> of course he accused us of being, but I could say the same about him. <laughs> Of course, I have a tremendous sympathy, as all the British people did have for the Jews, for their persecution by Hitler. But that didn't detract from the fact that to get them settled in Palestine uh, so that they did have a proper home had to be done in an orderly and constitutional manner, and not by murders. The army decided to try on the Jews some of the methods familiar to the Palestinians from their rebellion. They stepped up death sentences on terrorists and imposed martial law on Jewish communities in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. It was a collective punishment. No work, no shops, no services, and strict curfews. 
the martial law period was a much more active one from our point of view than any other period had been. We carried out 63 operations in the 16 days of martial law because we had, we had prepared, we had, as I said, we, we planned it in a sense. We, we provoked it. And uh, I remember the uh, general in charge of the operation had a press conference every morning in the hotel and he said, we've got them bottled up. You can see they're, they're surrounded on three sides on land and sea. You can see our boats patrolling the, the coast. And uh, this went on for 16 days and then martial law just collapsed. Our hands were very considerably tied. Um, had the army been allowed, in fact, to act as an army, uh, I feel we could have contained particular situations. It just got out of hand to us being, frankly, too gentlemanly. We had to be seen to be acting in the right way. 4,000 miles away at the United Nations, the Zionists were winning support contrary to British forecasts. In June 1947, a special committee, known as UNSCOP, was sent on a fact-finding tour. To the Arabs, this was yet another inquiry dominated by America, which had no right to pronounce on their future. Palestinian leaders boycotted its hearings. In contrast, the Jewish agency set out to impress. We appointed uh, two liaison officers, uh, Horowitz, who was later our leading economist and banker, and myself, to accompany the commission and, as it were, illuminate the whole Zionist picture from their point of view. And therefore, it was part of my job to see that they learnt as much about our point of view as possible. The Zionist lesson was driven home by the legendary Exodus affair. It proved a powerful publicity coup. With a cargo of four and a half thousand refugees, the Exodus is the largest ship ever to attempt to run the watchful British naval blockade. After a bloody battle with a British boarding party, the refugees disembark at Haifa. Some are dying. Twenty others are in a serious condition. And as the tired and weary refugees are transferred to British prison ships, two members of the United Nations Committee on Palestine silently look on. They actually went on board, some members of the UN Commission, and they saw the hose pipes and the tear gas being turned on these very wretched looking people who had escaped from concentration camps in Germany. It was apparently such a squalid spectacle that the first thing that the UNSCOP decided was not partition or against partition, but the mandate has to end. With the tide running against him, Bevin decided to make an example of the Exodus refugees. He sent them back where they had come from, to Germany and the refugee camps. For Bevin, it was a propaganda disaster. But Britain was in a tough mood. In Palestine, they hanged three more Irgun terrorists. Menachem Begin hit back. The Irgun kidnapped and hanged two British sergeants. They left their bodies booby-trapped for when the British found them. All decent people must have been horrified by the murder by Jewish terrorists of the two British sergeants, Mervyn Pace and Clifford Martin. Until the appalling situation in Palestine is cleared up, unspeakable outrages may well continue. With the burial of the sergeants went British hopes for a future in Palestine. Parliament and the public demanded the withdrawal of British troops. I'm speaking on behalf of my mother, Mrs. Martin, who is broken-hearted and prostrate at the terrible news of the loss of her son. And let us hope that we can find a solution to this terrible problem in Palestine and bring an end to all this unnecessary murdering of young British innocent servicemen. Obviously, it was becoming increasingly difficult for the, for, for the armed forces to maintain law and order, especially at that time, uh, it was the Jews, I mean, who were obviously producing an extremely effective uh, underground movement. And uh, Bevin would have liked to, to deal with it, but, uh, but it wasn't possible. We were under very strong political pressure. Um, 
from the Foreign Office because uh, they were looking at the wider national relations, for example, with the United States and also with the Arab world, and they were doing a careful balancing act, which often amounts to, uh, well, anything you do will be difficult and dangerous, so let's do very little. By the autumn of 1947, the cabinet had to make a decision. Economic crisis had forced Attlee once again to go cap in hand to America. The UN Special Committee had recommended that the British should go, leaving Palestine partitioned into a Jewish and an Arab state. Bevin said partition would mean war, and warned the UN that Britain would have no part in it. But at the General Assembly in November, the Zionists and the Americans used strong-arm tactics to win votes. We were working very hard under the direct personal instruction of President Truman to uh, get a successful vote on that. We uh, used uh, all the persuasion we could with delegates in New York. We went to many capitals bilaterally to try to get their governments to be sure that they had the instructions to work with us on this matter. So in the meantime, pressure was brought on the states, on the capitals and uh, telephones from the Zionists and from Truman uh, to the capitals, to heads of states, commands came to the members to change their vote. And some of them, like Romulo, had to run away because he was threatened by the Zionists. Haiti, uh, Haiti's representative began to cry when he was forced to change his vote. Belt of Cuba resigned as a messenger to Washington and to the United States, resigned rather than vote for partition. So Cuba appointed somebody else to, to vote for partition. The cleanliness of the case was, 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 was destroyed. It was no more a clean business. Uh, you are British, you appreciate sportsmanship and being a clean game. It was no more a clean game. And I said that in the United Nations in 1947. I said the United Nations General Assembly has no jurisdiction and no right to partition a country against the wishes of the inhabitants. The vote to partition Palestine would in the event mean war, for the Palestinians to defend their country, for the Jews to win a state. The Jewish people at once began to celebrate the United Nations decision. If they hadn't got all they wanted, they had at least gained the verdict for the setting up of a new Jewish state and their rejoicing was obviously a spontaneous affair. Two days later, this was the typical scene. Arabs advancing on the center of Jerusalem at the beginning of a three-day strike and an orgy of wrecking, looting, and bloodshed. As Jews retaliated and the chaos spread, so began the most extraordinary six months of British colonial rule anywhere. Britain announced it would quit in its own good time. Meanwhile, the British would do nothing but protect their own backs while the slow process of evacuation began. They would not maintain law and order, nor would they implement the United Nations plan to set up a Jewish and an Arab state, nor would they let in the UN officials to do so themselves. For Bevin, this was the only honorable course. We said, all right, the United Nations has a plan. We're not going to oppose it, but we don't think it'll work. There'll be too, it'll cause too much trouble with Arabs and Jews, and we are not going to take responsibility of, of executing it. If we try to impose partition, we would at once alienate the Arabs and probably start a war with them. The Arabs would then uh, possibly gravitate uh, to be friends with the, with the Russians, and we would be involved in, in a futile war fighting Arabs who are our friends on behalf of Jews who, you could hardly say, were our friends at the time. At the United Nations, the colonial secretary brushed aside the protests. British public opinion will permit no more expenditure of life and treasure. It will acquiesce no longer in the use of British forces and the squandering of British lives to impose a policy in Palestine which one or other of the parties is determined to resist. We had a feeling at that time that I would say to give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't care damn what's going to happen and if the Arabs will 
conquer the Arab Legion, all right, let them. That not, doesn't interfere at all, the British administration. Never interferes in that. It's not their business. It's finished. You Jews and Arabs, deal with yourselves. Do what you want. In the growing anarchy, the UN partition plan didn't stand a chance. The proposed Jewish state would contain hundreds of thousands of Arabs. The area allocated to the Palestinians was claimed by many Zionists as theirs by right. Both sides claimed Jerusalem as their sacred city and rejected the plan to make it international. In the vacuum created by the British, the issue was to be settled by the gun. Jewish forces were well prepared. They now trained openly for war. They'd set up a government for Jewish areas. The commanders saw no reason to keep within the UN boundaries. The Arabs, after all, had rejected them first. They made their major mistake. Uh, if they would have accepted at that time uh, the resolution, the Jewish state would have been perhaps as based on the United Nations resolution based on the partition. Once they broke the rules of the game, then there was no game. We were fighting to, to live. We were fighting to stay in our houses. We know that uh, the Zionist aims is to shift us all, to exert us all from all Palestine. We want to, to stay in our homes. Therefore, we fight for our children, for our land. No one was well trained. The Jews were well trained because they knew what they were planning for. But we did not know what we were planning for because of our uh, beloved leaders at that time. The Palestinian leaders had been in exile and military activity suppressed. Now, villages and groups of irregulars began training themselves, acquiring weapons where they could. The best way to, to prevent the uh, Zionists from attacking our villages is to try to cut their uh, uh, communications. Therefore, we attacked the convoys, and believe me, all the convoys we attacked were in armed cars, armored cars, buses and trucks, and they were all armored cars from the steel the British uh, troops provided for the Jews. It was the convoys supplying the Jews in Jerusalem that the Palestinians hit the hardest. There were many casualties. The wrecks have since been made into monuments. We blame the British for not keeping law and order that was their role until the final evacuation of Palestine, and especially keeping alive the road to Jerusalem, keeping free the road to Jerusalem. On the other side, they were really blessed not to intervene. And we were happy about that because it let us uh, rather overcome the Arabs and do whatever we wanted in order to help Jerusalem to survive. With the British keeping their distance, the Haganah defeated the Palestinian irregulars here at El Castel, dominating the Jerusalem road. It was part of a military offensive to secure the Jewish state. Gaining territory, preferably without its Arab inhabitants, was a welcome byproduct for the Jewish agency. For the Irgun, with whom they had an alliance, it was the main aim. We had a plan that while we couldn't force the Jewish agency to go back on its agreement to the partition scheme, we as dissidents, and we didn't mind what they called us, thugs or terrorists or whatever, uh, would go beyond these boundaries, win the battles as we hoped, and then hand over the territory as such to the Haganah to look after. Jerusalem was one area in which there was a cooperation between the Irgun and the Haganah, and uh, the commander of Jerusalem was giving latitude that according to the interest and according to his forces to cooperate with the Irgun.
On the night of April the 10th, 1948, Irgun soldiers surrounded the sleeping village of Deir Yassin near Jerusalem. What happened that night still fills Arabs with horror and a growing number of Jews with shame. Taken back to the scene after 35 years, the villagers remember. <laughs> The Haganah admitted that some 250 people had been massacred at Deir Yassin. The British did not intervene. As far as I'm concerned, uh, it, uh, it did not uh, come within the province of uh, uh, any of the conditions of which I laid down. It, 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 but it was such a horrific thing that we felt that something ought to be done. In the event, the British did nothing. The Haganah told Macmillan they were in charge of the village. For him, that was good enough. So the priority then was to save British lives, but not Arab lives. That's right. That's right. As news of the massacre at Deir Yassin spread, the Palestinians began to flee in panic, some at gunpoint. Jewish forces stepped up their attacks on Arab villages and towns. In many cases, they found themselves caught between, let's say, the devil and the deep blue sea, if you like. Uh, since we blew up the installations or the houses within the villages, maybe they were terrorized by the terrorists, maybe they were not. I don't know. Then if they were afraid, and in some cases, in quite a number of them, they left the villages. The Arabs were uprooted from their country by Jewish violence, or Zionist violence, you might like to call it. They didn't leave voluntarily. And uh, if they had left voluntarily, they should have permitted them to go back. It was a plan to panic the Arabs and force them to leave the country. That's how they left. In the end, more than three quarters of a million Palestinians were dispossessed, driven from their homes by force or fear. Most found shelter in makeshift camps, which later became their permanent homes. Hundreds of villages, even towns, were to be left deserted. Under the noses of the British, the Zionists expanded their territory across three quarters of Palestine. In desperation, the Palestinians looked to their neighbors. The Arab states had promised to defend Palestine. But whether for the Palestinians or for themselves had never been clear. We decided to set up a shadow government for the whole of Palestine. So when the British withdraw, it will take over the country. We couldn't do it by ourselves. We had to go obtain Arab support. The Arab states did not see our point of view due to American and British influence. The Arab armies were equipped by Britain. In an attempt to avert war, Bevin set up a deal with Abdullah, King of Jordan. When the British left Palestine, Abdullah's Arab legion, under its British officers, could annex the Arab part, provided the Arab armies kept out of the Jewish part. The Zionist leaders were tipped off. On one occasion, I was in the delegates lounge of the United Nations, talking with Colonial Minister Creech Jones and Mr. Charette of the Zionist group. 
just the three of us, and at one point, Mr. Creech Jones turned to Charette and said, we know you're going to have your Arab state in Palestine, your Jewish state in Palestine. Of course, the uh, Arab Legion would move, but it will move only into those areas assigned to the Arabs under the petition arrangement. Well, Charette, of course, took that as a statement of the greatest possible importance because the Arab Legion was the only effectively organized force in the Arab world, and it was under British command. Despite the secret maneuvers of the British, their imminent departure now threatened to unleash war. Volunteers flocked to join the Arab armies as they gathered on the borders of Palestine. But their vast numbers gave a false impression. We never had an army to fight with. Why did we get in with this war? We had simply, the British, the British didn't let us have an army. They let us have a few soldiers for receptions and for uh, protocol and uh, for drums and music, not for guns. So uh, Britain is responsible for the weakness of the Arabs, but the Arabs themselves are to be blamed for lack of knowledge, lack of preparation, lack of unity. That's my, my view. We were not going to help either side. I mean, we, 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 were, we were, I think there, there became perhaps a bit later this agreement with the Americans that they would not arm the new state of Israel in return for which we would stop our, our sending of arms to Arab countries. On the 12th of May, 48, and I was still uh, much younger than I am now, I was the head of the operations, I was summoned suddenly by Ben Gurion to a, an emergency meeting of the temporary government of Israel. It was on a Wednesday, and uh, about 10 of the 13 members were sitting there, and Ben Gurion said to me, we are about to decide to declare the state of Israel the moment the British will quit on the 15th. But members here would like to know from you, objectively as you can, without any expressing your own feelings whether a state should be declared or not. What are the chances of us defending this future state if the British will leave and the Arabs will invade the country? I must say that this was the most difficult answer I ever had to give. And the gist of the answer was that I said that it is 50-50. Uh, my feeling, and most of our feeling, was this. The Arabs were going to fight us whether we established a state or not. Therefore, why not establish it? Let them fight against us as a state and not fight against us as an anonymous community. On May the 14th, 1948, the British High Commissioner took leave of Jerusalem for the last time. There was no United Nations authority to take his place. No one turned out to cheer or even boo as he left by the back streets for Haifa. The next day, David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the State of Israel. Its gates would be open to the 100,000 and more, as long as they were Jewish. The British said that it was their duty, because of their common and dual uh, duty to protect both the Jewish and Arabs, to behave the way they did. We didn't think so, but the Arabs didn't think so either. Did they have a grudge against the British? They did, and they still have it. We, we believe sincerely that the cause of our plight and the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine is the British. We have been forced into this policy which we would not have chosen ourselves. But the policies we had wanted to follow had not been acceptable to other people, so we had washed our hands of it. Palestine, the peaceful land the British took over, they turned into a battlefield. Their departure evoked worldwide contempt. The war that began as they left has not yet ended. The hardback book End of Empire is available at all bookstores, including the ABC shop in your capital city. In a few moments, ABC News, then our simulcast of The Requiem by Verdi.
November 1953, a courtroom in Tehran. Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, the man who put an end to British domination in Iran, is tried for treason. He is there because Britain and the United States have stage managed a coup d'etat to overthrow his government. Well, our policy was to get rid of Mossadegh as soon as possible. We didn't think he'd do any good to Iran. In the two years that he was there, that was not, it was too long for our thinking, he did nothing for Iran. And don't forget that he opposed the British Empire before any, any other country in the Middle East had uh, risen against the British Empire. And he was called the man who broke the back of the British Empire and threw the British out of the country. Persia entered the 20th century in turmoil and decline. The former glories of its despotic rulers, the Shahs, had become an empty shell. Real power rested with two rival empires, to the north, the Russians, and to the south, the British in India, for whom Persia was a buffer state. Never formally part of the British Empire, Iran was more completely governed by British imperial priorities than were most colonies. The Iranians had somehow got it into their heads, perhaps for historical reasons, that they were not really running their own affairs, <clears throat> that whatever happened in Iran was done by somebody else, and they always thought that it was either done or not done by the British. Uh, erroneously, but one can see how they came to that uh, way of thinking. Il y avait beaucoup d'anecdotes qu'on faisait sur les Anglais. On disait que s'il y a le, la pluie, c'est parce que les Anglais l'ont voulu. S'il y a le, tel type comme premier ministre, les Anglais l'ont nommé. Même dans les différentes villes de l'Iran, s'il passait quelque chose, même s'il y avait un crime, on croyait que c'est les intrigues, les intrigues des Anglais derrière cette, ce, ce crime. In the Second World War, British troops, now allied with the Soviets, occupied Iran to run it for their wartime needs. They deposed the Shah, a dictator who had turned towards Hitler, and put on the peacock throne his 21-year-old son, Mohammad Reza Shah. When the war ended and Allied troops withdrew, Iranians demanded democratic reforms and sovereign control of their own country. In the vanguard was veteran Democrat, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh, I don't think that there has been in the last 50 years any, anybody more prestigious than Mossadegh in the history of the country. Why? For one thing, Mossadegh was incorruptible. The second thing was, he was against the power, always stood up to the power. And this started back in 1921, when he went against the coup d'etat government, and he almost lost his life. He was imprisoned, he was banished, then he was for some years in his house. And when, as soon as the Shah left and there was a free election, he was the first member of the, elected from Tehran. Iranian resentment at foreign domination focused on the country's greatest asset, oil. In 1909, a British company had obtained the monopoly for the extraction of oil from the fields of southern Iran. The oil was pumped to a refinery at Abadan. Here, the new black gold was boiled, barreled, and shipped away in the company's tankers. For Britain, the oil find came at the right time. With World War I approaching, 
Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, persuaded the government to buy a controlling share in Persian oil, so that the navy, newly converted to oil, could have secure supplies. Oil soon became the driving force of the industrialized world, filling not only petrol tanks, but the coffers of the company and the British Treasury itself. Cheap oil from Iran helped put Britain on four wheels. OK, Jim, cut a ride up, boy. It was certainly nice to be able to say that again, and tens of thousands of British motorists took full advantage of the opportunity. Roads out of London, as in the case of other centres, were mostly as crowded as in the good old days before petrol rationing began ten years ago. By 1950, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company was Britain's most profitable overseas investment. The dollar earnings of the refinery at Abadan were vital to keep the home economy afloat. For the British staff in charge in this sweltering climate, Abadan meant a truly colonial lifestyle. I'd just been married, so um, it was the first year of my marriage. And I was married to Eric, who was the um, general manager. So we had a very beautiful house, and we did an enormous amount of entertaining. In fact, the first year of our married life, I didn't think we ever sat down to a meal on our own except breakfast. And we always had that in our veranda. I think most people had servants. Again, I think there were points allotted to your husband. Uh, the size of your bungalow, and how many coolers you had, and how many servants you had. The 70,000 Iranians employed by the company lived less well. Wages and welfare provisions were minimal. Conditions at Abadan were increasingly condemned. The company was accused of breaking its undertakings to the workforce. The immense majority vivaient dans ce que nous appelons en France des bidonvilles. Euh, alors, les conditions d'existence de ces ouvriers étaient absolument incroyables. Et surtout, on savait que l'Angleterre, c'est-à-dire la compagnie, gagnait de l'argent énormément. You had two groups. You had the Europeans who had everything and the Persians who had nothing. The Persians could not ride the same bus which the Europeans used it at the time, or enter any clubs, or any housing, or any facilities. And this made them more angry than anything else. There was a wider feeling, perhaps, uh, that uh, uh, the oil company uh, interfered in uh, internal Iranian uh, political affairs, and that it had a wide network of uh, political connections uh, within the country itself. Iranians complained that Britain took nine times more revenue from the oil than Iran did. The mass of Iranians lived in grinding poverty. In the towns, there was a movement for change. The Iranian parliament, the Majlis, became the platform for a campaign to nationalize the oil company. For its leader, Mossadegh, this was the way to regain Iran's independence, a battle he had fought for 30 years. Now his moment had come. In April 1951, he became prime minister, but the British failed to take him seriously. He uh, appeared as a demagogue, not necessarily, it appeared to us at the time, in charge himself, but possibly being used by others. Uh, his uh, way of living and uh, general appearance didn't strike one as being the sort of uh, person you'd think of as a prime minister. And I don't mean them because he didn't wear striped trousers. In fact, he always wore pyjamas. And that was a rather odd um, figure for a future prime minister to cut. At no time before a year or two, before 1951, did anyone contemplate that we would ever not stay there forever. We were there by an international agreement uh, between the government of Iran and the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. So there was no reason it should ever come to an end, as far as we could see. 
Tehran. Angry crowds surge through the capital of Iran, currently the world's number one danger zone. John Bull and Uncle Sam, too, are savagely caricatured. Extreme nationalists demand immediate seizure by their government of the half-billion-dollar Anglo-Iranian oil company. Focal point of Iranian unrest, however, is the government. Its cabinet headed by 70-year-old Premier Mohammad Mossadegh, whose single purpose is oil nationalization. He was a great actor, but he was a marvelous uh, politician, and at that time he had all the people with him. Everywhere you went, they would say, Zendiba, Dr. Mossadegh. Zendiba, Dr. Mohammed Mossadegh. Nahost Vaziri Mahbub Iran, which means long live Dr. Mossadegh, the beloved Prime Minister of Iran. And they didn't care much what he did. He clobbered the imperialists. He nationalized the oil company. Iran was a country again. It was great stuff. It was very moving. Uh, we would call him Dotty in some respects. But he wasn't in Persian eyes, and some of the very moderate Persian parliament, uh, parliamentarians would weep in the Majlis when he spoke, even though they knew perfectly well that it was ruinous for their country and uh, impractical. The theme of propaganda of Mossadegh, his uh, partisans, was changing the face of the world, at least the world Muslim, by changing our rapport with the English. En mettant fin à la domination anglaise, nous arrivons à changer le visage, non seulement de notre pays, mais de, de l'ensemble. The atmosphere was uh, one of uh, complete joy, particularly as if it looked as if uh, there was really no conflict, no opposition within the country, as if the whole country had rallied and found the leader who was going to lead the country uh, towards better times. That was the atmosphere, the press, the newspapers, the radio, the uh, parliament, uh, they all uh, appeared to be united in these events. As the nationalization law went through, demonstrators tore down the company's nameplates. The British protested, and even sabotaged machinery as Mossadegh sent his men to Abadan to take over the refinery. The reception was extraordinary because there was a feeling that uh, now all the defects of the old regime which were in a word discrimination against iranians all those defects would be removed because all the administration of the of the industry would be in the hands of iranians so they had a wonderful reception on arrival there was no question of violent resistance but extraordinary how pieces of plant would go wrong uh, just when they were supposed to be doing something else you know and they soon realized that we weren't being very uh, helpful, really, and we weren't handing over files. We weren't handing over accounts, which they asked us for. I said I had no authority to hand them British companies' accounts unless I was told from London. Back in London, the Labour Foreign Secretary, Herbert Morrison, was devoting his time to the Festival of Britain, designed to boost national morale. But Labour's plans for welfare at home depended on profits from abroad. Morrison was determined to resist Iran's blow beneath the imperial belt. With the press right behind him, he denounced the Iranian act as illegal. To add weight to his words, the government sent the destroyer Mauritius to Abadan. London, where directors of the Anglo-Iranian oil company met to discuss the latest news from the Persian oil fields. The man bringing home the news was Mr. Drake, the company's general manager in Abadan. Later, Mr. Drake, at Mr. Attlee's invitation, went to number 10 to place before the cabinet a first-hand account of the present Persian drama. And I was wheeled into this cabinet meeting, where I understand the entire cabinet, except the minister responsible for oil, I don't know who he was now, uh, and the three chiefs of staff in uniform were all uh, seated round a table, the Prime Minister bid me take a seat on his right, between him and Mr. Morrison, the Foreign Secretary. And I pleaded uh, that we should not allow the biggest foreign asset in Britain to go without doing something about it. I didn't say particularly what was to be done. I had in my own mind that at least we should make a struggle for it. I thought it was a completely unilateral act. And I said that if we don't do anything about this, 
Within five years, we shall lose the Suez Canal on the same principle, which in fact proved to be exactly right almost to the day. The Labour government dispatched paratroops to the Mediterranean to stand by for an invasion of Abadan. This rang alarm bells in America. President Harry Truman was amazed at what he saw as trigger-happy irresponsibility. We had perhaps a different concept of the priorities involved. Our main desire was to be sure that Iran was saved for the free world. The illegal Communist Party of some 15,000 members conceivably could have taken over and ride the Soviets in. We, we thought that this should take precedence, saving Iran, ahead of commercial considerations. The Americans thought the British attitude to the Mossadegh government was short-sighted. Mossadegh might not be ideal, but he might prove a useful ally against the Russians. He was expecting the Americans to help Iran by giving Iran necessary you know, equipment, uh, experts, and allow Iran to export its oil, including to American, um, uh, American purchases. And he thought that America would come to Iran's help because, you know, Americans had expressed sympathy on several occasions with nationalist movements in Iran. And also Henry Grady, who was the ambassador, American ambassador in Tehran, had uh, helped Mossadegh uh, personally and officially a great deal. I think the Americans had uh, been largely responsible for the early incitement almost to the Persians to uh, exchange this 100% British uh, ownership. I have to say that. The American ambassador was very thick with Mossadegh. The American ambassador in Tehran, Mr. Grady, recently paid a call on the Prime Minister to convey a letter from President Truman. It was a message urging Persia to negotiate with the British. Dr. Mossadegh, whose health is apparently not too good, transacts much of his business from his bed, and so it was on this occasion. A strange scene indeed, yet it would be hard to exaggerate the importance of the message or the problem to be solved. Since then, President Truman has sent Mr. Harriman to Persia to use his good offices in the dispute. I was afraid the British might bring in violence. Uh, they had a very strong feeling that a, they had a contract there. They were very literal in their consideration of the matter. There were contracts being changed, concessions on oil all over the world, and the British didn't give any consideration of that, which they should have. It was our asset and not theirs. It's very easy to be generous with somebody else's assets. Uh, they felt that uh, popular opinion in Iran needed to be uh, satisfied. Uh, they were at some distance from the direct economic and financial consequences of what they, uh, what might be demanded. And so it was easier for them to have bright new ideas. It was for us to think of the consequences of them. They were very uh, arbitrary with the Iranians. They didn't show them the books. Uh, they paid them a very low royalty and uh, didn't give them any idea of what they were entitled to. They also imported Indian labor and the uh, Iranians were unemployed and that made them annoyed. Pressed by Truman's special envoy, the British reluctantly agreed to send a negotiator, Labour Minister Richard Stokes. Mossadegh used to come occasionally uh, in the evenings and have meals with us. We were out of doors with caviar and servants, and um, we used to enjoy that. But most days, either Stokes and I would go and call on him. He lived in a very plain little villa, and uh, there he was, always beautifully dressed, uh, standing at the top of these stairs on his cane, receiving us. He was always very charming to me as a younger man, made a point of that. And uh, we never saw him, you know, this reputation he had of uh, appearing in grey pyjamas, bed as the sick man and so on. Never once seen that. Mossadegh said, well, you know what we want. We want to manage our own industry. And, but uh, we are perfectly willing to employ, to keep your employees. We are perfectly willing to have uh, an arrangement with you by which you will have all the oil that you need. But uh, we cannot have you as a concessionaire. They could never understand the whole problem of selling oil. We tried for, was it a fortnight? Must have been. To try and teach them, educate them, if you like, to the tanker problem. You, if you, it's no good expropriating oil if you can't 
sell it. You can't eat it. And all the tankers were owned by AOC. All the marketing arrangements, highly complex, were in their hands. Uh, all part of an international complex of marketing and uh, price adjustments and so on. And they could never understand it. I mean, most of the day, it was like, I mean, it was literally talking a dialogue of the deaf. Mossadegh believed that either Iran and the Iranians have to develop their oil or the oil can wait until there are enough Ir Iranians to develop it. He told me once that under no circumstances I am going to sign a treaty or an agreement with any foreigner which in any way compromises the so sovereignty of my country. Sixty thousand persons depend on the company for their living. If Abadan closes, there is no work for them. And Abadan must close if Persia holds up shipment of oil. A great organization will close down and ruin will come to Persia unless obstinacy gives place to reason. Newsreels reflected British interests. The loss of Abadan would mean losing not just cheap oil and profits, but putting at risk an international cartel in which the major oil companies controlled the market and fixed the price. With negotiations deadlocked, the company, still in control, shut down the refinery. Britain's tactic was confrontation. I think it was quite natural that the government should mobilize a force. British subjects, many of them, were there in Abadan, and it was useful to have a force there in case they had to be evacuated speedily. There was no doubt the hope also, not shared by everybody, but by some, that a show of force of that kind might bring um, sanity to what we thought was a situation which lacked it. Well, our view that this would have been a disaster, uh, and we told the British so in the strongest terms, to send a force in to re-establish an oil concession that you haven't been able to negotiate is just not done in, in the modern era, and we had reached that time. Uh, we told the British not to, because we never thought they would. We always thought Morrison was bluffing, and he was. He, he made the show that he was going to do it if the technicians were removed, but when they were removed, nothing happened. They left quietly. Right up to the last moment, Bosadek did not want the British employees to leave, and he did everything in his power um, to keep them by assuring to them that they would receive the same treatment, if not better, as far as salaries were concerned, accommodation was concerned, all the conditions of employment. He wanted to keep them quite sincerely, and he kept on saying to the British, let us keep your employees as our employees. They said no. The last 300 British technicians are evacuated a day before the deadline set by the Iranian government. During the early days of the deadlock, British naval and paratroop forces were alerted in Iranian waters, but today the cruiser Mauritius serves as an evacuation vessel for the men who remained until the last minute during the bitter dispute. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Mossadegh was on his way to the United Nations in New York. The British, unable to use force, had complained that his nationalization endangered world peace. Mossadegh rejected the charge. C'est en vain que nous avons cherché ailleurs que dans des paroles, des preuves que le royaume. And his object was to, I think, to uh, cause a split between us and the Americans and play on this Persian patriot, uh, sick man, and so on. And I think he rather made rings round us. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, we came out best there. Not true, the Americans weren't taken in. They found him slightly ludicrous, but rather fascinating. He had a great impact on America because, don't forget, that the Americans, many, most of the Americans are anti-imperialism. And they like to talk to a man who has charisma. And Mossadegh had that charisma. He was an actor in, in politics. He, is, he had his own convictions. Yet in politics, he was an actor. The Americans still hoped they could bring Mossadegh round to a compromise with their allies, the British. Even the president lent his weight to the cause. There was no deal, but Mossadegh kept smiling. I profit of these last hours of my sojourn in the United States 
pour exprimer mes sincères remerciements envers la nation américaine qui m'a montré ses meilleurs sentiments ainsi qu'à ma, euh, qu ma collègue, qu'à mes collègues. Il faut changer. Mossadegh's enthusiastic reception in America only added to British anger. On his way home, he stopped in Egypt. Here, he received a hero's welcome from a nation equally determined to be rid of the British. But the British government was by no means reconciled to Mossadegh's triumph. They had a plan for revenge. At the end of 1951, Iran and its rich oil fields had never seemed so inhospitable to the British. The refinery at Abadan was in Iranian hands, and the Anglo-Iranian oil company had been banished. But the British had no intention of letting Iran sell what they saw as stolen oil. They imposed a total embargo. Anyone who bought oil from Abadan also bought a lawsuit from Britain. We were not prepared to see if we could possibly help it, Iran get away with an arbitrary act of nationalization without compensation and be able to sell oil. We wanted to show the world that they, you, you, they couldn't behave in this way. The embargo was part of a British plan to unseat Mossadegh and his government. Britain froze Iran's funds and cut off trade links. Mossadegh was dismissed as incompetent. We um, didn't think that there was any virtue in rewarding Mossadegh by giving him money. If you had rewarded him in that way, you'd have been perpetuating in power someone who was incapable of bringing any sort, form of stability or prosperity to Persia. For the reasons I've given, he could not govern. And the sooner then uh, that he left power, uh, the better for Persia. Not not for us, for Persia. Behind the garden parties and the formalities, the British embassy in Tehran became the center of operations. Secret servicemen from MI6 were already installed. They aimed to bolster the opposition to Mossadegh in royalist circles and so strengthen the Shah's hand against his prime minister. Their most important Iranian agents were a family of wealthy merchants, the Rashidians, well known as friends of the British. Communications were maintained through embassy official Sam Fall. I started seeing the Rashidian brothers in March 1952 and this was a policy of our government and of the embassy in order to have a contingency plan in case the uh, negotiations didn't succeed. We were paying them a small amount of money. I don't know because I wasn't involved myself, but this was for passing a, a few demands to a likely lad paying the crowds. You can't do anything in Iran or anywhere else without money. The Rashidians, I believe, were the British net that was most totally controlled by the uh, MI6. These were true agents in the sense that they worked for the British government and knew they did. What made them very distinctive was that it was important for their type of operation that everyone in Iran would know this. Uh, therefore, when somebody wanted to run for parliament and wanted British help, uh, either straight help or financial help, everyone knew exactly where to go. Deputies expected to be bribed, I should think, some of them, but they were certainly uh, helped to come to the right decision. Pray silence for the right honorable Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister. The new Conservative government endorsed all the policies of their Labour predecessors, and more. Results cannot be achieved by a, a wave of the wand. Yeah. Time is needed for a new administration to grasp and measure the facts which surround us in baffling and menacing array. They cast around for a candidate prepared to take Mossadegh's place and settle the oil dispute on Britain's terms. There are a lot more remedies coming. Yes. The question was whether we could overturn the Mossadegh government. 
Um, I'd had a, a long association with Iran because of my father's connection with the country. And um, Iranians who were opposed to Mossadegh uh, kept on getting in touch with me. And um, one of these was their greatest elder statesman, Gavam Sultani. He was a very wily politician and an operator, and far more likely to um, manipulate the various parties in the Majlis and get a majority. He was a very, very professional, wily, um, and I don't say devious, but uh, elastic politician. And he was most likely to get a majority together. He got in touch with me several times and said he was prepared to do something about it if only the British government would give him their blessing. When he came and talked to me here about it, but um, the Labour government and even the Churchill government were a bit slow at first. The opportunity came in July 1952. Mossadegh unexpectedly resigned after crossing swords with the Shah over his powers as Prime Minister. Encouraged by the British, the Shah appointed Kavam. Tehran became paralyzed by mass protests demanding Mossadegh's return. The Shah and Kavam sent in the army. I was taken uh, out uh, by my brother uh, to the uh, area where the uh, main demonstrations were taking place. And uh, you could see uh, the running battle that was going on. Uh, between the people and the police and uh, the soldiers and uh, even tanks, uh, which I myself saw from a uh, third distance, uh, and saw in fact one of them uh, shooting, one of the machine guns of the tanks shooting. And uh, the people were extremely determined uh, and uh, extremely angry. And each time they were being driven back into the little alleys, uh, they would surge back and try to uh, fight against soldiers and the policemen with the stones and cobbles that, were, that they were picking from the street. Some uh, uh, soldiers and officers uh, went over to the crowd and uh, decided not to shoot and were carried on the shoulders of uh, the demonstrators. Uh, and this was widely publicized and uh, celebrated. The shooting had left 45 dead and hundreds injured. But with the army's loyalty in doubt, the Shah and Kavam had to accept defeat. Mossadegh returned to office, promising a shake-up in Iran's corrupt and pro-British establishment. The popular reaction to the resignation of Mossadegh in Tehran was such that Kavam couldn't continue. This was a real setback. I think at the same time, the military takeover in Egypt was taking place, was it not? It was a bad, a bad week. The Kavam setback drove Britain to yet more devious means. Meanwhile, they continued talks on the oil dispute, knowing their demands were unacceptable to Mossadegh. We'd been um, sitting together at his bedside, our bedside, for hours, and getting very heated about it all. And suddenly he rings a little bell, and in comes... Um, a servant with a great plate of sweetmeats. And he said, now to send the cameraman in. And I said, look, we're in the middle of a discussion, Prime Minister, is this the moment, really, for sweetmeats and photographers? He said, yes. Because sweetmeats will do you good, sugar's very good for you. But the cameras, you know, it's an instinctive reaction of all human beings. When the camera comes in, they smile. And he said, we've got 50 cameramen, you'll have to do 50 smiles, then I'll kick him out, and we can resume, you'll be in a much better frame of mind. <laughs> of course, he's got something there. He really wasn't... He was a highly civilized person. The smiles were mere diplomacy. Back at the embassy, George Middleton wrote a cable to the Foreign Office. It was circulated in the cabinet. Mossadegh's megalomania is now verging on mental instability. It now looks as though the only thing to stop Persia falling into communist hands is a coup d'etat. The British looked for allies in the Iranian army until now controlled by the Shah. Mossadegh was determined to reduce the monarch's power. He took over from the Shah as Minister of Defense and retired leading royalist officers. From amongst this disaffected group, Middleton suggested one General Zahadi be recruited to lead a coup d'etat against Mossadegh. Ironically, Zahadi had been imprisoned by the British for pro-German sympathies during the war. 
and a British ambassador had once condemned him as vain, plausible, and thoroughly untrustworthy. Well, I, I went out to see him when he was living on his country estate, uh, and um, I used to go out partridge shooting, so if I had a gun with me, it looked all right. It looked like a terrorist act. It looked like a sporting occasion. And um, uh, changed cars three times at his request, and finally drove up to his country estate. He seemed tough. He wanted to be quite sure that the Shah was with him and the Americans. But he was very ill-disposed towards Mossadegh. He could see Mossadegh was leading the country to hell on a wheelbarrow. And he obviously liked the idea of power and all the perks that went with power. He wanted an assurance that money would start flowing, really without money to the Treasury. And we had talked quite openly at that time of uh, a line of credit or of 10 or 20 million pounds. It sounds like nothing in today's terms, but in those days it would have helped them quite a bit. With rumours circulating in Tehran, Mossadegh denounced the embassy as a nest of spies. In October 1952, he broke off relations with Britain and expelled all its diplomats. They could no longer mount their coup. In America, a new president had just been elected, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Could his Republican administration be persuaded to help? British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden went to meet him, taking men from MI6 and the Foreign Office to consult the CIA. We went there, really, I would have said to persuade the Americans at that stage that we weren't going to get anywhere with Mossadegh and that his remaining in power was very dangerous to both our interests and also to tell them a little bit about the means we had at our disposal for changing the, changing the government. And we felt, after we'd been talking for some time, that they accepted that uh, Mossadegh remaining in power would eventually lead to a communist takeover. It was my feeling then, it remains my feeling, that the British understood the extent of, of paranoia in this country concerning uh, communism. This was the day of Joe McCarthy, and that the British consciously played on that fear in order to, to help persuade us to involve ourselves in the coup. Eisenhower appointed John Foster Dulles to take charge of foreign policy. To him, anti-communism and American big business were two sides of the same coin. One night at the Iranian embassy, the then ambassador Saleh and myself talked to John Foster Dulles. And John Foster Dulles made it very clear that Iran will not be allowed to get away with the nationalization. And his argument was that if we get let you get away, then what's going to happen to Kuwait, to Saudi Arabia, to Iraq, and all our American holdings all over the world. Encouraged by the response of the Americans, MI6 set up a team in Cyprus to keep in radio contact with the Rashidian brothers in Tehran. They had a very wide range of contacts, particularly in the bazaar and the moneyed or hopefully moneyed classes were getting worried. They saw that their prosperity was being threatened and opinion was building up among those classes against Mossadegh and they also had contacts with the Ayatollahs and a sort of merchant religious movement going through to the people and a little bit of rent a crowd should have provided a strong popular demonstration against Mossadegh and in favor of the Shah. Central to the Rashidians network were the mob leaders based in the traditional athletic clubs where physical prowess and protection rackets went hand in hand. Here could be found men in the pay of Iran's ruling class who could provide the renter crowd the British needed. The British pinned their hopes above all on the Shah. To their dismay and that of Iran's elite, Mossadegh's reforms were reducing his powers to those of a ceremonial monarch rather than a ruler. The Shah was exceedingly weak. He was vacillating 
and he was afraid and he just didn't know what to do. He didn't like Mossadegh. He realized that Mossadegh was threatening his position, but he was unable to screw up the courage needed to dispose of Mossadegh. Although the Shah failed to act, the British kept trying. In March 1953, with Britain's agents fanning the flames, a hired mob called for Mossadegh's blood. Intrigues grew as the politics of the street took over and Mossadegh's supporters rallied to his defense. His moderate allies in parliament were now deserting him, but he was supported for the first time by the communist-backed Two-Day Party, a development the CIA played on in their propaganda. What we did from Washington was to write some of the articles that would appear in the Persian press. And these articles would appear, thanks again to the Rashidians, who had contacts, I believe, with probably four-fifths of the Iranian press. And any article that I would write, it gave you something of a sense of power, would appear almost instantly uh, the next day in the Iranian press. And they were designed to show Mossadegh as a communist collaborator and as a fanatic, as a person who uh, didn't understand that you could be both nationalistic and positive. When weeping, fainting, bedridden old Mossadegh has trouble with the Majlis or Parliament, he goes to the people for a referendum to have it dissolved. But more than 100,000 citizens of Tehran, including every available member of the Communist Two-Day Party, turn out to vote yes and be marked with indelible ink so they won't vote again. Understandably, few oppose the skinny old man who controls the army and the police. And the supervisors at the opposition voting place have nothing to supervise. Mossadegh, who is not a communist, has won with communist support. Can he now get rid of his dangerous new friends? Meistens diese Menschen, die waren Demokraten, Antifaschisten, sagen wir Intellektuellen, auch die Offizielle von Partei, das heißt die Militärelemente, die in Organisationen waren, Die waren nicht davor, gegen Mossadegh zu putzen, weil sie im Endeffekt selbst Patrioten waren, Nationalisten waren. A certain number of people thought that he was becoming, he was leading Iran towards communism. That was, you know, the communist bogey which was uh, represented to the, to the United States and was the cause of the United States' action in removing Mossadegh. I think that also was totally wrong. Mossadegh was not going towards co communism. Mossadegh had the two complexes. One was that he had a martyr complex, that if I die, I die for my country, or if I am jailed, I jail for my country, that's an honor. The second was that he depended so much on the people. He was a kind of the populist per person that he said, people always will protect me. And as long as I have the people, nobody can have a coup d'etat against me. And I guess that, that was uh, the reason that he neglected everything. And even when the coup d'etat came, he didn't do anything about it. In August 1953, Britain and America were ready to act. The American ambassador was recalled to avoid implication. An American agent persuaded the Shah to sign this decree and arranged an army unit to deliver it to Mossadegh. The original coup plan was based on the, the fact that the Shah had the ability to dismiss a government. And therefore, what was going to take place was that an officer in the army would take a firman, a, a notice, to the to Mossadegh and inform him that he had been replaced and that General Zahedi would become prime minister. Le 25, à minuit, on a envoyé des chars et des mitrailleuses avec un officier, lequel était Nassiri, un colonel de la garde royale, signifiant à M. Mossadegh qu'il était démis. Alors Mossadegh a écrit sur l'enveloppe, reçu, je déciderai. Et il a donné ça. Alors quand on a vu des tanks, on ne vient pas tout de même à une heure du matin avec des tanks pour demander la, la démission d'un Premier ministre. Et encore, on n'a pas le droit de le demander. Mossadegh aurait dû agir immédiatement et faire fusiller le lendemain, par la loi martiale, tous ceux qui ont été inclus dans cette histoire. When news of the attempted coup was heard, Mossadegh's supporters took to the streets, venting their anger on symbols of royalty. The Shah himself fled the country. But the CIA did not give up. They looked for a way to turn the protests to their advantage. 
Dann gab es spontane Demonstrationen. An dem Nachmittag, den 25. Morat, gab es natürlich eine große Demonstration in Zentrale, Platz, Teheran, Tupane. Eine große Demonstration, eine breiteste Demonstration der Tudepartei. partei Natürlich die, die den Versuch des Amerika verurteilt haben, die die Bevölkerung aufgerufen haben, den Mossad zu verteidigen und diese nationale Regierung auf dem Macht zu behalten. Und äh, die haben für eine Republik sogar äh, sich ausgesprochen. Die haben die Parole des Volksrepublik ausgebrochen. Ne? Well, as soon as this occurred, these two agents that I mentioned saw the opportunity and sent the people we had under our control into the streets and acted as if they were too dead. They were provocateurs, but we had more than, than just provocateurs. We had a lot of shock troops who actually acted as if they were two dead people throwing rocks at, uh, at mosques, at priests. With Tehran now in chaos, the CIA persuaded the royalist army officers to try again. Brandishing copies of the Shah's decree, they advanced towards Mossadegh's house. Meanwhile, the Rashidians and their friends mobilized their mobs to do battle with Mossadegh's supporters. That mob that came into North Tehran and was decisive in the overthrow was a mercenary mob. It had no ideology. And that mob was paid for by American dollars. And the amount of money that was used is, it has to have been very large. There were lots of people in the streets, uh, standing on the pavements and wondering what was happening. There was a lot of, in fact, uh, talk and conversation and uh, debate, etc., as well as speculation. And uh, uh, I saw uh, a few uh, lorry loads of uh, people, uh, people standing in these uh, lorries, looking like ruffians and thugs, uh, carrying clubs and sticks, and shouting slogans against Mossadegh and uh, occasionally in favor of the Shah. Uh, that was uh, what, what, what was happening in the morning. We didn't take it very seriously. We knew that there was something uh, wrong, but we thought perhaps that uh, things would uh, turn the other way. But in the afternoon, uh, it became clear that uh, things were much more serious, and the news came that Mossadegh's home had been surrounded. Gradually, uh, the shooting started, and I told him, sir, I think it's better you leave the house. He said, no, if it's going to happen, if it is going to be coup d'etat, uh, I think it's better I stay in this room and I die in this room and I will never uh, live here. The battle at the house raged for several hours. Over a hundred lives were lost. The Tehran mob took their revenge by sacking and looting the prime minister's residence. Mossadegh surrendered. The coup had succeeded. Britain had got its revenge, and the newsreels gloated. General Zahiri, the new premier, emerges as the hero of the hour, for he it was who took charge of events and organized the movement that threw Mossadegh from power. The people showed their preference in no uncertain manner, and after nine hours of bloodshed, the forces of the Shah were in command, and Mossadegh's reign as virtual dictator of Iran had ended. The Shah had fled Iran in fear. Now he returned in triumph. While in public, the Shah held parades. Behind the scenes, he settled old scores, imprisoning and executing his opponents. Soon, he signed a deal with Western oil companies. But it was America, not Britain, that now called the tune in Iran. And the Anglo-Iranian oil company, renamed BP, had to share its former monopoly with American oil companies. Certainly BP didn't come out on top, but they, got, they came back with a, a major share in the international consortium, which was sub, subsequently set up. And I suppose from my own point of view, I'd have probably sat there for another 10 years in that appalling heat instead of doing some much more interesting jobs, which I was allotted to later. In the military court at Tehran, where he's been on trial for treason, the Persian ex-premier, Dr. Mossadegh, demonstrates that he knows how to make an entrance. Clad in his accustomed dressing gown and pajamas, he even makes a dramatic scene out of taking his place in the dock. What a performance! 
Britain and America had orchestrated the downfall of Iran's only democratic leader, a man of principle whom in other places Britain might well have welcomed as the successor to empire. The West wanted to misunderstand him. None of them is interested in Mossadegh as a person. They're all interested in him as the person who um, cancelled the oil concession. If they had wanted to understand him, I think a great deal could have been made for the future. As I said, the present situation in the Middle East might not have happened. Next week in End of Empire, Egypt. The book of the series is available from the ABC shop in your capital city. For 128 years, Britain ruled this obscure corner of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, one of the few signs left of the British presence is this bizarre scrapyard of weapons, a reminder of the most chaotic closing chapter in the entire history of the end of the empire. Near the wrecks stands a military cemetery. The men buried here died in the withdrawal from a colony Britain wanted to leave at any price. In the 60s, these narrow streets were the scene of a bloody civil war. Twenty years after India gained her independence, Britain was trapped in a war over a colony she had already promised to leave. Soldiers were fighting and getting killed for no reason anyone in Britain could understand. I don't believe uh, that we need necessarily have left Aden in the way we did. In, in almost every other case, every other colony we left, the bands played, will you know, come back again, and there was a great deal of uh, tear jerking, and in some instances, um, a lot of people uh, regretted the fact that we'd gone. But we left Aden rather like thieves in the night. Queen Victoria was left behind. Today, she rests at the back of a museum. In 1839, this colony became the first imperial acquisition of her reign. Aden was a fishing village when Captain Haynes of the Indian Navy landed here and defeated the local sultan. This superb natural harbour was at first thought vital to safeguard the route to India. After the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, Aden started to prosper. Aden was at the centre of the British colonial trading system. Ships stopped here for fuel en route between Europe and India, the Far East and Australia. It was still a loyal imperial outpost in 1953, when the newly crowned Queen Elizabeth paid a visit on her world tour. Soon after coming ashore, the Queen took the salute and a march past. The bearing and discipline of every unit parading on this proud occasion was most impressive. The Arab people, many children among them, were obviously eager to catch a glimpse of the Queen as she presently drove off towards the RAF hospital. The Queen's visit really was quite astonishing. Uh, I never expected to see um, such uh, popular jubilation and uh, all the rest of it. There was some dancing in the streets and singing, and there was not a voice raised in opposition at all. 
In the 50s, Aden became the busiest harbor in the world after New York. And in 1954, BP opened a huge new refinery to process oil from the Gulf. The British enjoyed the good life in the little Raj. Pampered by Arab servants and catered for by Indian traders, they felt safe in this imperial backwater. Throughout the 1950s, as the empire was being dismantled, Aden's economy boomed. It was a duty-free mecca for the thousands of tourists off the ocean liners. Lost in time, British rule went on in the old colonial style, as if nothing had happened. Around the colony of Aden itself was a wilderness, the British protectorates, an area as large as England and Wales, occupied by feuding tribes. When Britain grabbed Aden, she had no interest in these lawless territories other than as a defensive zone. Tribal rulers, like the Emir of Baihan, were persuaded to sign treaties of protection and to accept political advisers. The few Britons who entered this medieval world could do little to change it. I was coming down from up country and I stopped in a village. I heard a clanking noise at my feet and I looked around and I saw a kind of grill in the uh, ground below and I could hear somebody moving about and clanking and I asked who it was and they were all very evasive, the Sheikh in particular, so I said get this chap out and they brought him out and he had a beard down to his waist and he's dressed in rags and emaciated to a degree and I asked why, how long he'd been there and nobody could remember and apparently he'd been locked away years before and there he'd been left. So I told, and he was shackled, hands and foot, and I told them to knock the shackles off and let the fellow go free. I thought he'd thank me for the good deed, but far from it, he complained that from now on nobody would give him any food. In the protectorates, around half a million people scratched a living from the barren soil. Unlike their neighbors in Saudi Arabia, the tribal rulers had no oil and practically no other source of income. Britain bought them as allies with a few rifles and a little money. This then is the Aden Protectorate. And one of the main reasons for the secession of barbarism here is the Aden Protectorate Levies, a small but compact force formed in 1928. Few recruits can write, so an inky thumb signs them in for an initial four years. This army of Arab soldiers under British officers brought the British and the Sultans into close alliance. The colonial power also employed a more modern system. What happened was that if you had a tribe that was causing trouble, you got hold of its sheikhs and you said, well, you either do as you're told and hand in hostages to answer for your good behavior, or we're going to come and bomb you. And you gave them time to clear out of their villages or houses and get their flocks and herds out of the way. And then you went off and dropped bombs, small bombs on the whole. And it was a remarkably efficacious and cheap way of maintaining law and order in otherwise unget areas. Until the 1950s, air policing subdued the warring tribesmen. But even this remote corner was about to be transformed by the nationalist revolution sweeping through the Arab world. The tribesmen were radicalized by a new voice from Cairo. Gamal Abdul Nasser became the champion of the Arab world after his triumph over Britain and France in 1956. 
He transmitted the anti-colonial message even to the South Arabian protectorates. Nasser turned to be a hero, a legend, uh, to hold all the Arab people. For the first time, they hear uh, an, an Arab uh, leader who is challenging uh, a big uh, power, uh, insisting on the freedom of all the Arab world and on the Arab nationalism. Wherever you went in the protectorate, you could hear the Cairo radio coming out of these transistor radios. You'd find some old gentleman died in Blue Woad, plying his field with NASA's propaganda coming out. In, in, and the, it was almost impossible to counter. Uh, it was, uh, after all, uh, calling for freedom, freedom from uh, foreign foreigners, I didn't believe that our propaganda, such as it was, was the slightest bit of use. Cairo Radio denounced the Sultans with their British arms as enemies of the Arab Revolution. The Sultans were so worried by this propaganda that they took up a British plan to form a federation for their defense. In 1959, the Federation of South Arabia was established. Eventually, most of the rulers were to sign up. Britain built a white hall in the sand and palaces for the sultans. In the new federal capital, the rulers performed a charade of parliamentary government. One of the few sultans with a formal education was their principal spokesman. We had a system which worked. And uh, we saw no reason to experiment uh, modern or Western democracy in a country uh, where it failed. It failed everywhere in the Middle East, and there was no point in trying to experiment it in our uh, country. But we had a system which, uh, which worked, and the rulers were elected by their tribal uh, leaders. And whether now by Western concept, this may not sound democratic, but uh, according to our customs, it was democratic. The absence of elections and the autocratic ways of the sultans ensured that the British and the sultans themselves did not know the extent of nationalist feeling among the people in the protectorates. ذلك الاتحاد الذي أقامه المستعمرين وكنا نشعر أن أجداد أولئك السلاطين وأباؤهم وهم هم الذين وقعوا مع المستعمرين الحماية معاهدة الحماية In Aden, prosperity had attracted a huge influx of immigrant workers from all over South Arabia. They joined trade unions that took up the Nasserite anti-imperialist cause and opposed the Federation with strikes and demonstrations. The British colonial authorities ignored the nationalists and gave full backing to the Sultans and their Federation. I think there are two things one was trying to do. First of all, one was trying to prepare the ground for eventual independence. Because after all, it was a, a very, very backward uh, state of affairs. You had a colony and a whole lot of little protected states. And uh, at that time, obviously, we should have begun to think about eventual independence. And then later on, uh, it seemed to me that uh, we should um, uh, be able to get what we wanted, let's say what the British government at that time wanted, uh, which was a friendly government with which we could uh, negotiate a treaty and uh, make whatever arrangements we wanted for use of the facilities in Aden. The main facility was a huge military base designed to restore the tottering British presence in the Middle East. Britain had been kicked out of Egypt, Iraq and Jordan. So Aden now became the headquarters of Middle East Command. In the early 1960s, thousands of British servicemen and their families settled in Aden. The British government made it clear repeatedly that the base was permanent. The nationalists in the Aden trade unions, inspired by Nasser, campaigned against this old-fashioned imperialism. But the vast majority of Adeni workers had no vote. The only way they could express their opposition to the Federation was on the streets. 
Their leader was Abdullah al Aznag, a trade unionist and nationalist who had close ties with the British Labour Party. He saw himself as a future Prime Minister. The British, indifferent to the nationalist opposition, forced Aden into the Federation, uniting the prosperous port with the backward inland protectorates. But the enlarged Federation came under immediate threat. In its nearest neighbour, Yemen, army officers supported by Egypt seized power. The Royalists resisted the coup. It was the start of a five-year civil war. The Egyptians eventually had 70,000 soldiers fighting on the Republican side. Nasser, once a noisy but distant threat, was now at the Federation's doorstep. For the nationalists of Aden and South Arabia, relief seemed close at hand. In 1963, with Egyptian help, the first of them began to operate as guerrillas here in the mountainous wilderness of the Radfan. They called themselves the NLF, the National Liberation Front. The NLF believed that armed revolution was the only way to independence. Their leader was Qatar Nashabi, a British-trained agricultural officer. He had been in exile in Cairo and with Egyptian money, set up headquarters in Yemen to direct the guerrilla campaign. The British, to deal with what seemed no more than a severe tribal outbreak, built an airstrip. They flew in troops and supplies. To the British Army's amazement, two battalions found themselves tied down by skilled marksmen, no longer obligingly shooting each other, but now aiming at the British. Our worst casualties happened within a few minutes uh, from a couple of snipers on the hillside behind the village. Most unfortunate, we got over the battle with four casualties, four wounded, and then we lost two men uh, to this wretched sniper and another half dozen wounded. It was six months before the British army were able to conquer the key positions in the Radfan mountains. They claimed a great success. لكن في الحقيقة أنا تمكننا من هزيمة هذه القوة البريطانية رغم إمكانياتها الهائلة تمكننا من هزيمتها وفي الأخير نحن كسبنا كسبنا الحرب وكسبنا المعركة وانتصر لنا أصحاب قضية. Radfan was the starting point for the NLF revolution, which gradually began to spread through the protectorates. Despite the growing nationalist pressure, the High Commissioner, Sir Kennedy Travaskis, and the Colonial Secretary, Duncan Sands, pressed ahead with their plan to give the federal government of the Sultans formal independence. Sands visited the Radfan to congratulate the troops. The British colonial authorities dismissed the NLF as a small band of pro-Egyptian extremists, incapable of affecting their plans for the area. In October 1964, a general election brought the Labour Party under Harold Wilson to power. The Labour Party had attacked the Federation as unrepresentative and reactionary. In opposition, it had supported Al Aznag and his claim that the Aden workers had a right to vote for their own government. But in office, the Labour ministers succumbed to American pressure not to relinquish Britain's global strategic role. So the government decided that its first priority in Aden was to keep the base. It reassured the sultans that it would stand by the federation. In 1965, the Labour government called the sultans and the moderate nationalists to a conference in London to try to persuade them to share power. 
But al Aznag, with his large trade unionist and political following in Aden, was not prepared to do a deal with the sultans. He demanded general elections. They rejected his proposals out of hand. al Aznag left London empty-handed. The NLF had not been asked to London. They threatened to kill anyone who negotiated with the British. They were still not regarded as a power to be reckoned with. كان الإنجليز وحكومة الاتحاد يرددوا في أجهزة إعلامهم إن هذا العمليات التي تقام في الأرياف ولا يعلنوا عن كل العمليات ولكنهم كانوا يعلنوا عن بعضها من أنها تمردات قبلية وإنها امتداد لتلك التمردات السابقة التي خضعت في الأخير نتيجة لضربات الاستعمار ولهذا السبب أسرعنا في أن نبدأ بالعمل المسلح في عدن المدينة على اعتبار أنها ستكون تلك الضربات الموجهة في العاصمة تكذيب بالدرجة الأساسية لأجهزة إعلام الاستعمار. In the midst of an extinct volcano, Crater, the Arab heart of Aden, became the main battlefield between the NLF and the British authorities. The NLF guerrillas' first targets were the officers in the Arab Special Branch, who had successfully infiltrated their organization. The campaign of killing culminated in the murder of the Speaker of the Aden Legislative Council. واتخذت إجراءات واسعة النطاق من قبل الإدارة البريطانية إثر هذه العملية الناجحة تمثلت في حضر التجول تمثلت في مطاردة الناس تمثلت في الاعتقالات الواسعة تمثلت في قامة معسكرات متحركة ومعسكرات ثابتة وحديثة داخل المنطقة كلها. In September 1965, a wave of riots and strikes protesting at the British plans for independence under the Federation of Sultans forced the colonial authorities to declare a state of emergency. Direct rule was imposed. The Aden Legislative Council was suspended. The nationalists had achieved their objective of creating a confrontation. Law and order had practically broken down in Aden, and we felt unless we controlled the thing directly, we'd have anarchies, rather like the situation when we imposed direct rule in Northern Ireland. But wasn't it an admission of defeat? Well, it was an admission that the uh, policy which we'd inherited wasn't working, and that was certainly the case. The Labour government hoped that a dash of direct rule would force the nationalists and the sultans to come to terms. Dennis Healy toured Britain's overseas bases as economic pressure forced a change of policy. His first target for cuts was Aden. We decided to get out in 66, and we decided to get out because there was no case for staying in Aden unless we needed it as a base for action in the Gulf. Once we decided that we were not going to intervene militarily in the Gulf, there was no case for staying there. Lord Beswick, a junior minister, was sent to Aden to tell the federal rulers that the base was to be closed and they would lose its protection after independence. Well, Lord Beswick came out in 1966 uh, and told us that the British government has decided unilaterally and without any consultation with us, which went against all the understanding and the treaties we had, to pull out of Aden, to, do, to pull out of South Arabia and uh, liquidate the base and we sensed from that that they were no longer interested in a proper um, handover of responsibility to uh, the federation i felt completely betrayed by them uh, because what they did was uh, contrary to everything we uh, we were led to believe uh, I think they behaved in a most uh, dishonorable way. I don't think we'd betrayed them because we never made them any promises. I think that uh, Duncan Sands as Defence Secretary and Commonwealth Secretary gave them a totally false impression of what Britain might do. The breach of faith is clear. Uh, and uh, I suppose I ought to know better than anybody because I gave the pledge. Uh, in uh, 1964, we had a conference in London at which we had representatives from the whole of the Federation of South Arabia, including Aden, and they said to us that they wanted independence. 
they'd like it before the end of 1968, uh, but it was no good to them to have independence unless they could have the means of preserving it, and that meant that they must have a, a defense agreement with Britain under which we would continue to give them protection at any rate for a period after until they were able to look after themselves. With Egyptian forces across the border and growing violence from the nationalists, the British government's decision had opened the door to chaos. In Aden, Arabs saw little point in helping a colonial power on its way out. The battle for succession began. Adeni nationalists like Abdullah al aznag who had hoped with the Labour government's help to reach power through the ballot box, went to Cairo, seeking Nasser's protection. al aznag was now driven to set up a guerrilla movement of his own. It was called Flossi, the front for the liberation of occupied South Yemen. The Egyptian government was keen to help and to have an influence over Aden's future. It tried to form a coalition of the two main nationalist groups, getting the NLF to join Flossi. We were supporting uh, only the independence of the country, so that's why we are putting a lot of pressure on all of them to come together and have a kind of coalition uh, government. And it's not only that, because we were worried about a civil war in the future. Uh, and Nasser was really thinking that uh, uh, in order to establish peace in the area, there must be some kind of coalition government, and uh, not only that, word, he thought that we must look to the future. My point of view about a solution in uh, Aden uh, before uh, the British leave is to talk with the nationalists and try to have a stable nationalist government, not a puppet government. But the NLF, radicalized by three years of guerrilla fighting, soon fell out with what they called the bourgeois Adeni politicians. The NLF was stronger in the protectorates, and in Aden they undermined Aznag's power with their increasingly effective guerrilla tactics. They could see no reason to share the spoils and rejected Egyptian schemes. Nasser, angered by the Marxist influence in an increasingly independent NLF, gave Flossie his full support. Each guerrilla movement tried to prove to the people that it was the army that was driving out the British. Are we running? So get out of it. This could be one of the biggest battles yet. The British troops are now going in to try and knock out the flossy regular machine gun posts. That's far from both sides. This is probably the biggest single battle that British troops have been involved in with terrorists so far in, in Aden. We don't know what's going on. British troops are over in that direction. And the Russians... The Flossy commandos are down in that direction. They're right in the middle. Such battles forced the British government to seek talks with those it considered terrorists. It sent a minister, Lord Shackleton, to try. The colonial authorities in Aden strongly opposed the initiative. Naturally, the colonial office didn't like us coming because we were turning everything on its head. And uh, one remembers the remark, classical, I think, of many ex-colonial situations, I will not negotiate with these murderers. But the history of the end of empire is negotiating with whatever you like to call them. Lord Shackleton's was the first British attempt to contact the NLF after three years of fighting. Sir Sam Fall was taken by a go-between to meet NLF representatives in a back street in Crater. I explained that Lord Shackleton had come to Aden in order to negotiate independence and to involve all parties concerned. The NLF were a very important party to this. 
and we would be interested in talking with them and we would of course consider uh, releasing their detainees and uh, taking the ban off their party so that we could discuss things in a reasonable and relaxed atmosphere. But there was just one minor condition that we'd like to make. If it were possible, we would be very grateful if they would stop killing us. And the two representatives roared with laughter. And one of them, he did like this, he said, Abu Sami, Mushmokin. Very sorry, Abu Sami, this is quite impossible. But being young, naive and foolish, I said, but, but why? We come with peace and we want to talk to you. It would be rational if you'd stop killing us. He said, no, you must understand that uh, Flossie constantly accuse us of being the running dogs of the imperialists. And if we, at this moment, were seen to be talking to you, this would simply give credence to their story, that they are the sole representatives of the people of Saudi Arabia and we are imperialist lackeys. And so, Abu Sami, we're very sorry, but we have got to drive you out of Aden. And we have to be seen to drive you out of Aden. When we have reached that stage, then we can negotiate. Then we have to change the heart and the heart of the world. We have to change the heart of the world. And we have to change the heart of the people of the country to achieve the work of the army or the political or the political. And we have to change the heart of the world. By mid-1967, British soldiers were risking their lives in a colony they would leave in a matter of months. We were sort of, uh, oh, sort of the rat in the trap, waiting for them to come out. You, you couldn't go around and just look for them. They weren't in uniform. The only way to catch them is to patrol the streets and hope for them to come to you. Every day you'd have a ground patrol going, you'd have maybe a platoon of, say, nine or ten men going in. They'd patrol the streets. You might get a small crowd demonstrate, and you might go after them and chase them. The crowd would try and draw you into a certain area or run down a certain street where there'd be somebody waiting to ambush, you know. When they were there, they would come out of the number of people, they would come out of three, they would come out of five, and they would come out of the area of all of them. Or in a different way, meaning in a different way, they would come out of the area 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 of the area. Why agree to drive them to use the mutafaggirat? It was mainly grenades. That was the favourite thing. Because with a grenade, they could throw it maybe from behind the wall, from a from a building, or bushes, or, or from a crowd even. Is this the one that uh, threw the grenade yes, at Mr. Gilbert? Yes, sir. Well, yes. Tell, tell me exactly what happened now. Well, uh, we're just driving up behind the Land Rover, and this chap drove in front of us. We drove past Mr. Gilbert on the left-hand side now. Chipped a grenade. Try to get away so we got in front of him. Get back, Chico. The NLF became stronger, and the British security forces were blighted in their efforts to catch guerrillas by poor intelligence. Few Arabs would help them. Soon, British frustration gave way to desperate measures. Hey, 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 hey,
Amen. They're trying to kill us. We are just trying to protect ourselves. People that say we're brutal just don't know what's going on. That's the trouble. Suspects were rounded up on the streets. They were taken to a barbed wire compound. Hooded informers picked out suspected guerrillas among the detainees. And as official inquiries subsequently confirmed, torture was used. وكنت واحدا من اولئك الذين قد تعرضوا للاعتقال لمده ثمانيه اشهر خلال هذا المعتقل وخلال الفتره التي قضيتها في السجن تعرضت الى التعذيب النفساني والجسدي الذي تمثل بالضرب والتعذيب بالكهرباء والتعذيب بوسائل عديده كانت قد تركت آثارا وعاهات لمن دخلوا هذا المعتقل وكنت واحدا من هؤلاء الذين تعرضوا لهذا التعذيب. The allegations of widespread torture caused an international scandal. This was yet another embarrassment for the British Labour government. By 1967, the decision had been taken by the British government to leave. Uh, there was no intention on their part to reverse or change that decision. There might be limited possibilities in timing, but the decision was to go. So the policy was how to get out uh, the armed forces and the civilian community without a bloodbath and, if possible, handing over to some practicable successor government by the end, of course, any practicable successor government. As Britain prepared to pull out, the battle for succession between Flossie and the NLF intensified. With Egyptian help, the Flossie leadership under the Labour Party's former friend, Abdullah al aznag now set out to destroy the NLF. Is Flossie the only organisation responsible for the present wave of terrorism in Aden? Flossy is the uh, only uh, leading organization that uh, that's responsible for the armed resistance of our people. I see there has been a lot of talk about a rival organization called the NLF, which is also claiming attacks. Is there any truth in this? NLF is a mere uh, label used by the uh, federal and the British administration in Aden to suggest confusion about the uh, fight and struggle of our people for independence. Uh, that is to say that they would like to suggest uh, uh, the existence of more than one front. But the truth is that there is only Flossi and nothing but Flossi. Despite Aznag's protestations, the Sultans were more worried about the NLF. They pinned all their hopes for the future on the Federal Armed Forces. They were much encouraged when the Labour government gave military aid in the summer of 1967 to modernise them. Both the NLF and Flossie were secretly recruiting members in the forces. To ensure their loyalty, the Sultans promoted pro-Federation officers. The move backfired. The event that finally destroyed what remained of the Sultan's power came on June the 20th, 1967. A mutiny broke out in the Federal Army ranks, spreading to this barracks in Crater, where the NLF agent Abdul Razak Shaif, now released from prison, was instigating an uprising. ولذلك اتجه رجال الجبهة القومية في السيطرة على الموقف وتوجيه هذا التمرد وتحويله إلى انتفاضة من داخل معسكر الشرينين يوم حيث تم توزيع الأسلحة وأخذ المواقع والتمركز في داخل المعسكر وخارجه a British Army patrol of two Land Rovers carrying nine soldiers approached the barracks along this road. Fusilier John Storey was in the second vehicle. The NLF-led police began shooting from the windows of this barracks. It happened so fast. 
was so devastating. The Land Rover in front stopped. Uh, I got shot across the side, I got winged across the side. All I wanted to do was get out, I felt caged in. Our Land Rover slowed down, I jumped out. Our Land Rover continued on for another 50, 60 feet and crashed into the wall of the police barracks. I ran past uh, the corporal in our Land Rover and he was just lying there still covered. His chest was just a mass of blood with holes in. And the two officers had been shot on fire. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't see the, the, other, the other men. Maybe they were scattered around the ground. I got shot through the arm. There was no cover whatsoever, getting shot from both sides. Maybe by a hundred or so, uh, police and terrorists. Had machine guns, rifles, pistols. Um, I look around. I seen the fl one of the blocks of flats had a doorway open. I, uh, I ran, zigzagged across the road. The pavement, the road, everything was all jumping and zigzagging. It was like all exploding, all the concrete was exploding around me. But I managed to make it into the blocks of flats. John Sorey hid in this block of flats and held an Arab family hostage at gunpoint for three hours. He escaped by jumping out of a window. This painting in an Aden museum records the events of the 20th of June, 1967, now an historic date in the nationalist calendar. John Story was the only survivor of this ambush. On the 20th of June, 22 soldiers were killed. They are buried here at Silent Valley near Aden. Unfortunately, um, events overtook us, uh, but it was not late if to, to put things right had we been uh, wholly supported by the British government. But because the, our own army believed that the British government were no longer behind the Federation. And so they were divided. They were looking elsewhere for future governments. But uh, they were doing it because they knew that the Labour government no longer, and the High Commissioner Trevelyan was no longer behind the federal government. The June the 20th shootings led the British troops to withdraw from Crater. The NLF took over a triumph that resounded throughout the Arab world. The British army surrounded Crater, cutting off the supplies of electricity and water. Young British officers like Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders demanded an immediate attack on Crater to avenge their dead comrades. A plan for a limited operation was finally agreed. And 13 days after the June the 20th ambush, the Highlanders retook Crater at dawn without incident. Colonel Mitchell became an overnight folk hero and was thereafter known to the readers of British popular newspapers as Mad Mitch. What were the reasons for retaking Crater? It has come as a great surprise. Well. Uh... You know, purely as a soldier, the, the reasons were that the whole prestige of the army depended on going back in, obviously. You know, we were thrown out, truth and known, and uh, we had to go back in. I propose to stay here, if I'm allowed to, with the battalion for as long as, uh, you know, the British are in crater. And, uh, you know, I've just told them we're a very mean lot. I mean, it's, uh, we'll be very fair, you know. But uh, if anyone starts any trouble, they'll just get their head blown off. Uh, they'll get the message in time, you know. This, uh, this being Gary helps a bit, you know. And the bagpipes. Up and the bagpipes, yes. Yeah. And one or two other things. <laughs> the Army High Command overruled Mitchell. They were determined to avoid a bloodbath. Yeah. Colonel Mitchell, for reasons of his own, wished to cut a dash with the Argyle Southern Highlanders in Crater. There were six other battalions in Aden, all of whom were doing an equally good job and could have sorted the Arabs out too. But they understood that the object was not to sort the Arabs out, but to leave as peacefully as possible when the time came. So I stopped Colonel Mitchell and made him do what everybody else was doing, keep the place as quiet as possible. For the Federation, the mutiny of its own forces was the beginning of the end. The hour of the Sultans had passed. The NLF stood poised to grab control. 
The first of the sultans fell only 24 hours after the June the 20th ambush. On the top of the hill, the emir of Dala was besieged. Below, his subjects were in arms. One by one, the sultans fell during the summer of 1967, as British troops pulled back to Aden to prepare for the final withdrawal. In the countryside, there was only one voice. In Aden, too, the struggle was to be one-sided. Egypt, defeated by Israel in the Six-Day War, was no longer able to give Flossie the military backing on which it had depended. I think that Flossie never had uh, a sufficient uh, following in the Federation as a whole. They had a certain trade union-based following in Aden, based largely upon the port, but upcountry they had very little following, and as it became clear towards the end, they had no strength at all in the armed forces. British soldiers were under strict orders to take no chances, as the battle between Flossie and the NLF raged through the autumn. Our orders, uh, certainly as, as we came towards the end, were to play the, the whole thing as low-key as possible. And the NLF and Flossie were, were battling it out. And uh, instances we'd see, for example, from our observation positions, would be um, uniformed men in some instances and non-uniformed others going to the back doors of houses, be two or three shots and they'd run out again. And when we'd investigate, of course, we'd find a body there. Now, this is a situation which uh, we've been told we shouldn't interfere in at all. And it was peculiar to the last days of Aden, which um, our government wanted us to come out uh, as quietly as possible. One has to remember that this withdrawal from Aden was in no circumstances a war. It was a withdrawal of our presence from a place we've been in for many years. There was therefore, as it was not a war, no conceivable justification for having one young man in the British Armed Forces wounded or killed more than absolutely 100% necessary. How could one, and one was constantly thinking of their families as one usually is, could one possibly justify to a mother in, say, Yorkshire that her son, Private Jones, had been killed because of inter-Arab fighting in a place which we were leaving a few weeks later, or even a few days later. And that thought was always in my mind. In the last six months, 30,000 troops pulled out, leaving a rear guard around the British airbase. The High Command was worried that the victorious NLF would carry out its threat to launch a final assault. Off Aden, a task force of 24 ships stood ready to perform a quick rescue. For the NLF, the moment of victory was near. Their colonial enemies were leaving, and their nationalist rivals, Flossie, were defeated in Aden. <laughs> NLF leader Katan Ashabi summoned journalists to Zinjibar, a small town near Aden, to announce his conditions. That they will give our people their full independence. That's the first point. Second point, that they realize that the NLF is the true representative of uh, our people. Third point is that Britain is ready to hand over full authority to NLF and then if I am selected by the NLF command to meet any British uh, uh, authority or uh, I am ready to do that. 
In November, in Geneva, only days before the British withdrawal, the former guerrilla leader, Ashabi, was recognized by Britain as the future head of an independent government. The High Commissioner, Sir Humphrey Trevelyan, took the final salute from the deck of HMS Intrepid. In Aden, there were no fanfares and no formal handover of power. Regimental flags were lowered. At quarter to two, the helicopters lifted the final 330 men from about 10 uh, positions around the perimeter of Aden. Colonel Di Morgan was the last British soldier out of Aden. He left at three o'clock on the afternoon of the 29th of November, 1967. As I circled the positions which my unit had been occupying for the last day to ensure that everything had been picked up safely and there was nobody left behind, I had a feeling of sadness that I was um, turning out across the Aden Bay to back to Albion, that I was the last man and we were leaving Aden after a British presence had been there for 128 years. It was all very sad. In the streets of Aden and all over the country, there was jubilation. The 128 years of the British Raj, which started with Captain Haynes, had ended. Aden was the colony that went over to the other side. The Federation of South Arabia became the People's Republic of Yemen, a Marxist state and an ally of the Soviet Union. Next week, Archbishop Makarios, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Cyprus, is seen also as the founder of Killer Gangs when End of Empire returns at 8.25. And remember, an impressive book of this series is available from bookshops and the ABC shop in your capital city. Stay with us now for the latest news, followed by our Sunday stereo special, Mozart in Delphi. In 1950, a new archbishop was installed as leader of the Greek Orthodox Church in Cyprus. He took the name Makarios III. Like the great leaders of the medieval church, he was more politician than priest. The British were slow to realize what kind of man they were dealing with. Under Makarios's leadership, every priest was a nationalist politician. Every congregation was potentially a subversive meeting. What the Greek Cypriots yearned for was not independence, but union with Greece, which they called Enesis. The British tried to stop the teaching of Enesis. They made it a crime. But the church found ways round this. <laughs> Απόψε κύριοι ήρθαμε στο χωριό σας για να κηρύξουμε την επανάσταση. Ζήτω η επανάσταση. Το επανέλαβα δύο τρεις φορές. Όλος ο λαός εχειροκροτούσε, εφώναζε. Η αστυνομία προχώρησε να εκτελέσει αυτό που με είχε στην αρχή απειλήσει, να με συλλάβει. 
όταν επλησίασε, εγώ προσέθεσα. Ήρθαμε να κηρύξουμε την επανάσταση ενάντια στην αμαρτία. Τότε πάγωσαν, σταμάτησαν και επεχώρησαν. Και εγώ μίλησα ενάντια στην αμαρτία. Βέβαια, στο τέλος ομιλίας μίλησα και εθνικά. Η αστυνομία όχι μόνο δεν προσήλθε να με συλλάβει, αλλά πρώτη εχειροκροτούσε. Μακάριο set out to win support in Greece itself. He met with an enthusiastic response. But just as the Greek people took up the cry of Enesis, events elsewhere in the Mediterranean threatened their cause. In 1952, a group of army officers led by Colonel Nasser seized power in Egypt, determined to evict British troops from the Suez Canal zone. The chiefs of staff decided to move the Middle East headquarters to Cyprus. Here, unlike Egypt, Britain was sovereign and could not be thrown out by a hostile regime. This conflict between the Cypriots' desire for union with Greece and Britain's new need for Cyprus led Henry Hopkinson, a junior minister in the colonial office, to make a blunder which ended his ministerial career and brought Cyprus world prominence. In July 1954, the Labour opposition began to ask why the Cypriots, the most highly educated colonial people, had so little say in managing their own affairs. With the Tory party already worried about withdrawal from Suez, the government's statement on Cyprus would be a tricky one to make. I made my, uh, my statement in the House, and um, uh, that it went all right. Uh, uh, Jim Griffiths, uh, who was, had been colonial secretary of the Labour Party, got up and asked whether he could take it, that it was the intention that Cyprus should eventually attain what he called dominion status, with the right to determine their own future. And of course this put me in a great difficulty because that was the one thing that I'd been told um, definitely by the Secretary of State when he returned from Cabinet that morning that I must not do. So I had to tread very carefully. I said there are certain territories which, which owing to their particular circumstances can never expect to be fully independent. The word never rang around the world. This was just what Makarios had been waiting for. The uproar compelled the Greek Prime Minister to raise the issue at the United Nations. He decided to go to the UN. And I don't blame him, he couldn't politically avoid it. Well, he couldn't avoid it because when a whole people believes that something is easy, especially when it believes that something is right, that a Greek island should be given to Greece. A, a government cannot resist forever, it can resist for some years. He can't say to the people, uh, I'm right and you are wrong, especially when they are right. At the United Nations, the Greek government requested the right of self-determination for the Cypriots, the chance to decide their own future confident that they would choose Enesis. Britain managed to muster enough votes to defeat the Greek resolution, and Makarios's disappointment and anger were shared by the Greek Cypriots in Nicosia. I was quite young. I saw the demonstration. I decided to follow the demonstrators. I start throw stones to the police. I saw this demonstration as a, as a starting for the freedom. A month earlier, in a remote corner of the island, a Cypriot had landed secretly. He came home to revolutionize the Enesis movement. It had been said that the Cypriots did not really want their freedom and that if they did want their freedom, they would seek it through 
actions of violence. Colonel George Grivas was a Cypriot who had fought in the Greek army and led an extreme right-wing guerrilla group in Greece. He was consumed with zeal for Enesis. An armed fight was the only way leading to the self-determination of my native country, Cyprus. He took the name Degenis after a legendary Greek hero. He kept his real identity a mystery. While Cyprus resumed an outward calm, Grivas was forging a secret army, Aoka, the national organization of Cypriot fighters. He imported arms, handpicked recruits, and selected his targets. I was asleep in the hotel opposite the uh, police station, and uh, the Greek uh, officer in charge uh, of the police station rang me up saying, uh, uh, Mr. Dengdash, uh, all over Cyprus uh, explosions are happening. Will you come uh, to the police station? Well, I said, uh, you must be a very nasty man to wake me up at this hour and to play on me the first of uh, April full days, you know, making jokes with me. He said, it's no joke, come down immediately, Mr. Dengdash, for heaven's sake. And I went down. And there it was, on the uh, wireless from all over Cyprus, bombs here, bombs there, and uh, they had started. If our rulers refuse to give us back our freedom, we shall claim it, with our own hands and with our own blood. Aoka, the leader, Degenis. What you need to be a member of this organization was that you must be, at that time, for, of a right wing, belongs to the right wing party. I mean, right wing, you are all except the leftist, the communist. I mean, they check your character. I mean, let's say if you are going around in bars, drinking or uh, having affairs with uh, people that they didn't, I mean, have a good name, they wouldn't choose you to be a member of uh, the organization. You must have a good character. It was people who exomologued the tactics, they communicated the tactics. Και το μυρμήκι να το σκοτώσουν δεν το ήθελα. Όταν όμως εκλήθησαν στον αγώνα, φυσικά έκαναν το καθήκον τους. Και έγραψαν την ωραιότερη σελίδα της ιστορίας της Κύπρου. Έχω ορκίσει πάρα πολλούς νέους. I swear in the name of the Holy Trinity that I shall work with all my power for the liberation of Cyprus from the British yoke, sacrificing for this even my life. They ordered me to execute, uh, to execute a, Greek, a Greek Cypriot in a main road, a very busy road. And believe me, I peace drop by drop in my underwear because it was the first time I, 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 I got a, a pistol. Very soon he arrived. So I aimed. I fired twice. For a long time, I saw I saw this person in my dreams. In him. Even when I did, even when I didn't sleep, I saw him, his face in front of me. But it was the first experience, anyway. But later, you get used. Uh, I can say that uh, after a lot of training and uh, after. Some more killings, uh, you get uh, used to kill The British looked to Archbishop Makarios to denounce Aoka's use of violence. They tried to pin him down. I am opposed to the use of violence, but at the same time, I am opposed to the British policy uh, which has provoked violence. However, I don't think uh, wise to condemn violence uh, in public because I understand that uh, a Greek uh, section of the people is in uh, favor of this method. The British were baffled by the failure of this man of God to condemn violence. They didn't realize he was Aoka's founder and its commander-in-chief. Yes, Makarios, uh, on his way to 
the United Nations, uh, while we have had this meeting with uh, Grivas in Athens, gave him the green light to come to Cyprus and uh, gave him money to pay the transportation. But he told him that you go there, you continue organizing things, but you will not start unless I, you receive an order from me. He did not want uh, the a revolution with uh, battles and guns and uh, machine guns and submachine guns. He was thinking of uh, an explosion here, a demonstration there, uh, some shooting to help or escape. And so, well, this is the, the, the ideas he was having by that time. Of course, uh, the other man was having, uh, Rivas was having completely different ideas. To the police, do not try to block our path or you will stain it with your blood. Anyone who tries to arrest or search Cypriot patriots will be shot. Aoka, the leader, Degenis. On the 1st of April, everyone looked upon uh, this movement as the movement of misguided few under the guidance of the church and uh, even Greek police. They were very good, uh, very good CID men uh, in the police force, excellent people. Uh, who looked upon it as uh, just a criminal activity by misguided youth. And they were very effective in catching these people. But uh, the terrorism towards informers, towards the police who followed them, uh, was, such, was such that within six months, I know, the people who were saying this is the criminal activity of a misguided few were saying, we are EOKA too. By the summer of 1955, Aoka's campaign was attracting world attention to the Greek Cypriot cause. Britain turned for support to the other country that had reason to fear a Greek takeover of the island. There has never been a time when British sovereignty over Cyprus was more vital than in the present day. The fears and anxieties of Turkey are constantly forgotten. Turkey that ruled Cyprus for 300 years. Turkey that is only 40 miles away from the shores of Cyprus. Turkey was not just worried about Greek troops near her shores, but also about the minority population. Almost 20% of the Cypriots were Turkish. They were alarmed to see Britain's control slipping. Aoka's bombs went off all over Cyprus. Policemen leaked the government's anti-terrorist plans. Customs men helped Aoka smuggle arms into the island. To reassert British authority, the government turned to its top soldier, Field Marshal Sir John Harding, Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and appointed him Governor of Cyprus. John, the Greek Foreign Minister said this morning that your appointment meant that Britain was going to war with Cyprus. Would you say that that was an exaggeration? Oh, I'm very sorry that he's taken up that attitude, because as far as I'm concerned, there's no question of war at all. In fact, I believe that the sooner people settle down peacefully and quietly together, the sooner we can get a proper answer to this business. My impression is that uh, the new governor, Field Marshal Sir John Harpin, is an intelligent and straightforward man. This is the reason I believe that uh, he will suggest uh, to his government to recognize the right of Cyprus people to self-determination mm -hmm. for uh, Britain's uh, prestige mm -hmm. and the pacification on this area. Impressed by the governor's reasonable attitude, Makarios made Harding an offer that he would drop his demand for Enesis immediately and he would renounce violence. If in return, the British promised they would eventually grant self-determination. Harding visited London to consult the cabinet and he returned to Cyprus with a carefully worded new policy. The governor came from London and we met in our house in Nicosia the 21st of November. 1955. I remember that day, Marshal Harting came first, ten minutes earlier, 
maybe for security reasons. And uh, Makarios came a few minutes later. And immediately, Marshal Harting took over from his pocket a paper. He gave it to Makarios and he said, you have the attitude, I have very good news for you. The paper gave the new British formula. It is not our position that the principle of self-determination can never be applicable to Cyprus. It is our position that it is not now a practical proposition on account of the present situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. This became known as the double negative. In simple words, it meant Enesis, not never, but not now. The Archbishop said, uh, Your Excellency, I cannot accept this and uh, Arthur was, he, he was very disappointed. He left immediately without waiting even to, to have the sweets and the coffee we usually offered in Cyprus in such occasions, you know. And uh, I read the paper and I was, re I was really surprised because it was the first time the British government recognized the right of self-determination to the people of Cyprus. When Marshal Harting left, the Archbishop told me, well, that we have in our pocket. And uh, we must try now to make it better. The weeks passed. Britain made no better offer. Harding prepared for war. Aoka stepped up its violence. After eight weeks, the two sides attempted another round of talks. Though latest reports give hope of a settlement in Cyprus, tension in that troubled island is as high as ever. Field Marshal Sir John Harding, Governor of Cyprus, newly returned from London, has his seventh and most crucial meeting with Archbishop Makarios, leader of the island's demand for union with Greece. He made what seemed to me an eloquent, even moving, uh, personal appeal to the Archbishop to uh, give his people a lead away from violence. Uh, even the Archbishop seemed to me to be uh, impressed, but after a short pause he said, um, you must understand, uh, Sir John, that I cannot lead my people where they will not go. And the field marshal, in exasperation, turned to me and said under his breath, funny sort of leadership to my way of thinking. Instead of the straight answer Harding was hoping for, Makarios asked for time to consult his counsel. A deal seemed to be in sight, but Makarios had one more advisor to consult, George Grivas. Makarios had brought him to Cyprus, but Aoka fighters were now heroes, and Aoka weapons, bought with the church's money, were in Grivas's hands. Could Makarios persuade him to lay them down? They met at Kiko Monastery, while Grivas's men stood guard outside. Grivas told Makarios that uh... I don't trust the British, and uh, he, his opinion was that if we are given amnesty, if we are given the police security, then uh, we could sign an agreement. Makarios wrote to Harding agreeing to renounce violence if these few small details could just be settled first. As far as I was concerned, it was no good continuing the negotiations. We come to a dead end. And so I recommended to the colonial secretary that he should come out. Makarios had high hopes of new concessions from the colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd. He, however, thought the terms Harding had already offered were sufficient to impress the world and the House of Commons. Lennox Boyd read a statement immediately, saying that this I'm going to tell in the house. Still, three points were pending. The amnesty, the public security, and the majority in the house. 
So the Archbishop wanted to clarify those three questions. And Lenox Poet said immediately, no, accept it or not. I didn't come here to, uh, to negotiate. You have already negotiated to the government. The Archbishop insisted and said, well, uh, uh, let's talk about this subject. Uh, why not? I think the truth is that uh, ministers in London and perhaps the governor in Cyprus also had uh, been becoming increasingly exasperated at what they saw as the, the prevarication of the archbishop as the talks wore on and increasingly dis disillusioned about the possibility of ever uh, reaching a viable um, a political settlement uh, with him. Lenox Poet was adamant. He said, no, receive it or not. And the Archbishop said, well, under these conditions, I'm not going to accept it. And then Lennox Poet stood up. He was two meters tall, you know. He closed his file and he said, addressing to the Archbishop, he said, Archbishop, God save your people. And he left. Makarios had held out too long. The only terms ever offered the Cypriots which could have led to Anasis were withdrawn. So I said to Lennox Boyle, I told Lennox Boyle that in my opinion the only thing to, to be done then was for me to concentrate on inflicting a defeat on the Oka. If that was done, if that was to be the program, well then I must get Makarios out of the way. Makarios left for the airport to fly to Athens to discuss his next move. But the British had arranged for him to go somewhere else. They took him three and a half thousand miles away to the Seychelles Islands, where he was to be detained in exile indefinitely. The deportation of Archbishop Makarios prompted Aoka to put into action their most audacious attack. In March 1956, a young waiter in government house smuggled a time bomb past the governor's security forces, strapped to his stomach with a lady's corset. I get immediately to the bedroom of the governor. I close the door and uh, immediately I took the bomb out of my corset and uh, I put it in the mattress under the, under the bed. You see they were uh, sleeping on separate beds. They were nearby the beds, but they were separate, two beds, you know, and uh, closed the beds just to kill both of them, not to have her to cry after him, you know. I always get up very late, I'm sorry to say, in the morning, and I had only just got up and nobody had uh, done the room or made the bed or anything. And one of the soldiers came in opened the doors between the bedrooms and said there's a bomb in his excellency's bed so i went and looked and there was this thing uh, i'd never seen a bomb before but there was this bomb there and i very nearly touched it with my flicked it with my fingers and i said well it must be a dud because it was there all night a young officer who was very brave, put the bomb on a shovel. He'd walked right through Government House, which was quite big, and he'd put it in a sandbag pit, and it was striking 12, and it went off three minutes after he'd put it in with the most sickening explosion that broke all the windows outside of the house. Neophytus Sophocles became a wanted man and was taken to the mountains to join the guerrilla bands under Aoka commander Colonel George Grivas. The anti-terrorist campaign in Cyprus reaches a new stage with the combing of 400 square miles of mountain forests in the southwest of the island. And somewhere in the thick forest in front of them are Aoka leaders with a big price on their head, including, it is believed, the chief of them all, George Griffiths. One British patrol stumbled across Grivas washing himself in a mountain stream, but he escaped and went underground. For the next two and a half years, he directed his war from this house on the outskirts of Limassol. 
Under the kitchen sink was the entrance to a cleverly concealed hideout. Not even his area commander knew where he was. But from this refuge, Grivas dispatched orders to his execution squads in the towns. Jackson Square, Nicosia, and a surprise swoop by men of the 3rd Parachute Battalion searching for concealed weapons. The day before, in a nearby street, two Royal Air Force men were brutally murdered and one seriously wounded by terrorists. The men, wearing civilian clothes, were shot from behind in cold blood. If they give me the guns, if they give us the guns, the armored cars, and everything that they got, we can fight face to face. I mean, we feel brave as, as they are, I mean, at that time. But they got everything on their side, and they wanted us, I mean, to come and, and uh, fight with them face by face. How we can fight face by face? A search was started immediately while the scent was still fresh, but no trace was found. The town is now out of bounds to servicemen off duty. Harding's first task was to get the information to find Aoka. The killers melted into the population, and the people knew what Aoka would do to a traitor. He revealed uh, to the enemy the hideout I was uh, leaving, and I decided and I executed him. What did you say to him? Nothing. What happened? Uh, I didn't go. I didn't go by myself personally. I sent some uh, boys to kill him. He was shot in the head, dead. No explanation, no messing, no... If you're a traitor, you have to die. That's all. It was uh, clear to all of us. Harding set out to strengthen the police, now thoroughly infiltrated by Aoka. So he created an auxiliary police force, recruited from the 20% minority in the population, the Turkish Cypriots. We were against Aoka. Britain was against Aoka. Therefore, we had uh, a joint interest in seeing that Aoka did not succeed. As the Turks were recruited as Britain's law enforcers, they also became the targets of Aoka gunmen. Some said it was deliberate British policy to set Greek against Turk and divide and rule. We couldn't uh, bring a whole horde of policemen from elsewhere in to do duties of, uh, of that kind. And so really, it w we had no choice in the, in the matter. Harding introduced tough emergency laws. He punished whole villages with collective fines and curfews. Troops and police rounded up suspects, and thousands were detained without trial. But suspects had to be made to talk. They took me to the special branch. They took off all my clothes. They tied me by the back, my hands in back, my foot, and uh, they beat me for a lot. Then they asked, uh, uh, somebody came, I mean, a Cypriot came, when you see for us, who started beating me. Uh, he was uh, always either drunk or taking drugs. Uh, he was really mad with me. He was crying one time. He was uh, laughing the other time. I mean, he was a man unbalanced. Uh, he was uh, taking um, the stick to put in my bottom. He was taking some clothes, uh, put it in the water, and then put it in my in my in my face so that not to breathe. He was uh, he threw me down and he started dancing on my on my 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 stomach with. He was wearing boots. Nikos Koshis described 12 days of torture before interrogators abandoned efforts to make him talk. Many Cypriots made similar allegations of torture, and Athens Radio broadcast every charge. In Britain, the Labour Party demanded an inquiry into these allegations of brutality, but the government stood by Harding. I had sufficient confidence in my senior police officers and army commanders to, to accept their view that this didn't happen. Harding believed he had a more effective way of making the Cypriots talk. In November 1956, he introduced the death penalty for anyone caught with a weapon. Interrogators could now bargain with suspects for information or their lives.
Harding's methods started to produce results. Hooded informers led British soldiers to Aoka hideouts. As Aoka's leaders were captured one by one, Grievous's second in command, Gregoris Avsentiu, told his men that he would never surrender. A fight to the death would restore Aoka's support. In March 1957, British troops discovered Avsentiu's hideout in a cave high in the Trodos Mountains. So confident were the British that they invited newsreel cameras to film this important capture. The battle raged for six hours as Avsentiu and his aide Matrosos fought it out with British soldiers. The British became impatient. They poured petrol into the cave and set fire to it. I was in front of the exit and the flame took me from the face. Instantly, I covered my face, my eyes, and my hands also bad. I feel bad. I turn again to the uh, accident view. I saw him in flames. And um, he shot me, don't be afraid. It was the last word I heard from, from after you. I jump off the cave with the hope that the bullet will, somebody will shoot me. I, I, I didn't want to live and I didn't want to die but by flames. Matrosos was found lying stunned at the bottom of the hill. They removed two, some stones from the roof and they saw Oxendio was back. The movement had found its martyr. Though Aoka's mountain gangs had been destroyed, the Greek Cypriots had demonstrated the will to fight on. I don't believe myself that you can destroy an organization of that kind which has the, which is led by fanatics uh, and has a great deal of support from the civil population, either from sympathy or from fear. I don't think you can destroy it, but we had inflicted a very serious defeat on them. Harding's forces were now in command, but no new leaders had come forward to replace Makarios and speak for the Greek community. Politically, there was a stalemate. By the beginning of 1957, Britain was reeling from a blow which changed her attitude to Cyprus and to her whole empire. Sir Anthony Eden's attempt to reconquer the Suez Canal had ended in disaster and he had resigned. His successor, Harold Macmillan, though an imperialist in style, was a realist in practice and thought the whole of Cyprus was no longer needed. A small base would do. But if the British wanted to negotiate, they would have to talk to the Archbishop. He was released from detention, but forbidden to set foot in Cyprus. On the 17th of April, 1957, Makarios arrived in Athens to a hero's welcome. The release of the Archbishop angered Turkey, which already feared a British withdrawal. The colonial secretary, Lennox Boyd, had visited Ankara to suggest there was a way to protect the Turkish Cypriots when the British pulled out. And when that happened, the Turks in Cyprus would be as entitled as the Greeks in Cyprus that they have their own self-determination, and that, of course, uh, involves the part would it then involve the partition of the island. I remember maps drawn in blood with the, uh, the uh, Turkish flag on top of it. Partition became the cause célèbre, as they say at the time. Partition or death became the slogan. Uh -huh. 
Makarios refused even to come to talks if Turkey were represented. Macmillan wrote in his diary, it really is one of the most baffling problems I can remember. The solution he hit upon was a new governor, not a soldier, but a conciliator, Sir Hugh Foote, Michael Foote's brother and a known friend of the Greeks. On taking up his appointment as governor four weeks ago, Sir Hugh was asked to make his report on the troubled island. Since then, at great personal risk, he has toured Greek and Turkish villages, seeking the views of the people themselves. Uh, he said, at the time, I was rather pleased with myself. Things had gone rather well. I got a good deal of publicity from uh, these uh, acts. No great substance, perhaps, in them, but they were indications of an anxious anxiety to work with the people. And then the um, terrible consequence. Foote's friendly gestures to the Greeks only convinced the Turkish Cypriots their protectors had abandoned them. <laughs> On the night of the 7th of June, 1958, the peaceful coexistence of the two communities ended forever. There was an explosion at the information bureau of uh, the Turkish uh, consulate. Uh, a crowd had already gathered there, a crowd of Turkish Cypriot youth. And they all almost immediately decided that Greeks had done it. And uh, they were uh, swearing vengeance uh, against the Greeks and so on. The explosion started a night of rioting in the Kassia. Turkish Cypriots burnt and looted Greek shops and houses. Soon, Aoka counter-attacked and the fighting spread around the island. British soldiers put up barricades to keep the two communities apart. Partition was fast becoming a reality, as ordinary people were murdered merely because they were Greek or Turkish. The fighting raged for three months. More than a hundred were killed. Against this background, Macmillan and Foote tried to launch a new initiative. The task which the British government has set itself is to see whether we could bring about at least some temporary period of calm and peace in the island. That means a great effort by all concerned. Macmillan offered to share the governing of Cyprus with Greece and Turkey. On the surface, a generous and even-handed offer. But to the Greeks, to have Turkey installed as a ruler of an island they claimed was part of Greece was a nightmare come true. Uh, the Greek people of Cyprus will oppose by all means uh, the unilateral application of this plan. If the British government insist on its plan, the result will be disastrous. Macmillan warned the Greeks that this plan would be imposed in two months' time, unless they compromised. This time it wasn't a question of going to beg them in you know, Athens and Greece. The idea was now we should go and tell them that we're going ahead with this. And you've got to, to accommodate yourself to it. I think that made a, a main, main difference. In desperation, Makarios turned to the British Labour Party, who had promised to grant Enesis when they won power. He asked Barbara Castle to Athens, but she brought bad news. They too would back the Macmillan plan, unless Makarios compromised. Oh, he's prepared to make a, a very important change indeed. He has offered to accept the status of independence for Cyprus, uh, on condition that Cyprus shall not be linked either with Turkey or with Greece. In other words, he says, rule out partition and uh, rule out union with Greece and let Cyprus be an independent state whose new position shall be guaranteed by the United Nations. Now, this is a very hopeful new development uh, and offers a way out of the present deadlock. We were terribly astonished when, out of the blue one day, Barbara Castle, who was a neighbor woman, uh, came out and said, Makarios has proposed me independence. We remained 
completely astonished. Grivas was also astonished. He had not been consulted, and two days after the archbishop's concession, he issued this command. He ordered Aoka to strike at will against the British, soldiers and civilians alike. It was here in Farmagusta that the most brutal outrage of all outrages in Cyprus took place. Two British women deliberately shot in the back. Mrs. Cutliffe died at once, and Mrs. Robinson was gravely wounded. Both were wives of servicemen. An intensive search for the murderers began at once. It would be surprising indeed if the troops, naturally enraged by this cold-blooded act of Ioka thugs, had carried out their search and made their arrests with kid glove methods. All must surely have felt that this was the most poignant of the many tragedies of the tragic situation in Cyprus. World opinion was so outraged that Grivas denied responsibility. But Aoka resumed the killing of British servicemen. For the British, it seemed to be getting worse and worse. At the United Nations, the problem was about to be taken out of their hands. Greek Foreign Minister Averov proposed independence for Cyprus as his last chance to defeat the Macmillan plan and to keep Turkey out. Turkish Foreign Minister Zorlu backed the Macmillan plan. In fact, on Cyprus, there are two national communities. And at the end of a grueling debate, the Greeks were defeated. We went with some members of the delegation at the end of a corridor to smoke. And uh, we were frantic, of course, desperate. Because there, there are also questions of internal policy. How do, you, how do you go back in the country, beaten in an international forum? Then uh, I saw Zorlu coming coming towards me i told uh, my people there he's coming here i am afraid i'll slap him in the face i'm so nervous I, I don't think i will be able to keep my nerves so he came smiling and he told me i came to congratulate you to a veros amazement zorlu proposed a deal Turkey would accept independence for Cyprus if they could agree guarantees to protect the Turkish minority. Over the next few weeks, they worked out the details of their plan. And two months later in Zurich, their prime ministers approved their proposal. Mr. Zalu, as Turkish foreign minister, are you happy with the agreement you've reached with Greece? I am completely happy. Why has it taken so long and cost so many lives before this agreement was reached? Mm, this is a difficult question because the, the matter is, was a very complicated one and uh, the national right and uh, too, ma too much emotion was involved in this, in this uh, dispute. Averov and Zorlu flew straight to London, where the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Wynne Lloyd, was delighted with a solution that let Britain escape from Cyprus and yet retain two military bases. The leaders of the Turkish and Greek Cypriots were then invited to Lancaster House to ratify these proposals. This conference was to be only a signing ceremony. Details agreed in Zurich could not be changed and Makarios had promised Greek Prime Minister Karamanlis that he would accept the deal. Outside Lancaster House, even the fog was lifting as Foreign Secretary Selwyn Lloyd arrived for the conference on Cyprus. To the governor of the island, Sir Hugh Foote, it was a near miracle that the hope of peace had dawned at last. Indeed, the presence in London of the much-discussed Archbishop Makarios, now indisputable fact, would have seemed quite out of the question only a week or two ago, yet here he was. The conference began with each delegate playing his expected role. Selwyn Lloyd read out the Zurich agreements. Averov described them as the best possible, and Zorlu agreed. Then Makarios spoke. He said that while he accepted the agreements as a basis, he would like just a few amendments. 
The conference was stunned. Averov telephoned Karaman Lise in Athens, who flew to London and immediately ordered that Makarios be brought to meet him. Makarios said he had promised to sign, but he was sorry. He had now changed his mind. Then Karaman Lise uh, told him very calmly, but in a very strong voice, that I want you to know one thing. My policy on Cyprus is fixed. We have monographed these agreements in Zurich. It's finished, that's the agreement. That's my policy. If you don't uh, agree, I will not change my policy. It's fixed. And uh, he left. Makarios was given one more night to accept the deal. War or peace in Cyprus hung on his decision alone. If he decided to fight on now, how many Cypriots would follow him? And that was the most critical evening for the Archbishop. I remember I went to his room and I stayed with him until midnight. And uh, I remember Archbishop was smoking, he was a heavy smoker. Smoking, smoking, and thinking. I told him good night and have a, a good sleep. And he told me, I wonder if I can sleep this evening. So next morning I went first and knocked his door and he said, I have already given my answer. I have uh, contacted the Greek representatives and I told them that I would sign. That was the story. This day, a new chapter opens up for the people of Cyprus, a period of peace and prosperity and freedom. The two communities in the island, working closely together with God's guidance, will, I have no doubt, be able to develop the welfare of the island to their common benefit. The Cypriots are struggling was entirely successful in the military sphere as history will pronounce one day. However, its accomplishments were not duly exploited by the political leadership. Grivas did not dare clash with Makarios. He reluctantly ordered his men to lay down their arms and went home to Greece but he was to return later to plague Makarios. The Archbishop moved into Government House as President of the Republic of Cyprus. After the, after the end of the war? Oh yeah. I came here just to take my belongings, you know. Before I telephoned to the ADC and I asked him to give me my salary. He said, are you crazy? He said. <laughs> and I told him that if he denied to give my salary, I blew him up. <laughs> he said, come on, the government house belongs to you now, he said. If you're interested in having a permanent record of the many interesting events covered in the series End of Empire, there's a hardcover book available at your ABC shop and at all good booksellers.
At the end of the Second World War, Africa had not yet entered the race for independence. Throughout the continent, white governors were confident that for as long as they lived, the imperial system would go on with the cooperation of the traditional chiefs. But in the Gold Coast, independence came with unexpected speed. Kwame Nkrumah was its nationalist leader. As president of independent Ghana, Nkrumah inspired the nationalist movements that were to sweep the colonial powers out of Africa. Two hundred years ago, the British and Africans prospered together, selling gold and slaves. Then the Gold Coast became the world's biggest producer of cocoa. It was seen as the model colony, but in February 1948, the complacent British rulers suffered a terrible shock. A violent incident took place in Accra, the capital. A demonstration of 2,000 people protesting against the poor treatment of ex-servicemen got out of control. Twelve policemen had the job of stopping them from getting to Christianborg Castle, the home of the colonial governor. The two sides met at Christianborg Crossroads. When we got to the crossroad, we were held up because we were then marching in the columns. And then what we saw was, uh, I mean, a resistance from the British uh, superintendent of police, Mr. Emery, who would not allow us to further our advance to the castle. The crowd in front were very close, perhaps 20... 25 yards, I don't know. Um, I gave the order to fire, and nothing happened at all. Um, we were obviously going to get overrun at any moment, and uh, I retreated back onto the firing party and uh, tore a rifle out of the hands of one of the men, and I myself fired at a uh, man in front who was urging the crowd forward and he was killed and I think I fired a total of another five shots and uh, the crowd turned around and made off. By nightfall, the city of Accra was in flames. Looters had stripped the stores of their goods and rioters had opened the jails and released the prisoners. European women and children had been evacuated to places of safety. Within days, rioting broke out in towns throughout the colony. 29 died and over 200 were injured. It was a terrible uh, sight because uh, going through the streets, all the windows were smashed. Um, people were wandering around, I think, uh, very happy with having had some drink. and. Um, uh, so many cars had been turned over. We brought out the fire brigade, uh, but there was little we could do. We did save a few buildings from burning, but uh, uh, some of the citizens were actually slashing the, uh, the, the houses with cutlasses, so we had to arm the fire brigade. The executive of the United Gold Coast Convention, the party of educated professionals, immediately sent a telegram to the colonial office in London. This thing happened on a Saturday, 20th. On the 29th, the leaders of the convention saw a government official, and the person of Jimmy Moxon, and told him exactly what we had done, that we had sent a telegram to the Secretary of State asking that he should send a commission for the government had broken down. Police unable to protect life and property since early afternoon yesterday. Governor Creasy to be recalled and relieved of his onerous and impossible burden. The convention leaders offered to form a government. The governor, Sir Gerald Creasy, surprised them with his response. 
We were not expecting to be arrested. But we were arrested, and we didn't actually, weren't very angry, uh, uh, because they came and said, well, we don't really know whether you are the cause of it, but your presence here does not seem to conduce to peace, so we'll take you away. Oh, I think it's not unfair to say Creasy panicked. You see, it was a situation which was totally beyond his ex previous experience. He had been in charge of the African Division, but he had never served, as far as I know, in any capacity in any overseas territory. And he was just simply bewildered, and he just sort of threshed around trying to clutch at straws here and there. When the news broke at the colonial office that Saturday evening, the whole African department was called in. They feared that the situation was out of control and that the governor was losing his grip. There were too many telegrams and all marked most immediate, uh, which had to be dealt with instantly, day or night. And we felt that the messages in those telegrams might have been referred to some of the other people on the spot who understood the African mind much better. The Labour government had been trying to give a share of power to Africans in all the British territories, but the old hands who ran them would have none of it. And to the French, Belgians, Portuguese, Spanish and Italians in their colonies, such ideas were beyond belief. Now the riots in the Gold Coast gave the Labour ministers their chance. They sent out a team, headed by Aiken Watson, a Labour Party supporter and lawyer, to say what should be done. His report said frustration over high prices and slow progress in housing, education and African political rights demanded action. Watson proposed that over the next 10 years, self-government should be introduced with one man, one vote. Exactly what the colonial diehards said would undermine both British rule and political stability in Africa. The colonial secretary, Arthur Creech Jones, accepted the report. I think it was the turning point in British policy in Africa because the courage which Creech Jones as the colonial secretary and Andrew Cohen as the head of the African section of the colonial office showed in determining to go straight through with accepting its proposals created a momentum which led inevitably to independence for Ghana even though the Labour government by that time had disappeared. This reversal of policy led to five out of six of the men who had been jailed after the riots being picked to join an all-black committee to say how the country should be governed. The British believed that they would now have to share power with this moderate, educated elite if they were to keep their influence in Africa. But while the committee were preparing their report, there was a split in the ranks of the convention. Kwame Nkrumah, their paid general secretary, led a massive breakaway movement calling it the Convention People's Party, the CPP. From the moment he'd returned from England 18 months earlier to work for them, Nkrumah had made his strategy clear to the convention leaders. At the first meeting, Kwame explained to them very clearly the sort of uh, program which he was going to follow. He recommended that there should be a very strong organization and that uh, there should be branches all over the country and that their demand for self-government should be backed with demonstrations, strikes and boycotts, which of course uh, the, uh, CP the UGCC leaders did not like, nor were they enamored with uh, his uh, fiery speeches and uh, trenchant articles against imperialism and uh, and uh, decolonization. And therefore, they, uh, those of us who were close to Kwame were not looked at in a favorable light. He had come encouraged by some of our friends in England um, to watch the people he called reactionaries. And actually, talking to him, I got the impression that he was not going to be with us for long. Or he regarded most of us as being reactionary. The aristocratic leaders of the convention were professional men who had never been at ease with the semi-educated people who were about to get the vote. Kwame Nkrumah had been born in a poor fishing village, but he'd worked his way through universities in America and England, where he led African student movements. 
He demanded immediate self-government from the British and challenged the traditional authority of the chiefs. Nkrumah championed the interests of the common people and knew how to appeal to them. Well, Nkrumah was a very good public speaker. Um, he uses sometimes questions like, do you want to continue to live under colonial rule? And of course the people would shout, no. We can no longer continue to be under oppression. We must fight for independence at all costs. We must prepare to go to prison. We must prepare to suffer all kinds of indignities, but we will fight until we win. Um, he also used a lot of gestures, um, paced up and down, looked at the people, um, could pick groups, like we'll organize the youth, the market women, we call upon the, the aged, we call upon the ex-servicemen, we call upon the workers, I mean, naming the groups, so that everybody felt that he was a part of the struggle. And um, he also had a way of making people believe that he was very serious in what he was talking about. And I think that went a very long way in getting the people organized. Two months after Nkrumah had formed the CPP, a new governor arrived at the castle, Sir Charles Arden Clark, a stubborn man who was not to be deflected from his policies, even by instructions from London. Well, Arden Clark, he was a splendid old world governor. He was a man that we all greatly admired. I was very fond of him. But he'd been brought up, of course, when he would run a huge district in Nigeria on his own with no interference from anyone. Then, as he advanced, there well, were things like dispatches from the Secretary of State, and uh, later we'd be getting cables and so on. But he didn't really take to this too much. And as for the telephone, I think I must have been his secretary. I was in the adjoining room one day when I heard him saying again and again, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And he came into my office and said, that was the Secretary of State. I'm not going to have him telephoning me. Within weeks of his arrival, Sir Charles Arden Clark faced his first crisis. The All Black Committee on the Constitution reported, and its proposals fell far short of Nkrumah's demand for self-government now. The CPP's response was to threaten a campaign of strikes and civil disobedience, which they called positive action. Krobo Odusi was an influential member of the CPP Central Committee. Positive action, the goals of for independence now. And uh, we link it with uh, India, because India state positive action during the time of Gandhi, and they achieved independence. So we said, you wanted to declare positive action, all our supporters to stay out of work so that the British government will know what our demands are. And we warn them that nobody should act violently. It must all be without violence. Support for positive action was widespread and the newly formed unions were firmly behind it. The government feared that violence and strikes would bring the country to a halt. Chief Secretary Reginald Salloway had served in India and had faced civil disobedience before. He decided that for the first time, the government should talk with Nkrumah. Salloway was quite superb at that meeting. Uh, he talked about uh, positive action, which had covered Nkrumah's Accra Evening News, his newspaper, for weeks and weeks and said that he thought from his short knowledge of the Gold Coast that the claim that they would run this as a non-violent campaign was an illusion. 
and that this would lead to violence and to bloodshed and that this was unnecessary. There had been the Kuse Commission, which had promised within six months uh, general elections. And uh, Reg Salloway said that uh, if your claim to represent the vast mass of people in this country is substantial, then put it to the test in six months instead of putting the country to violence straight away. And that is a clear choice that you have. But if you choose to launch positive action now, I tell you it will end in violence and any bloodshed will be on your head. After the interview with uh, the Chief Secretary, uh, uh, Reginald Soloway, had failed to give us the answer we required, Kwame went to the arena. In fact, the crowd had already gathered there. And there, he declared positive action. The thing had been very effective. The opposition was telling them that they can't do it. But when it became so very effective and spread throughout the whole country, even in the north, then they, they felt it that uh, the thing was serious. They were creating a great deal of trouble, turning against the chiefs, turning against government officials and creating a state in which you could do nothing except stop it. And stop it we did. I attended a meeting with Arden Clark and Brannigan, the Attorney General, and we decided that there had to be declaration of a state of emergency and so uh, all the ringleaders were immediately arrested. This was done very rapidly, almost overnight. About 100 people were taken into custody. There were no deaths, except of two policemen. And um, the whole affair fizzled out in a matter of a few days. With the CPP leaders in jail, the British expected that the convention would have a clear run to victory in the forthcoming election. But it was not to be so easy. By a remarkable coincidence, as Kwame Nkrumah entered prison, one of his most trusted lieutenants was coming out. Komla Bedema had completed a six-month sentence and immediately set about repairing the damage to the party. Well, I, I realized that uh, somebody had to keep Nkrumah's image before the eyes of the people, and uh, I felt that was my duty to the extent that I had a, a life-size photograph made of him, which I carried as part of my paraphernalia going around the country. Erasing it, I let people see, this is a man who is in jail. We must go on fighting. His body is in jail, but his spirits must go on. Bedema had a genius for organization, and soon the CPP colors were everywhere, even on self-government now dresses. Bedema reminded the people about their absent leader languishing in jail and invented a new honor, the title of prison graduate. Well, when I came out of jail, my father and Mr. A.Y.K. Jin were the only two people who met me at the prison gates. I didn't like that. So I thought other people who were then in jail should come out as heroes, and I organized the prison graduate idea? Well, it was the equivalent of the old school tie. Those who had been uh, in jail in association, in connection with some uh, civil unrest or libel actions and that sort of thing, were qualified in the eyes of the CPP to wear a uniform. And um, that consisted of a white hat and a Northern Territory smock. And this was a very helpful image to them. It helped to sell the idea of a party which was prepared to sacrifice its um, leaders in the public cause. The first few were, had maybe 100 people, but after the first two or three, they came out in thousands to meet them. And we paraded the streets without, without a permit. We paraded the streets and... Uh, the government didn't begin to like the idea, so they thought they should stop us. But the nationalist tide was moving so high, they didn't want to do it by force. First, they thought they could uh, 
leave the prisoner go uh, uh, sometime before he was due to come out officially. So, yeah, I remember the first instance we went to his house. He had been left about four o'clock in the morning. We went and brought him to the prison gate and performed our ceremonies. In February 1951, the election was called. Vedema organized the CPP campaign. The prison graduates drummed home and Krumah's slogans. We prefer self-government with danger to servitude in tranquility. Above all, there was one clear demand. Self-government now. Self-government now. The CPP campaigned in a new way. They were prepared to sleep on verandas with the boys popularly called veranda boys, because most of them were sleeping in verandas at the time. And when they went out to the villages, they trucked down together, sang their songs, drank palm wine in street bars, street corners with them, and virtually were prepared to throw their lot in with them at all times, at all places. Now this, Dankwa and others were not prepared to do. No, indeed, would they have been proved honest if they had attempted to do it, because it just didn't suit them. It wasn't in their character, it wasn't in their makeup, and they could not pretend to be with them in those directions without exposing their own hypocrisy. The British believed they had introduced an electoral system that would favor the elite. In the country areas, members were to be chosen by the chiefs. In the towns, by one man, one vote. Election day was February the 8th. I remember that night very clearly, even after 30 years. The crowds were milling on what is now, well, it was the old polo ground. There were thousands of people there waiting anxiously for the results. At about uh, soon after midnight, the final results were known and the CPP had won by a, 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 a large majority. And uh, the late Mr. Salloway, who was then the chief secretary, called me and said, Mr. Gedema, you, you must tell your people. So I, quite unprepared, I stood up and I said, now, at long last, the people of this country have spoken the language which the imperialists understand the language of the ballot box. We have won this election. And the roars which came from the thousands still rings in my ears. To the dismay of the British, the prison graduates swept the board. But Nkrumah was in jail with another two years to serve of his sentence. The governor faced a difficult decision. Nkrumah had flouted the law and had been found guilty. Should he release Nkrumah and reward the man who had unleashed positive action, or keep him in jail and risk riots and the prospect of a government guided from a prison cell? Arden Clark finally decided that Nkrumah should be released from prison at one o'clock on Monday, the 12th of February, 1951. We, we had an excellent view as my office was just across the road from the, the uh, uh, James Fort prison. In fact, we had quite a bundle of the world press up there. We were amazed, all of us, to see how quickly the streets filled. It was an extremely moving scene. From that point, he was taken by his party members straight to the arena where he was presented to the public. And then, very shortly afterwards, he was called by Arden Clark to the castle and uh, told that uh, he had to form a government. The governor and Nkrumah formed a cabinet of three British civil servants and eight Africans. The world watched to see how they would cope. Kwame Nkrumah had been released from prison to become leader of the government. He headed an executive of 11 ministers. The three British civil servants controlled finance, defense, and justice. The new African ministers controlled the rest. Well, it, it, it basically, they, they, they hadn't done any kind of government job at all before and they, they hadn't really understood that they had to work regular office hours. Um, and the idea was to go off and address public meetings, like, 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 like good politicians, they thought. I must say that uh, it's not an easy transformation from an agitator to a responsible cabinet position. But we had to 
realize the fact that we were no more on the soapbox or on the platform, but we had to see that the affairs of this country were properly run. That was not easy, but within months we had got that image imprinted on ourselves. As we went along, uh, we never directly opposed any particular minister in any of the things he wanted. We found that um, by talking through and round a subject, one got uh, general agreement. I have no recollection of the governor at any time having to put any question in executive council to a vote. So I think that shows that we were able to establish an extremely good relationship with the African ministers. Arden Clark and Nkrumah were at first suspicious of each other, but they soon formed a close partnership and together they plotted a careful course between the conflicting demands of the colonial office and the CPP. There was harmony. There was great harmony. And uh, he used to go to him frequently, uh, two or three times a week. Sometimes Arden Clark would send for him, but sometimes he would come up on his own. And I think this uh, pleased Arden Clark. He was, in fact, his blue-eyed boy, really, you know. In October 1951, the Conservative Party won the general election. The new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and the Colonial Secretary, Oliver Littleton, thought that events in the Gold Coast were moving too fast. Littleton went out to see for himself. Sir William Gorrell Barnes, in charge of the Africa desk of the Colonial Office, went with him. There would have been great advantages in slaying it. First of all, for the benefit of people in the Gold Coast themselves, and secondly, from the point of uh, the repercussions which were bound to follow elsewhere, first on the west coast and then in the rest of Africa. But, of course, there was very little room for manoeuvre. The colony was the world's largest producer of cocoa. Revenue was booming, and the CPP ministers in Accra were determined to pass on the benefits. They made primary schooling free for all and in three years doubled the school population. Health care was extended throughout the colony, and a house-building program was launched. Money was poured into industry, road building, and harbor development. But as the Gold Coast was enjoying this period of rapid modernization, one of its traditional customs, dash, or the receipt of gifts for favors, was also taking on a modern and less acceptable form. Well, we didn't meet corruption face to face in the office. It did become reflected in the kind of people who were passing through all ministers' offices. There were a number of carpet-bagging businessmen who made one feel uncomfortable at the time. There was one case that came to us in the Ministry of Communications and Works where an American chap produced some fantastic housing scheme that only cost three and a half million, something of the sort. And uh, we got wind of this and examined it and were able to shoot it down. Well, this made us very unpopular because this uh, cut the ministers off from the 10% of whatever it was they were going to get on this contract. And uh, so after one or two occasions like that, they kept these things very quiet didn't put these propositions to us to be examined and considered. Uh, they signed on the dotted line and then told us uh, what was going to happen and that it was for us to put the thing into effect. In spite of the corruption, in less than three years, Kwame Nkrumah and his prison graduates had convinced the British government that they were able to govern themselves. In 1954, the second Gold Coast election was announced and the CPP leaders were in no doubt about its significance. The 51 election was just to establish the government. Now, several discussions took place after that regarding the granting of independence. And it was uh, agreed with the British government that uh, if we won the, the uh, 54 elections, independence would follow.
With independence in sight, Nkrumah and his ministers launched their manifesto in Accra Stadium, telling voters, vote CPP and we'll finish the job. The opposition, united only in its dislike of Nkrumah, raised doubts about his party, which were to grow into a dangerous challenge. One opposition candidate was Nancy Tsibu. CPP was a bit corrupt at that time, and money was all, and if you didn't belong to it, you were not given any share of whatever was happening in the country. So we kicked against it. My campaigning was more or less on moral issues, because at that time, the youth were up against the elders and the chiefs of the country. And as a woman, I, we didn't like it that way at all, because in our tradition, we respected our elders and especially our chiefs. On election night, the CPP swept back with more than two-thirds of the seats in the Legislative Assembly. Independence seemed a step away. Freedom! It is now... Uh, I don't think I have much to say now because we are now beginning. I want to thank the Niger men, men and women of Accra, for their great support. Again, I thank you all. Let's hope for the best. Freedom. For the first time in a British colony, Africans were given control of an entire cabinet. There were no British ministers. On this eventful occasion, my colleagues and I are very happy to be the first members of the first African cabinet. The people of the country have reaffirmed their confidence in us and have given us the mandate to carry on and finish the job. Nkrumah's hopes for a trouble-free transition to independence were soon destroyed by the leaders of Ashanti. The Ashantis had been among the greatest warriors in Africa and once ruled an empire as large as the Gold Coast itself. They were fiercely loyal to the Asantahini, the ruler of their kingdom, and to their ancient system of government. Ashanti was the wealthiest region in the colony, rich in cocoa and gold. Within weeks of the election, the Ashanti chiefs and cocoa farmers launched the National Liberation Movement to battle for a federal system of government to protect the power, the wealth, and the traditions of their region from the central government in Accra. It was led by a senior minister in the Asantahini's court, Bafora Koto. The very day we are inaugurating uh, uh, NLM, they started stone throwing. They even sent people on the way. When the people are coming to a rally, they told them that the rally didn't go on, so they must return. And few people who came they stoned their cars. And even when they were in the ready, they stoned us with bottles and stones. While police were standing unconcerned. But as we were determined to drive Ashanti and part of the country from Nkrumah, we were also determined. I've told them that you I don't want you to be violent. But when anybody attack you, try to defend yourself. In Ashanti, both the National Liberation Movement and the CPP created strong-arm gangs called Action Groupers and Action Troopers to travel the region threatening each other's supporters. The intimidation turned to killing when the CPP's propaganda chief stabbed to death E.Y. Baffo, 
a national liberation movement leader. The political parties were now facing each other in gang warfare. Oh God, when, after Bafu's death, we saw that, oh, I see, if the sin has become killing, then we shall also wake up and kill. Then we started vigorously with anybody. We were fighting here and there. And so we could do similar as they did. We were trying to do it too. And we also swore that if anybody dares to commit a crime on the name of our member, we shall also revenge. And then it became a hectic game. Hectic game, instead of uh, this thing, normal struggle of, for this thing, uh, uh, campaigning for each party after it became a threatening affair. And so that was the end of the game. The action groupers of the National Liberation Movement took control of key areas. CPP supporters in the Ashanti capital, Kumasi, were forced to flee and take refuge in Accra. It became unsafe for Nkrumah and his ministers to visit Ashanti. The governor, Sir Charles Arden Clark, was thought to be a supporter of Nkrumah, and when he came to Kumasi for a routine visit, he received a rough reception. And we were driving along very slowly, and all these people were piled up on the side of the road, so we couldn't drive quickly. And then we, we heard stones hitting the car as we went by. And the agitators were brandishing their fists and yelling in the vernacular. I couldn't understand what they were saying, fortunately, perhaps. The Ashantis had come to the conclusion that it was in Krumah's mouthpiece, and not the mouthpiece of the British government and that uh, anything he came to say, he had previously discussed with Nkrumah, and maybe because Nkrumah could not visit Kumasi at that time, he had come forward as governor to put across Nkrumah's views, and therefore they decided that if Nkrumah could not come, his surrogate should not come. The Northern Territories were also in favor of a federal system of government to protect their region. This was the poorest and least developed part of the Gold Coast. It had been a British protectorate since the days of Queen Victoria. Their chiefs were strongly opposed to the idea of rapid independence and said they feared that the benevolent protection of the British would be replaced by domination by black men from the South. So um, we sent a delegation to Bridging and I spoke for the, for the Northern Territories. And I told them that uh, when the chiefs of the Northern Territories entered into uh, what is it, treaties for protection with the British Crown, um, they understood it to mean not only protection from internal and external uh, threats, but also a responsibility on the part of the British Crown to lead the people, you know, um, to stand on their feet and be able to manage their own affairs. Now, we felt Britain had not honorably uh, played uh, her part in and, and, and that aspect. And I told them that, well, when the first British men came to our place, they told our fathers to look to them and that they were going to lead them step by step into a prosperous and happy uh, 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 country. And they believed them and felt the white man never lied. I, I used that expression, I said, they believed the white man never lied, but it appears you are going back on your word, which means you, <laughs> you are not going to lie to them to use that word. So I thought Britain had a moral obligation, you know, to um, help us out of our present difficulty. In Ashanti, the violence was getting worse. It spread to Accra and even reached the prime minister's house. There was a very strong smell coming up from below. And uh, I thought at the time, you know, it's a bit off to think that this is the Prime Minister's residence, all this dreadful, you can't even sort of sit and chat without this dreadful noise and the awful smells coming up. And suddenly a terrific lot of smoke came up, sort of, you know, yellowy, grey smoke, with a very strong smell of, well, I said, it smells like fireworks. And... Um, when I, as soon as I said this, uh, two of these chaps said, my God, fireworks, you know, and jumped up and went downstairs, and they'd hardly got to the bottom of the steps 
when this terrific explosion happened. And there was a dreadful shattering of glass, you know, and all this sort of thing. But miraculously, nobody was hurt. The police told Nkrumah there was enough gelignite to destroy the building. After two years of violence, the National Liberation Movement campaign had convinced the colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, that yet another election must be held. And Krumer sent his two most trusted colleagues to resist. Now, we had gone to London to try and convince the secretary of state that it was not fair to us, having fought an election in 54, barely two years later, to have to fight a second election before independence. Uh, when we arrived, we found Lennox Boyd absolutely unyielding. And he disarmed us by saying, look, gentlemen, Mr. Bozio, Mr. Benema, if I must put the Ghana Gold Coast Independence Act before Parliament, they must be prepared to back me. I can't go and have it rejected. And their condition is that they would like to hand over to the majority party in the country. And reports they had been having were to the effect that the CPP had lost its majority. We tried to convince him that this was not true, but he would not yield. The CPP faced an opposition united behind a clear demand. They wanted a federal system of government to give power to the regions and prevent domination from Accra. Among the National Liberation Movement's chief campaigners was Joe Appiah, a former close associate of Nkrumah, who had defected to the opposition. He recalls what he told the voters. Basically, I told them of the corruption. I told them of the burdening tyranny that we could foresee ahead. I told them why we had struggled for independence. I told them we did not want to sack the British Raj in order to substitute a black Raj. And I explained to them that in the light of the facts as we saw them, in the light of the evidence available, these were foreboding times. In spite of a vigorous campaign by the opposition, the CPP won with a massive majority. But the National Liberation Movement were not prepared to give up. They refused to take their seats in the Legislative Assembly, refused to discuss independence, and told the Colonial Secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, that although they'd lost the election, they'd won the argument for a federal constitution. Our argument was that we had carried overwhelmingly the northern region, we had carried overwhelmingly the Ashanti region, we had shared the honors equally with the CPP in the Transporter Trust Territory, and that the only areas where they had won decisively were the two eastern and western regions. We also pointed out at the time that whereas it took about seven to 8,000 votes to win a seat in Ashanti or the north, you only needed between two and 3,000 votes to win a seat in one of the eastern or western uh, provinces. So we were claiming then that out of the five regions, since we had effectively carried two and shared the honors with the CPP in the third, there was a strong case for a federal constitution. But the CPP had won 57% of the votes and more than two-thirds of the seats. The British government rejected the federal argument. On September the 18th, 1956, Nkrumah was empowered to announce that full independence would follow in six months. In Ashanti, this provoked a furious reaction. They talked of breaking away from the Gold Coast and renewed threats of violence and disorder. Lennox Boyd, worried by reports that the colony was on the brink of civil war, decided to see for himself. From all over the region, Ashantis traveled to Kamasi to make their strength of feeling known to him. We were greeted by a crowd of, I don't know, 10,000, many thousand Ashanti chanting and bearing banners, some of them dressed in brown, the colour of mourning, the banners saying things like, British don't go, we don't want independence, five weeks before the declared date for independence. And uh, there was a great deal of noise and shouting and display, but uh, not, in fact, any misbehaviour, I don't think. That night, 
the Asanta Heaney was able to talk to Lennox Boyd at a dinner arranged by Colin Russell. And I think Lennox Boyd was very impressed with the uh, courtesy, the genuineness, the strength of appeal of the Asante who, who loved his people and really was their king. And I think Lennox Boyd wanted to do what he could to help the Ashantis. You know, words, just like myself and the other administrative officers in Ashanti, we wanted to help the Ashantis. Naturally, we wanted to see independence coming, but we did want to see some safeguards for the Ashanti. Lennox Boyd flew back to Accra, convinced that some element of power for the regions must be included in the new constitution. Well, Lennox Boyd came smartly up against an immovable object, namely the governor, who was in no way disposed to see anything altered at that stage. No detail of his plan. And although I think they had some fairly amicable discussions, Arden Clark, who was a pretty persuasive fellow, I think um, managed not exactly to persuade Boyd, but to insist that his point of view was the only correct one. And if Boyd started tinkering about with the Constitution at this late stage, then there was going to be trouble and there would have to be gunboats and things like that. Lennox Boyd returned to London and insisted that Nkrumah's two most powerful ministers be sent to see him. He told them that regional assemblies would be included in the new constitution. That was the price of independence. At a London press conference, they appeared to have accepted this with good grace. Well, the constitution which uh, has been uh, laid before Parliament is not different in any way from either the constitution of Canada or Australia or Ceylon. Uh, there have been a few clauses uh, put in, in to make uh, provision for our particular circumstances in the Gold Coast. If we accepted any ideas about regionalism at all, it was just a stop to get independence brought to us or given to us. Uh, but we never really intended to divide the country up uh, what they had failed to achieve to do it for them. Some of the ideas had to be washed away. Nkrumah made his own position on the Constitution clear to his private secretary. Yeah, there was an occasion um, just before full independence, when I was working directly for Nkrumah for, for a period, and um, Nkrumah w w was proposing to, to do something or other which, which, which wasn't in accordance with the Constitution, and I, and I, I pointed this out to him. And he, he, he said very directly and positively, right, when I told him that, that, that this was unconstitutional, he said, Mr. Codrington, I can drive a coach and horses through this constitution. And after independence, I certainly will. Well, so sure enough, he did, too. Independence came on March the 6th, 1957. began as agitator, then he became popular leader. He continued to go further, and now he is Ghana's prime minister. Ghana. Ghana is the name. Ghana. We wish to proclaim, we will be jolly, merry and gay, the 6th of March, Independence Day. Ghana was the first black African country to win its freedom. Within the next 10 years, another 31 were to gain independence. The battle has ended. And thus, Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. I want you all, those who have hats on, to take off your hats and let the band ring our national anthem. And from now on, that 
That national anthem is the national anthem of the Gogo to be played on all occasions. of March 1957 when the Gold Coast successfully get your independence official. Ghana. Ghana is the name. Ghana. We wish to proclaim we will be jolly, merry and gay the 6th of March Independence Day. There's a hardcover book of this series available from the ABC shop in your capital city. End of Empire will return in two weeks. Next Sunday, we'll bring you the premiere of Wagner's epic music drama, The Ring, beginning with The Rhine Girl. Don't miss the simulcast of the controversial Bayreuth centenary production of part one of Wagner's Ring, next Sunday at 8.30. Stay with us now for our stereo special, Schulte and the Chicago, following the news. We wish to proclaim, we will be jolly, merry and gay, the 6th of March, Independence Day. Mau Mau, the rebellion against British rule in Kenya, awakened the deepest European fears of primitive African savagery. The British saw in it the work of the devil himself. In 1952, when Sir Evelyn Baring arrived as governor, he faced a rising that was to shake colonial rule throughout Africa. To the white settlers, this was home. They had created Kenya. And whatever Britain might want, they were determined to stay on top. In 1922, Churchill gave the settlers a promise. He said, this land is yours, the settlers, in perpetuity, not only for you, for your children and your grandchildren. 30,000 white settlers dominated 5 million Africans. In Kenya's most fertile area, the White Highlands, Africans could not own land, only labor on the white man's farms. Let's be blunt. The <clears throat> Europeans, number one, Asians, number two and a quarter, Africans, number four and a half. They had no status at all. They were laborers, they were servants, they were what have you. Originally, Britain wanted Kenya only as a link to areas deeper inside Africa. The Kikuyu, the largest tribe in Kenya, had been reduced to a narrow tribal reserve. Hemming in their growing population were the White Highlands. The capital, Nairobi, became a magnet for the Kikuyu, the most energetic and commercial of Kenya's tribes. While the British advertised farmland for white settlement, Kikuyu land hunger in their overcrowded reserve became intense. Among the tribes, they led the agitation for political change. They sent a young Kikuyu, Jomo Kenyatta, to England to put their case. He pressed for the return of their land and a share in government. When he came home in 1946, he was greeted as a national hero. 
Many Africans had fought in the war, seen white men killed. Kenyatta led them in a new militancy. He seemed to have um, a synthesis of um, modernism and atavism. He seemed to be totally attuned to the uh, background of his people, to their practices, their customs, their superstitions. He knew about uh, Russia and Britain. He was a very broadly informed, human sort of man. But I never felt uh, other than dominated by his uh, vibrant personality, his sort of um, hypnotic masculinity, and uh, one felt enveloped by his warmth, and at the same time slightly repelled by his menace. He had the magnetism, absolute magnetism, and he, he, he could uh, put anybody to ash by looking at him. And Hitler had the same thing, apparently, as far as his eyes. That man, he had something. It's the only time in the whole of my life that I actually felt the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. In, in a way, he, he, he appeared to be rather like a very flamboyant black bookmaker, enormous great rings on his fingers, a very ornate stick, and very impressive eyes, rather sort of bored into. Uh, it, coupled with the fact that you knew he was determined to ruin everything in your district, if he could, um, had a terrible effect on one. The British blamed Kenyatta for Kikuyu resistance to land improvement. Some Kikuyu felt that only violence would drive the whites out. They slashed the legs of white-owned cattle, tore out their intestines, and left them in agony under the African sun. The Kikuyu had always used magic and blood sacrifice. To break their ritual oaths was thought fatal. In 1950, the radical Kikuyus secretly founded Mau Mau and invented a new oath to unite the people in revolt against British rule. Young militants used Kenyatta's party, the Kenya African Union, Cow, as a cover. We had uh, oath in places in Nairobi and other areas. This was being organized under the umbrella of the Kenya African Union, and nobody would su su suspect, because sometimes we used to have our meetings in my office in Kiburi House. After having cow meeting uh, in the evening, then later at night, we bring our central committee of Mau Mau uh, when everybody else who is not a member has left. We knew our people were ignorant and they were ruled by the tradition customs and where they thought that uh, they had that uh, oath could kill. And we tried to exploit the ignorance of our people. Mamao killed many pro-British Kikuyu and those who refused to take the oath. There were also the other forms of intimidation, uh, disemboweling cats and, and uh, pinning them to boards outside somebody's house with a, a, a notice underneath uh, making various statements to the effect that if uh, there was any further trouble from him, he would be murdered, that sort of thing. Various forms of intimidation, but uh, it had a, a universal effect. The slaughter grew, both in numbers and ferocity. The British were convinced they knew who was behind Mau Mau and its killings. It's very difficult not to conclude that, that uh, Kenyatta himself was the, was the originator of it. I was completely convinced that he was the actual leader of the Mau Mau, that he'd started the whole thing, that he was responsible for inventing the oaths that they had to take. I have no doubt that he instituted Mau Mau and kept it going. I'm quite sure, yes, that he was responsible to start with. I knew perfectly well that headmen were being murdered and their huts set on fire with them locked inside and so on. Most Kikuyu were just as certain. Kenyatta, their leader, ran Mau Mau. But the men who did disagree. How much did Kenyatta know about the organization of Mau Mau? 
I think he knew nothing. At all? At all. Kenyatta was among the older generation, so we feared that uh, if he knew much, he may disagree with what we were thinking of doing. So it was only the younger generation which had decided that because all other means have failed, we must use violence. He was not active in uh, uh, of that organization, and we did not want him to be active in that one. You and he did not know who were leading. Kenyatta did not know who the leaders were? No, and he could not uh, say who was uh, uh, steering the, the wheel. Kenyatta had avoided taking sides. In 1952, the British persuaded him to do so. At a mass rally alongside the pro-British chief Waruhiu, he cursed Mao Mao. I think he was cornered. They, they forced him to denounce Mao Mao. And I think he did not know what to do about it. So he, he used a Kikuyu proverb, which, uh, uh, which said that uh, Mao Mao should uh, go under the roots of the tree, Miriam Kongoe, and which actually means go into the drains and never to come back. So it was taken very seriously by people. Kenyatta's curse led the Mau Mau Central Committee to summon him. When he came, we told him how we are disappointed. In fact, uh, this was, that was the time when the Central Committee introduced itself to him, that we are the Mau Mau Central Committee, we are organizing this and that, and we feel very hurt by your denunciation. Kenyatta was left in no doubt that if he continued to denounce Mau Mau, they would deal with him. Kenyatta would uh, be in a very big uh, trouble. Was that? Even, even uh, to the extent of being killed. It was not a joke by that time. There were no going back. There was the possibility Kenyatta could have been killed? Yes. If definitely. he had tried to go back? Yes. And denounce Mau Mau? What makes you so sure of that? Well, I know because I was the chief organizer and I know what was the... Uh, <laughs> people were serious about it within the movement. They had their local people. If they decide somebody will die, then... and uh, death sentence had been passed by the bench, well, nobody can stop them. <laughs> So there were the local district liquidation squads, were there? Everywhere. They were everywhere. Because, see, there were a lot of traitors, and they had to be stopped. In October 1952, Chief Waruhiu, who had stood beside Kenyatta when he cursed Mau Mau, was murdered by them. Bering had been governor for only a week. Across the grave, he saw Jomo Kenyatta. They did not meet. The whites forced the new governor's hand. Bering declared a state of emergency. Kenyatta was arrested. Troops are in the streets of Nairobi. Sir Evelyn Bering, the governor, salutes the men of the Lancashire Fusiliers who have flown in to help clear his colony of the Mau Mau menace, which has struck fear into Kenya's very heart. More than three and a half thousand have been arrested already. All have to be carefully checked by police security men, for in such a decisive swoop as this, it is all too easy for the innocent to suffer. The objective of this secret society is to drive all white men out of Kenya. All who carry the mark of the Mau Mau must be hunted out so that peace may come to this troubled colony. Mau Mau reaction was bloody. From the Cathedral of the Highlands in Nairobi are born the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Roger Ruck and their six-year-old son, Michael, a British family brutally murdered by the Mau Mau. The Rucks were friends of ours. 
the, the laborer on the farm drove the horses away from the house. And then they went out looking for the horses and they came back to Roger in the evening, well, that's when they committed their atrocities, and said, we found your horse and we've now got the chap who pinched them. He's sitting in the back of your lorry. So Roger came round, took a look into the lorry, and they just started chopping him up from the back. Esme came out when she heard them shouting, and they just walked straight up to her and chopped her up with these pangas, as we call them. And the little boy started crying, and they went up uh, stairs and they chopped up this little boy. Incensed by the murder of the Ruck family, 2,000 Europeans assemble outside Government House in Nairobi. Refused audience with the Governor, Sir Evelyn Baring. The demonstrators attempt to storm Government House. White settlers had always accused the administration of being pro-African. Now, they felt Baring was hiding behind a cordon of black police. By chance, inside Government House was a settler politician. Well, I went along to Baring, and he said, uh, you must go out and control the crowd. I will not go out. One day, another crowd may demand my going out. When I arrived, uh, the settlers were standing their cigarettes on the arms and faces of the police, the black policemen, to get them clear of the doors so they could smash the doors in. Well, I ordered the, the, the police away, and the policemen stood at attention and said, I only take my orders, sir, from the commissioner. And I remember turning round, of course, you must remember, it was terribly intense. I said, where the bloody hell is the commissioner? He was just behind me. And I said, you take your men away. You take your men away. I'll be responsible. Just as we were getting the crowd settled down, the Sultana of Zanzibar, who was naturally a dark-featured woman, came out onto the veranda to look over the crowd. And, of course, they went mad. I remember one South African woman saying, there, there. There, there. Look, they've got the bloody niggers already in the place. The bloody niggers are already in the place. Now that the killing had been turned on them, the whites armed themselves. All Africans were suspect. The fact that your own cook, who'd been with you for 30, 40 years, could be oathed in a way that he could come and kill you. Unbelievable. You'd been a friend to him, you'd been helpful to his children, you'd done this, that and the other over the years. And yet, happily, one night he would come and slit your throat. This they couldn't understand. They couldn't understand the depth of bitterness. All told, 32 settlers were killed by Mau Mau during the emergency. The manner of their deaths created an atmosphere of fear and vengeance. Against this background, Kenyatta and five others were charged with managing Mau Mau. Why have a trial? We didn't want a trial. We thought it was a waste of time and only big publicity to Mau Mau, which a detention order would never have had. As it was, that trial went on for months and months and months. And so the people suddenly said, well, this chap must be a good chap. Now he's OK. He's been tried by the white people. They all thought that this was a rigged trial. And by God, it was. Pressure from the House of Commons forced the British to hold a trial. The police searched Kenyatta's papers for evidence, but they found no link with Mau Mau. The administration needed a conviction. After careful consideration, they selected Judge Ransley Thacker to hear the case. Thacker was brought back from retirement uh, on a very high fee to do the dirty work for, for, the, for the government. Uh, in fact, before that, uh, the uh, one uh, registrar and, and a senior judge told me that they had in fact been offered or asked to take this case on condition that they would promise that Kenyatta would be convicted and they had refused to do so. Thakert confided in his clerk to say that it doesn't matter what the defense people say, they can do what they want, but I will make a cast iron judgment, I will make sure that my judgment is so well couched and so well written that even a court of appeal will not change it. I am going to make sure that they convicted and given the maximum sentence. He decided this from right from the start. There's no doubt about it. The battles between the judge and Kenyatta's lawyers attracted world attention. What was not known was the arrangement between Judge Thacker and the government. Thacker, simultaneously while conducting the trial, 
was carrying on a correspondence with the government about special payments to be made to him as he thought it might be dangerous to live in Kenya after bringing in a conviction and therefore he might have to leave the country and retire somewhere else and finally was paid a sum of 20,000 pounds. All sorts of obstacles were put in our way. Uh, defense witnesses were threatened. Uh, in fact, in one particular case, when we brought about 10 or 12 persons to prove an alibi of Kenyatta or prove that in fact he, he did not do what he was supposed to do, including some ministers from the church and the chief and others, they were all arrested as soon as they gave evidence. One key prosecution witness, Rawson Macharia, gave crucial evidence that helped convict Kenyatta. Five years later, he swore to a court that he had been bribed to tell lies. He had written letters from the government, which he showed me, that he would be sent to England, he would be educated there, his family would be supported, and when he came back, he'd be given a job. At that stage, I decided to t take an affidavit from him in which he said that the whole of his evidence was invented, that the other ten witnesses who'd, whose names he'd given were telling the truth and he'd been committing perjury. Macharia's changed evidence was not believed by the courts. Whatever the truth, he had helped secure heavy sentences. The real violence of Mao Mao took place after Kenyatta was arrested. And I believe by arresting the hierarchy of Mao Mao, you put inside those people who were perhaps, their aims were peaceful means, or moderately peaceful, and all the thugs took over. And the killings, the real killings of Mao Mao took place after Kenyatta had been arrested. Kenyatta's conviction persuaded hundreds of young Kikuyu of the need for violent struggle. With few arms and no allies, they operated as small gangs in the forests. Kikuyu, who had prospered under British rule, sent their men to join the Home Guard, armed and trained by the government. The Mau Mau Rebellion had become a civil war. In March 1953, at Lari, a local quarrel over land turned into a massacre. 94 Kikuyu were killed. Mau Mau was blamed. To survive, the Kikuyu swore loyalty to the British by day and the Mau Mau by night. The civil war, African against African, was to last for five years. The pictures from Lari shocked the world. When I got there, there was the most dreadful scene I've ever seen in my life. There were um, huts in flames. A man called ex-chief Luca and his family were burnt to death. Small children had been crucified. Bodies of other families had been mutilated. It was the most horrible scene. Those who had survived the slaughter had been brought here. Most of them to have their wounds treated. Many have since died. It wasn't a pleasant sight. Men and women with their bodies scarred forever by clubs and knives and fire. The stories the wounded told were terrible to hear of the whole village set ablaze and of the savage butchery that followed. Yet the survivors, I suppose, must be counted as the lucky ones. Upon the children, too, the Mau Mau had laid its evil mark. The lucky ones, I wonder.
During 1953, the year after the emergency was declared, the British were desperate to uncover the Mau Mau gangs. We had to get information. We couldn't get information at all. At that stage, the Kikuyu were probably 90% on the side of the Mau Mau. And we felt in order to track down the terrorists, we did resort to third degree. When on the rare occasions we caught a terrorist and tried to interrogate him, to start with, there was no way you could get them to talk. And we and certainly the police and many of the police reserve tried methods that we would never normally accept. Um, electric shocks, that sort of thing. It was a waste of time. It didn't work at all. Kikuyu villages suspected of Mau Mau sympathies were raided. Sasa dio tulika kidogo tukaona askari ya kamatimu na changanyika na ame na kuja saa kumina biri mapema munazikia mirago kuku fugua fugua fugueni kuigia dani ni kupiga njini tu hakuna kitu kigine sasa muka pigua muigine na pigua tena na pere kwa paka huko posti akiwa mahututi the army commander, General Erskine, tried to stop the excesses. He made his first priority the cleaning up of Nairobi, the nerve center of Mau Mau. In April 1954, all Kikuyu in the city were rounded up in a month-long operation. At one stage, at the early stages, one in every three adult males of the entire Kikuyu tribe was in detention. All over Kenya, screening camps had been set up to process the total of 80,000 who were arrested. Before they could even be considered for release, the authorities tried to identify those who had taken the oath. We were trying to deal with it, so to speak, in its own coin. They felt that the oath had bound them and that if they broke the oath, something terrible would happen to them. We were concerned to try to break the power of the oath to, so to speak, cleanse them so that its power was no longer binding. The government even employed witch doctors to decontaminate those who had joined Mau Mau. The vital thing, as far as the administration was concerned, was to get someone to declare that he'd taken an oath. It was thought, in some mysterious way, that as soon as you signed a paper, however you signed it, after half an hour's roughing up, after four hours roughing up, after three weeks roughing up, that as soon as you signed that, you were, in some way, getting rid of this awful atavistic horror that um, had taken hold of you when you first took it. At the same time, the government lured hundreds of fighters out of the forest by generous surrender terms. Forest leaders resorted to ever more extreme oaths to hold their men together. These oaths were read to newly arrived British troops. The aim was to stiffen their hatred of the gangs. The effect was to terrify young national servicemen into killing anything that moved in the forest. These Mau Mau were like animals. They lived in the bush, they had long hair, some of them had game skins, coats around them. They ran on, they carried a gun in one hand and they ran like baboons through the bush. Now in the forest, they were lying down watching you and these poor lads would be coming along 
walking upright, had no experience of bush warfare, it wasn't their fault, but actually fighting against people like that, they were useless. You had to hunt like you hunt a leopard or a lion, and you had to beat these Mau Mau at their own game. There was this chap, he'd seen me, and he was trying to get himself hidden in some stones. So I put a bullet straight behind his head, he came over backwards. His adjutant, the most awful fellow I've ever seen, tall fellow with one eye, long hair, had skins all over him, got up and he took a horrible look at me and took off and I thought I could shoot him like this and I shot and missed him. Then I put the gun up and got him too. Then there was another one running a short way over and I put a bullet, turned out to be a young girl of 16. The ones they used to send in to get their food. <laughs> Ili wichi okuli halea hatu ikite, ile igu. Raka uli vinita haa maisha ni ine maya, ika igu oho, makaya kuwea. Ale ati waga kuma haidio, tolu nao ni megu kuulaga. Waga kuma haidio. Nani magu kuhula, nani ugu ituo. Uchoki ole kio igueta iluo muno na mukada. Na wale ama igua, ni uku heana gaidio, ni uo iuo. Those Kikuyu still held in detention were forced to work. From a Guthi camp came repeated allegations of brutality. I would say that that camp was conducted with restrained harshness and severity, that it was extremely orderly and clean, but that probably a degree of physical violence was used to secure the obedience of those who might be thought to be a danger to the general stability of the camp. Ukekoro ugedugo kaka kuto kali loud, tama ita maria tama ita twendi, talo raiga karai kaudi, kali tio go unyitita. Utengere tio ne digali na shi ili laini o kihora go. Yani kuiga digali udile halimu digali o kibuta go udile gira halimu digali o kibuta go. I got a letter which I couldn't ignore, which said death of detainees in a Guthi camp. And then another letter came from them saying, please act else we shall all be dead. And uh, uh, therefore one had to, I always sent it to the Secretary of State. Of course, for verification, but what was so uh, infuriating was that he always had an administrative inquiry, which meant that the very people who were in charge of the security forces uh, who were committing these atrocities were the ones who sat in judgment on the case. And uh, the uh, whole instinct of the Europeans and those in charge was to cover up, always cover up. The colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, continued to stand by the Kenya government. We were certainly pretty nervous. As civil servants to the Secretary of State, we, we were very anxious that nothing disastrous should happen. But I don't recall any occasion on which uh, any, as it were, explicit request was sent out to the governor by the Secretary of State, keep the violence down. Probably there was more done that didn't come to light than actually did come to light. But our uh, next bike was conscious that there was this uh, Hidden bit of the iceberg of violence, I don't know. But being an astute politician, he couldn't have been totally blind. No, no. I think we all realise there must be a lot more. If there were one or two things going on, there probably was a lot more. It was intrinsic in the whole attitude of the government of Kenya, as uh, blandly endorsed by the Secretary of State, that an African life wasn't as important as a European life. That was the whole, um, you know, almost a subconscious approach of those in charge. 
The entire Kikuyu population was uprooted and herded into protected villages with home guards and watchtowers. This isolated the rural people from the gangs. If they had to build their own villages, it was done by compulsory labor, and we surrounded the villages in areas I was with ditches with spiked bamboos in the bottom. So it really was extremely difficult for anyone or any animal even to get through them. Villagization removed the Kikuyu people from their farms into glorified concentration camps where they were given 23-hour curfews and as a, a battle measure it was very effective. It stopped food supplies to the forest. The measures worked. The tide was turning against the gangs. Growing numbers of Kikuyu came over to the government. Bering hoped that land reform and money for farmers would win over the remainder. While the chiefs accepted medals, the masses still looked to Kenyatta as their leader. We were telling them that Kenyatta would never, ever return to the Kikuyu country. Never, ever. And we were making this promise to the loyalists. We were making it to the general public. This was, of course, uh, supplemented by the fact that Kenyatta's name his house was totally removed, his name was removed from everything. He, he was now to be a non-person. We, we do understand and realize the fears of the European minorities in Kenya. They regard or link Jomo Kenyatta with uh, Mau Mau or terrorism. But we, the African people, know that he is a sincere leader of his people who had devoted all his time to the benefit of the, uh, 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 of the ordinary man. In October 1956, the most wanted Mau Mau fighter of all, Daden Kamathi, was captured, then tried and executed. The war against the gangs was all but over. Officially, more than 11,000 Mau Mau had been killed. Those left in the forest posed no real threat. To avoid more African unrest, the colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, persuaded the settlers to accept an increase in the African share in government. The British were now keen to release the remaining detainees. But these were mostly young and violent, they had resisted all attempts to make them confess the oath. In the camps, they were out of control. There was um, not even the possibility of knowing who most of them were because they made themselves bracelets, uh, which they skillfully hammered like modern watch straps uh, out of the corrugated aluminium huts and they were identified by their own identification and not by district or by name or by tribe or anything else. They had their own identity and their own command. The British attempted to regain control by dividing the prisoners into small groups. They hurled themselves into a vast, tangled human mass. And we then physically moved in and manhandled them without what you might call uh, punitive force or intimidatory force what later came to be known as compelling force. They were taken by the hand, leg, wrist, whatever, and dragged out and frog marched with whatever force was necessary, which was considerable. To handle a tough young man physically is very difficult. Then at Hola Camp in 1959, the use of compelling force went too far. Eleven prisoners, refusing to work, were beaten to death by African warders. The outcry shook the House of Commons. There we had the evidence, and uh, I was able through those documents to prove to the House of Commons that uh, these men had in fact 
been clubbed to death by illegal behaviour uh, and the running of the camp. The government of Harold Macmillan was shaken when one of their own leading backbenchers, a former minister, savaged them. They had been warned that the policy which was being adopted could have this kind of result. Accordingly, the people who had adopted that policy must be held responsible for it. That was my argument, and that is my belief still. And that would mean that the governor himself would have to accept responsibility unless he could clearly be vested in someone else who had acted without his knowledge or authority. The people who were involved in Hora were the same people who'd been involved in what is really a remarkable feat in getting over 70,000 Mamar detainees out of the camps back into ordinary life. We all realize that we made mistakes from the top to the bottom, all of us. We are trying to put them right, the mistakes we've made. And we've had a committee who, something like it, been looking in to what we should do in the future. No senior official was dismissed over Hola. Some months later, Baring himself retired as planned. After Hola, the British released the remaining detainees. They simply went home. The cabinet decided Britain could no longer sustain white settler power in Kenya. Instead, the new colonial secretary, Ian MacLeod, announced Britain must come to terms with the growing force of African nationalism. MacLeod was not a man who minced words. He told everybody that the European position was really going to be dismantled. The sense of shock on the part of the local Europeans was immense, and I think the sense of shock to the colonial administration was equally great. We were really quite taken aback by the swiftness of uh, determined change. Was MacLeod ready to listen to reasoned opposition to the speed at which he wanted to go? No. He hardly listened to anybody. That chap can't look you in the eyes. He gave you a limp handshake, said he had no preconceived ideas. That meant he had every preconceived idea. And apparently he's a brilliant bridge player, and chicanery was his art of bridge playing. And as far as his policy is concerned, I think he stank. Why couldn't he tell us the truth? MacLeod played his cards carefully. In January 1960, he called all Kenya's leading politicians to a meeting in London. MacLeod and I were discussing the general position of decolonization, really, you know, and how the timing should go, when all of a sudden a man brought in a message, in other words, a telegram. And MacLeod opened this telegram and read it and gave a great start. And he turned and said, my God, Michael, look at that, look at that. We're going to be the last in Africa instead of the first. And I read the telegram and it was a message from a uh, representative in Brussels to say, that uh, the Belgians had decided immediately to give the Congo independence. Now, that was a tremendous shock to me, because I suddenly realized that MacLeod wasn't at all interested in my fate or Kenya's fate. He was only really interested in whether the British are going to be the first or last in discarding the robes of colonialism. MacLeod decided to give power to the Africans faster than any of them expected. I believe that one day Kenya will be governed by a democratic government, representative and elected by the people. And by the people, I include anybody who decides to make Kenya his home. In how many years? who accepts to be treated as um, an equal citizen with everybody else. After four weeks of argument, McLeod decided it was time to call a halt. He allowed everybody to talk and talk and talk themselves out. I saw very interesting <laughs> discussion because when he knew that we had all talked ourselves off, then he actually came with his proposal. MacLeod announced, to general surprise, an immediate African majority in the Kenyan parliament. But before independence could be granted, two dangers remained. Kenyatta, the British believed, could bring chaos to Kenya. But popular African support for him was so strong that most African politicians now felt obliged to demand his release. 
Will you press for the release of Jomo Kenyatta? Certainly, yes. How? Again, by intensifying our efforts and more pressure on the British government and also the Kenya government and using whatever influences we have gained from this present constitution for um, further efforts to secure his release. The other danger was the die-hard whites. They had always relied on support within the Tory party. They felt betrayed by the Prime Minister. Macmillan feared their hostility would topple him. We were naturally very upset. I mean, when you lived in a country like Kenya, you fought for it, and you root uh, deep in the soil of Kenya because it was our heritage. We'd been promised it was our land in perpetuity. If it was handed over to the blacks, one would have to leave, and your children would lose their heritage. Europeans, unable to accept the idea of black government, were already packing up to leave. To defuse white anxiety, the new governor risked a black explosion. I repeat and confirm that in my view, Jomo Kenyatta's release would be at present a danger to security. The decision is mine. By this statement, I wish to make it clear that accordingly, he will remain under restriction. They wanted people, all the propaganda which they sent round, wanted the people to believe that Kenyatta is an evil uh, leader who had uh, put the country into trouble. And he should never be allowed to come back to life again. The governor's broadcast increased African pressure for Kenyatta's release. When the Kenya African National Union, KANU, won the election, its leaders refused office until Kenyatta was freed. The deadlock now threatened the peaceful transfer of power that Britain wanted. So, in August 1961, Governor Renison bowed to the inevitable. Jomo Kenyatta, the man he had called the leader to darkness and death, returned home to a tumultuous welcome. After his release, Kenyatta accepted the presidency of KANU, a party whose radical platform had included the seizure of European-owned land. The whites were horrified. KANU was a near certainty to take over when Britain left. Kano did give the impression of being excessively extreme. Uh, land confiscation, nationalization of all industry, closing down of foreign investment, excessive Africanization. So naturally, British interests were disturbed because they thought they would have an extreme, perhaps almost communist regime. Kenyatta surprised everyone, white and black. To secure independence, he knew that Kenya needed stability, not a new upheaval. He overruled the radicals. We don't want to rob uh, anybody of, uh, of his property. We're not concerned of robbing people uh, of their property, no. Uh, but what we want to get is power, that is um, the, 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 the government. We want to rule our country. Our main cause for the struggle was to gain our land back. And independence or self-government was only being used as a means of taking back our land. And without, without land, then everybody thought that we had been sold out. Kenyatta was afraid that many of his supporters would grab white-owned land. He needed to buy it for them. He turned to Britain for the money and distributed some land in the White Highlands to African farmers. Kenyatta, with British aid, bought off Kikuyu unrest. He had no place for Mau Mau. He ordered the few fighters left in the forest to come out. Kenyatta gave them nothing, but greeted them as heroes. He's going to be an ordinary citizen, because all he wanted to see is an African flag flying over Kenya. That's all he, he what, what are his followers going to do with their arms? 
uh, their follower and their arm <laughs> will bring, they will bring their arms to me, to their government. The settlers were still wary. They invited him to a meeting in the Highlands. With a good will, all of us, and this is the government policy, we believe that the Kenya is large enough. Kenya potentiality is great. And all of us, and I'm not telling you this because I'm in your meeting, I'm telling you what I believe and what my government believes. That white, brown, black can work together harmoniously in this country and make this country great. And, and Kenyatta said, if I made mistakes, forgive me. If you made mistakes, I forgive you. We must not forget the past, but we must forgive and work together. <laughs> to think, Herr God, we have a statesman who does not want to take our land away, who does not want to kick us all out, who wants to keep the European farming here, who wants to keep the European community. And it did more to reassure the expatriate community than any other speech made by any other leader in this country. By Independence Day, the devil, whom the British had consigned to oblivion, had become the hero of white and black alike. week in End of Empire, the empire in Africa declines and its eventual collapse brings down Britain's Prime Minister. And don't forget to join us Tuesday night at 8 for the final program of Focal Point, which looks at the changing character of Sydney's historic rocks area. In 1953, with its empire everywhere falling into decline, the British government tried to put together a huge new state in Central Africa. The colonial secretary said, We, the British, are seeking to build a society founded upon partnership between the races that inhabit Central Africa. We believe that the present scheme provides a framework within which the idea of partnership can take root and grow. But the leader of the white settler community there had different ideas. Sir Godfrey Huggins stated very clearly that the type of partnership that they wanted between black and white was such the same partnership as existed between the rider and the horse. The new state was called the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. 
It advertised for new white immigrants. This is one of the few countries which can still offer a comfortable life with free ways in a climate comparable to any in the world. And hundreds of families have settled down here to give and receive their share of a prosperity growing faster than anywhere else in Africa. Every white man expected to be called Inkosi or Mambo, that is king. Every European housewife was called queen. Every European daughter was princess. Every European son was prince. The whole European community was composed of royalty. The opposition to the Federation was not a question of being against bigger political units. This was a question of the fear that we had as Africans, that the settlers were beginning, beginning to create conditions, political and economic, social and cultural, for another South Africa. This was done against massive opposition. We petitioned the Queen several times. Uh, I was Secretary General of the African National Congress then, and uh, so we really worked very hard, but we failed in the end. It was imposed on us. The ideal was to try and get a truly multiracial society uh, in the center of Africa, having an influence on South Africa to, uh, on the one hand, and the northern Africans who were moving to independence uh, on, the, on the other. And of course, it was a very legitimate purpose and a high ideal. If it could have been done, it would have had, I think, uh, you know, a, a big effect. The scheme affected three colonies that Britain had held since the 19th century. The British hope that federating them together would realize the elusive ambition of racial partnership was up against awkward facts on the ground. In Nyasaland, a mere eight and a half thousand whites were outnumbered by 300 to one. In northern Rhodesia, 70,000 whites by 30 to one. And even the largest white community, the 200,000 in southern Rhodesia, by 12 to one. These racial imbalances were compounded by differences in the political development of the three territories. In southern Rhodesia, white voters, with the few blacks who had been given the vote, elected an all-white parliament. They ran their own government. In the two northern territories, colonial governors, appointed from London, ruled with the help of advisory legislative councils. The coming of federation meant yet a fourth legislature, with members both elected and appointed from all three territories. Further, Britain had two channels of direct involvement. The Commonwealth Office, which had long dealt with Southern Rhodesia, now also dealt with the Federation. And the Colonial Office dealt with Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Thus, two Whitehall offices dealt with three territories, having four governors, and with five governments having a say. The Federation began amid hectic European optimism, personified above all by one man. Once a heavyweight boxing champion, organizer of the train drivers union, and by the coming of Federation, one of the leaders of the white community. My dream for Federation was a simple one. I believed that the economies of the three territories brought together would offer a much greater prospect for the development and the advancement of its people. Uh, and you mustn't forget that even before Federation, there was a considerable amount of association. The currency was a common thing for the area. The railways were, all were common between the two Rhodesias. The airways were common between the two Rhodesias. There were a host of things, and everything looked to me to be much more rosy if the three of us could get together. In the first five years, the rosy economic forecasts for the Federation were amply fulfilled. Salisbury, capital of both Southern Rhodesia and the Federation, became one of the fastest growing investment centers in the world, as hundreds of millions of pounds poured in. Here, at Kariba, a dam was built, creating the biggest man-made lake in the world, to harness the power of the Zambezi River and bring cheap electricity to the Federation. Above all, it increased the efficiency and profits of the northern Rhodesian copper mines. The Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland could not have survived 
the length of time which it did if it were not for copper mines of northern Asia. In those days, copper fetched very good prices on the London Metal Exchange. So there was a lot of money. And all that money went to Salisbury. We were given a small portion of that. Nyasaland was given a small portion of that. But yeah, the most of all of it went to develop southern Rhodesia. There is no doubt that the Federation gave southern Rhodesia a tremendous boost. In those days, northern Rhodesia was powerful economically because copper was booming. So we gained tremendously from those economic advantages. For a rising young southern Rhodesian politician like Ian Smith, the Federal Assembly was obviously the place to be, but it was not without surprises. I haven't seen this picture for a long time of the first federal parliament. This was, of course, the first time we had had this concept of a multiracial parliament with black people in the parliament. And I was surprised at how able some of them were, particularly Wellington Chair, one of the most able parliamentary debaters I think I've ever met. Uh, there were only six, six of us as African members of parliament. I remember a number of people in this picture. There is Sairoi Walensky there. He was always heckling me, and I heckled him back. I've always held him in great respect, and I often warned my own uh, colleagues in the House to be careful in, in interrupting him. He was one of the few Africans that was very eloquent, very able to think, and think on his feet. He had a facility for rattling Roy Walensky when Roy was Prime Minister. And uh, we all commented on that, even Roy's friends. We had also an implacable enemy in Ian Smith. He looked at us with contempt and actually said that we'd never get independence at all as black people because he believed that we're incapable, backward, and unintelligent. And indeed, there are several of them there. The majority of them were very much opposed to us. I'm no supporter of one man, one vote today, so my view hadn't changed since then. I believe that equality to French houses is the answer, and I still believe that. Why is that? I believe that, that you get much better representation uh, of, of the country if you set down minimum qualifications for people to vote. If you give people something for nothing, they don't really appreciate it. Although the introduction of Wellington Chiwa and five other blacks in the Federal Assembly was Britain's attempt to steer Rhodesia away from a South African style of politics, the 26 elected white members won all the votes. 14 of them represented the most established white community, Southern Rhodesia. It was clear where the pressure would come. One of the biggest problems that faced the federal prime minister at any time, whether it was Huggins or myself, was the need to carry southern Rhodesia uh, with one in any decisions that were taken. People are apt to forget that southern Rhodesia was the only other consenting party to the creation of the federation. The two northern territories were put into the federation by Her Majesty's government, but southern Rhodesia held a plebiscite on it. I think the older brand of white Rhodesian was much more tolerant than many of the newcomers. Uh, we brought in a tremendous number of immigrants uh, as the Federation developed. We needed their skills and that kind of thing. It was selective. A lot of them were people from the United Kingdom, but also quite a, a large number had come from various other parts of what was the British Empire that was then beginning to fall to pieces. And these people, many of them were in fact fighting the sort of last round of the British Empire, the last round of the bout. Sir Godfrey Huggins, he of the rider and the horse, long Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia, moved up to be first Prime Minister of the Federation. So it became necessary to elect a new leader in Southern Rhodesia. The idealism of the Federation really attracted me because we were going to work together this whole big, organ this whole big area of land with all its peoples. And I knew it could only be successful 
if we really worked together and if we persuaded the people to come along with us. In southern Rhodesia, the whites only really had a vote. They voted for it. They were prepared to change their ratio of whites to black from about 1 to 16 to, I think, about 1 to 60 in the wider federation. That made me believe that they were sensible enough to see that there would have to be a complete change of attitude. He was prepared to lower standards in order to provoke advancement of the black people. That, that was his dedication, to bring on the black people. Well, I, I think most Rhodesians were sufficiently sensible to realize that it had to take place. But they believed it should be controlled, that we should have some sort of a, a qualification. If you made any move towards sharing power, you were going too fast. <clears throat> but in fact, of course, I was going far too slow. Um, unless we had been prepared, all of us, to go a lot more quickly than I was going, I'm afraid we couldn't eventually uh, escape civil war. Very sad that that's the way it was. Todd's government annoyed many whites when it announced that in future, African males should be addressed as Mr, not boy. But when he proposed modestly to increase the tiny number of African voters, and said sex between the races should not be a crime, his cabinet finally rebelled. The fall of um, Gaffel Todd was important for us in that it removed a very powerful white uh, liberal whose word uh, had been believed by most of the whites. Uh, but we had come to the conclusion that no white liberal could help, could advance the African cause because uh, white liberals uh, were preoccupied with the question that the white man should rule the African fairly, whereas the African himself was preoccupied with takeover politics. In the end, as we all know, Garfield Todd came unstuck, not because of outside people, but because of the people within his organization. They came to the conclusion that he was going too fast, and they were the instigators of removing him from office. So his reign was a, a short one, maybe quite an exciting one as far as he was concerned, but he misjudged it. With Todd's fall, the slim hopes of partnership between the races in southern Rhodesia had disappeared. But the British government continued to back the Federation. <laughs> hopes for African advancement in the two northern territories did not lie in the hands of the white settler community but with the colonial office in London. Nyasaland, described by Sir Roy Walensky as an imperial slum, had only been thrown into Federation as an afterthought. Britain's neglect of this backwater was now to make it the primary battleground for the survival of the Federation. Nyasaland was a small country, and uh, I'm afraid its priorities slipped, although we genuinely were going to do things for them kept on finding that other things cropped up which seemed to us more important. And uh, so they got left behind. I think it really is as simple as that. There was no idea of letting them down or anything, but it just failed on its, uh, against other things. Nyasaland nationalists had opposed the Federation from the beginning and had expected the British to protect them. But their concerns were consistently overlooked they decided to appoint a leader who would have some impact on the colonial office. Well, there was a conference of the Nyasaland African Congress in 1957 in Blantyre. It was at that conference that it was decided that I was the only man who could lead this country. I was then practicing medicine in Kumasi, Ashanti, in the then Gold Coast. So I received a telegram saying that, please, Come home. On July the 6th, 1958, Hastings Banda came home. For 40 years, he had lived abroad, mostly in the United States and Britain, and he had forgotten his native language. His return was an impressive moment. I said I had come back home to do two things, to break their stupid federation, I used to call it, and to give you, my people, your own government, so that they were not left in any doubt at all 
about it because I repeat, I did not hide it. I don't believe in ab about beating about the bush. I was blunt from the very beginning. I'd met Banda in London before he came back to Nyaslan, and um, I, I remember recording in my diary uh, that um, he was a fanatic to get Nyaslan in the, made independent and to break up the Federation. He set off on tours right through the protectorate and tens of thousands of people came to his meetings. He started to build up a very tense atmosphere that uh, he could get independence for Nyasaland if they stood behind him. Banda and his fellow nationalists were in a race. Federation's first phase was to end in 1960. Walensky and his white supporters were campaigning for full independence to be given to them then, with the government firmly under the control of the settlers. When the Federation was formed in 1953, it was supposed to be tentative. It would either confirm in seven years or in ten years. And after that confirmation, there would be no looking back. I did not want that confirmation to come. I did not want this country to be a part of a federation or a union like that or the Union of South Africa. So I wanted to make sure that when that review came, Nyasland was out. Whatever Northern Russia and Southern Russia did, that's their business. But Nyasland had to be out. Under Banda's leadership, nationalist protest took a sharp upturn. Rumors ran through the white community of plots to wipe out all Europeans. On January the 25th, 1959, Banda's colleagues held a secret gathering known as the Bush Meeting. Informers told the police that a murder plot was hatched there against, among others, the governor himself. What was meant at the Bush Meeting was to discuss and advise ways of passive resistance. They accused us of plotting the murder of Europeans, but that was not the case at all. It was mainly to advise our delegates who came from all over the country, methods how we could apply the passive resistance. That was our main thing. Although on such an occasion, you know, you would have sometimes hot heads and they would uh, shout, oh, well, what about poisoning this and that? But this was not the basic idea of the whole Bush meeting. My special branch had had the meeting analyzed and we knew, therefore, that they were going to start putting the conclusions they had reached into effect. They began doing this quite early in February and they put out of action the airfields at Fort Hill and Karonga. They destroyed the roads by cutting ditches across them, felling trees across them and um, generally creating the build-up to what uh, we thought would come an attack on civil servants and other Africans in authority. As far as Armitage was concerned, I asked him a question. And the question was whether he could guarantee the safety of the, the Europeans and other people who might need protection in uh, Nyasland if the trouble which we foresaw that was going to happen, could he guarantee their protection? And he said, no, he couldn't. He did not have sufficient forces to, to, to do that. So it was in those circumstances that I took the decision to send up the first white troops to go and occupy the airfields and do that kind of thing to make certain that we could keep communications open. To the blacks of Nyasaland, the arrival of southern Rhodesian troops seemed to herald what they had feared all along, a white settler federal takeover. On March the 3rd, 1959, Sir Robert Armitage declared a state of emergency. Dr. Banda and 1,300 other Nyasaland activists were detained. 
I was in a, in a hospital. Uh, this was two days after the birth of my baby. We drove straight to Zomba prison and I was told to get out of the car. And there were other soldiers who were waiting for me. I couldn't get up because then I was really weak. And um, as you know, uh, a woman after delivery, I was wet, but I was forced out. I had carried my baby in my arm. I got out of the car, really dripping to the ground. And I was pushed through to the door. I staggered around. I almost collapsed, but I, start, I tried to stand. And then I was taken into the room where I was searched. The doctor decided that I should go to the hospital immediately because I was not well. This didn't happen. Mrs. Chibambo and her baby spent the next 13 months in prison. In the north of the territory, arrested local Congress leaders were held on a ship in Nakata Bay. A crowd of Africans were trying to get to the ship and set them free. A young district commissioner faced them, pleaded with them, and then read the riot act to them. To help him hold back a thousand angry Africans at the dock gates, he had five white soldiers of the Royal Rhodesian Regiment. The sergeant twice requested permission to open fire. Um, once he requested and, and I said no. Um, and it went on for some time longer. I was desperately hoping that the reinforcements would appear coming down the hill. He asked a second time and again I refused. And then in due course he said, well, I, I can't be responsible for containing them any longer or words to that effect. And I felt that I had no alternative in the circumstances because by then the gates were forced pretty wide open and he had only got four men under his command. I felt that I had no alternative but to hand over the situation to him, which I did do. He then proceeded in accordance with their um, orders for opening fire. I think his troops took a certain number of paces backwards and uh, he ordered them to open fire. They opened fire. And I remember thinking, oh my God, how long is this going, going to go on for? Subjected to a feeling of utter dejection, I think is in a way I can describe it, that my, my career had, had come to, to this and that I could see no further future for myself in the, in the colonial service and um, for, for, for all that we stood for at that time and had been working for. In all, 51 Africans were killed by police and soldiers during the period of the arrests of Dr. Banda and his 1,300 colleagues of the Nyasaland Congress. In the next few days, an uneasy calm prevailed. Many whites were determined to behave as if things were back to normal. But they weren't. For months, the colonial office had been promising to send a minister with something to offer the Africans. I was over in Kenya and didn't know what was happening. And then I remember very well that Alan Lennox Boyd, who was my boss, got onto the telephone with great difficulty to me and said, you've got to hurry up and go over to Nyasaland. The whole of the country is in an uproar. I found things quieter than I expected, but clearly there had been the three or four days of great anxiety. I went pretty well to each one of the provinces and 
I remember very well going to one of the camps and finding a lot of people in, one, uh, in a big shed sitting down with nothing to do. And uh, I said to them, uh, or they said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Lord Perth. And they said, oh, why didn't you come sooner? We've all been waiting for you. The Nyasaland emergency thrust the Federation to the forefront of British politics. Thousands of people of all shades of opinion demonstrated in support of the Africans. One of the men accused of complicity in the so-called murder plot was by chance in London, campaigning against the Federation, barracked repeatedly by right-wing groups like the League of Empire Loyalists. During the uh, uh, 14 or so months that I lived in London, uh, we did uh, create a lot of hostility to us uh, from certain organizations uh, that were being supported by the federal government and also by South Africa. On April the 8th, 1959, at the Royal Albert Hall, a meeting to protest against the emergency was disrupted by some of Kanyama Chume's noisiest opponents. Not only were some of them shouting, you know, Mau Mau, you know, go back home and that sort of thing, but a few of them came and unfolded this big uh, uh, poster, Hang Chume for sedition. After that, there was, there was, there was a scuffle, a scuffle between uh, them and uh, our supporters. Uh, and when I say supporters, there were more Europeans, or more British, uh, who came to support us, and perhaps, they, uh, perhaps African. Uh, and this did emphasize uh, the fact that uh, this particular group was an isolated group. It did not reflect the feel, feelings and wishes of the British people. Uh, and I'm glad to say they, they were so thoroughly humiliated that thereafter they gave us very, very little trouble. And all rather they were scared to try and they uh, attempt it again. Public disquiet about the Nyasaland emergency led to demands for an independent commission of inquiry. The government decided to appoint a judge, Sir Patrick Devlin, to investigate what had gone wrong. Devlin and his colleagues produced a report that rocked Parliament with its blunt main conclusions. Nyasaland was a police state, they said. The African population was totally opposed to federation and there had been no murder plot. Lord Devlin, I suspect, thought that he was sitting in, in a British court of justice, say the old Bailey, and that he was examining witnesses as he would have examined them in such a court. Now, of course, this was in no way the situation or the conditions that ruled in the emergency in Nyasaland. In the House of Commons, the Labour Party in opposition backed the Africans. They claimed that Sir Robert Armitage had been under the thumb of Sir Roy Walensky when he declared the state of emergency. I must emphasize that the decision uh, to call an emergency was entirely mine. I had no pressure brought on me by the Secretary of State in London or by Walensky uh, in the Federation or any other uh, person who could possibly have thought that they had some influence on me. The Devlin report was very, very important. In fact, it was crucial. Now, I would say it's one of the landmarks in the, in the, in the history of, uh, of Nyasaland. I happened to have been in, uh, in Parliament uh, then, in the British Parliament then, sitting in a, a stranger's, uh, uh, well, let's say, distinguished stranger's galleries uh, with uh, Sir Robert Armitage, who was then the governor. He had issued a, uh, a counter-report to the Devlin Commission. And it was really a very pathetic sight, seeing this man being destroyed by people like uh, Nerin Bevan, uh, and that uh, really uh, he was absolutely, uh, or I think it was really absolutely hopeless. I didn't um, mind being attacked personally. Uh, the thing that annoyed me most of the whole episode uh, was when Devlin said that Nyasland was a police state. Now, that infuriated me. Well, I thought it was unfair, in fact, uh, insofar as it said that uh, Nyasaland was a police state, uh, which I think was um, very much exaggerated uh, the situation. Uh, and it caused an awful lot of trouble, of course, in Parliament. 
of frightful rows in both houses. Within months of the Devlin report, a major change occurred in the British view of white settler colonies. It became publicly known when Prime Minister Harold Macmillan toured Africa early in 1960. I spoke in some of my speeches what I called the wind of change, which is blowing through the continent. The speech which I made in Cape Town to the two houses of the South African Parliament has attracted some attention. And this was perhaps because I made it plain that there were differences of view between our two countries on certain subjects. When I read that speech in Rhodesian Herald, I guessed what was going to happen. When he came to Blanta, he was left in no doubt at all, the reaction of the people, because they told him that he must release me or else there would be no peace in Yasna. So that speech, to me, meant that it was just a matter of time before even I would be coming out of Guelph. The wind of change speech signaled the British government's recognition that it could no longer help white settlers resist African nationalism. The man to implement this shift of policy was Macmillan's new colonial secretary, Ian MacLeod. He immediately wanted to accelerate the rate of release of all detainees, and in particular, uh, Dr. Banda. Uh, I fought him all the way on this because I was determined keep some stability in the country. Armitage, supported by his police chiefs, warned that the release of the detainees, especially Banda, would make Nyasaland ungovernable, but MacLeod overruled him. We eventually reached agreement on a phased program of release for the detainees, but I had to accept that Banda should be released early. McLeod's judgment proved correct. Nyasaland remained calm when Banda was freed and shortly brought to London. For well, we are at last raising the barrier which has unfortunately lain for so long across the road of constitutional <coughs> progress in the territory. I made it plain when I came here that I came here in a spirit of give and take. Of course, everybody knows that. We are not getting what we wanted. But I'm happy to go back home and tell my people I did not get everything. But I was dealing with a man who understood our point of view. Banda received from McLeod assurances that if he was patient, he would, before too long, get what he wanted for Nyasaland. The whites of the Federation were now all the more determined to hold together their heartlands, the two Radishas. While the troubles in Nyasaland grabbed the headlines, Northern Rhodesia, too, had been exploding. Here, African opposition to Federation had been equally strong. The black miners on the Copper Belt had, for some years, merged their industrial grievances with anti-federal feelings. Political strikes repeatedly halted the mines, the Federation's most vital economic asset. But the federal government film unit maintained that all was well. To become a boss boy is the ambition of most Africans. It carries responsibility and higher pay and brings them into closer contact with their European supervisors, whose ability and authority they respect. The companies provide accommodation for the Africans with comforts and facilities that they have never known before, thus making for happiness and contentment. Industrial disputes in northern Rhodesia posed a threat to Britain's supply of copper. Strikes by the black mine workers could always be controlled by force. But similar disruptions from the largely South African white supervisors could not. The colonial government had to listen to the voice of the European settlers. So Arthur Benson was our governor, and uh, he invited us as one group of contending organizations for political power. There were about four or five of us. 
after a few exchanges, Sir Arthur Benson turned around to me very sharply and said, Mr. Kawunda, don't you think that if we met your demands now, settlers would paralyze my government? I said, hello? Your Excellency, do you mean to say that uh, you will only listen to the African majority if we were in a position to paralyze your government? He shall pretend away from me again and uh, did not reply. That stuck into my mind. The British government hoped it could stand in the middle by making some concessions to African demands whilst assuring the whites that they would still be safely in command. In the teeth of fierce settler opposition, Britain announced that for the first time, a small number of Africans would be elected to the Legislative Council. But the militant nationalists who followed Kenneth Kaunda rejected these concessions, instituted a new wave of strikes, and called for a boycott of the elections. Outraged by their strong-arm methods, the governor described Kaunda and his supporters as murder incorporated. He had the leaders picked up and exiled to remote rural areas, where it was thought they would have difficulty communicating with the local inhabitants. Wade had gone around uh, through the, what they call the district messengers, through the district commissioner, that uh, people should get away, should run away from me, because I ate, I loved human flesh especially that of children. <laughs> so each time I went near a group of children in a runaway, I began to find out and uh, discovered the story that had been spread uh, about me. And uh, of course, <laughs> I took a different strategy. I began uh, meeting schoolboys and uh, organized them, through them, their parents. So within three months of my stay there, the uh, there were a number of units, little branches formed of the youth of the Zambia African National Congress. With the black radicals of northern Rhodesia safely out of the way, the settlers confidently looked forward to the review of the Federation, at which they expected to gain independence and not have to worry any more about Whitehall's nagging interest in African advancement. With white control of northern and southern Rhodesia confirmed, the rider would stay firmly astride the horse. Before the review, Britain appointed a royal commission on the future of the Federation. Walensky was determined that it must not consider any of the territories being allowed to break away. I got categorical assurances in 1953 that the British government accepted that there could be no secession unless there was agreement by all the governments that made up the Federation. That is a categorical statement. Walensky therefore felt he had been double-crossed when the Commission, far from endorsing federal independence, recommended that Nyasaland and Northern Rhodesia should be offered the possibility of secession from the Federation. You couldn't uh, guarantee that secession uh, would not arise. Witnesses uh, were brought before the Commission, uh, and you couldn't tell what they were going to say. What you, we did say was that the uh, um, Commission would not um, uh, recommend secession. That was not in their terms of reference to be able to do that. Well, they got very near it. They, they recommended it as an option at a future date. But um, so um, I can see what uh, Roy, uh, Roy Walensky's uh, grievance. I don't admit its validity. The Conference on the Future of Federation finally took place in London in December 1960. It rapidly broke up in disarray. The Federals were now resigned to the secession of Nyasaland, but they were desperate to hold on to northern Rhodesia and its vital copper revenue. Kenneth Kaunda was equally desperate to prevent them. The settlers have their troops and guns with which to enforce Federation. We are fully determined to break up the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Ian MacLeod had himself experienced the force of Kaunda's popular support when he met the leader of the nationalist women's movement, Julia Chickamonica, known as Mama Unip. 
ukuti makala uti areis. Na yamba no kufula no kuka kentambo pa pamutima. No munandi na waka kentambo pamutima kuya mukonke. Kuno wa is olande wino. Ulande wino echo to the fire. To the fire chalo chase. Ah, there's so many. At the chin, 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 chin. Now, much you are shall and I ask Massa no good to take a few mutima, Mugaguate Jaluchi. On the subject of northern Rhodesia, MacLeod faced irreconcilable demands. He therefore did his best to tell both sides what they wanted to hear. I started off by liking the new Secretary of State. And uh, I believed that we were going to be able to work together. He seemed to show an understanding of our problems. And uh, I felt that it was, I, it was my duty to get on as good a possible terms as I could with him. But quite frankly, it didn't last very long because uh, I began to discover a whole host of things that indicated very clearly to me that he wanted things to go at a great, much greater speed than I felt was either safe or good for Central Africa. I mean, if you want to put it in a nutshell, I think that um, uh, Macmillan was a wind of change man, and MacLeod was a, a gale of change uh, man. The Conservative cabinet was now split down the middle. Lord Hume and many ministers backed Walensky. But for MacLeod and the Prime Minister, the time was past when Britain could take the white settlers' side. The Africans could now paralyze northern Rhodesia. At one stage, I said in London, if violence broke out in the North Rhodesia, it would make Mau Mau look like a Sunday morning children's picnic. It wasn't very popular in British circles. <laughs> and uh, I remember Ian McLeod <laughs> hammering me very hard on this one. I said, I meant every word I said. <laughs> He was saying I should apologize to the British public. I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm just telling you facts. Compelled to choose between the white settlers and the Africans, MacLeod came down on the side of the black majority. Many British conservatives regarded MacLeod as a traitor to his race. The two Rhodesias had more white settlers than any other British colony. These people were Britain's kith and kin. They believed they had been promised a secure future in charge of the Federation. MacLeod's decision to pass control to the Africans outraged half his own party. Their anger was expressed in the House of Lords on the 7th of March, 1961. The debate was a general one on the uh, white paper we'd done on, on the Constitution for Northern Rhodesia. And I, uh, if I didn't lead off, I was one of the first speakers. And I defended our record and so on and so forth. Uh, I thought pretty well. And then uh, Lord Salisbury got up. And uh, really, to our surprise, he made a very, very strong attack on our policy, and in particular, on Ian MacLeod, my boss. The white Rhodesians feel suspicion, contempt, almost hatred of the home government. The main responsibility must rest on the present colonial secretary, he has been too clever by half. Ian MacLeod, as you recall, was said to be a very good card player, but this wasn't the way to, 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 to uh, negotiate on, on such important things. And it, it was a very, if you want, a, a very damaging and, and, and hurtful uh, speech. Within months, MacLeod was removed from the colonial office. His career was permanently damaged. But the momentum he had given to the Africans in northern Rhodesia was unstoppable. In 1962, the colony got its first African majority government. The British political party on which Walensky had relied to keep the whites in charge in northern Rhodesia had let him down. To me, the fact that they kept on patting me on the back, telling, swearing to me how loyal they were to the Federation and how much they wanted to continue its, uh, it being alive whilst they were busy turning the knife in my back. I, of course, have got to admit that in many ways I was naive uh, because
because uh, the only thing that I can plead in my own defense is that I had dealt with honorable men in the past, men like Alec Hume, men that I respected and whose word I would have taken. I wasn't perhaps a match for these gentlemen, particularly those who are extremely good at playing cards. Eventually, the Deputy Prime Minister, R.A. Butler, was brought in to sort out the mess. The conflicting promises made by British ministers were now falling due. When I came here in 1916, I said I'd come in the spirit of give and take. This time, I've come in the spirit of take. Nyasaland, at last, four years after Dr. Banda's return, was allowed to leave the Federation. But even at this 11th hour, Walensky was still coming up with schemes for retaining northern Rhodesia. Butler gave him no comfort. Without any preliminaries, he's just read out a statement to us, advising us that the British cabinet had met the previous day and they had agreed that it was absolutely essential to give all the territories the right to secede. And of course, the, I had no doubts that that was the death knell of the Federation in any shape or form. I was given no opportunity to present my own proposals or anything else. Uh, so one of the first things I said to him, because we did continue the discussion, and one of the first things I said to him was, Secretary of State, I'd be grateful if you'd ask one of your officials to convey to the British Prime Minister that neither my delegation or I will be attending his lunch because I don't eat with people who stab me in the back. You are a disappointed man, I take it. Yes, I'm not, I'm not only a disappointed man, I feel that uh, I was brought here under false pretenses. Can you say anything at all about your own personal future now? Well, if people are concerned about me continuing in politics, I certainly don't intend to intervene in territorial politics. So it probably means the end of me politically. It's all right, thank you. Good night. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. There lies the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasmin, dead, buried, stabbed in the back by Mr. McMillan. Well, it may have been crazily optimistic. I just said it was. I think probably it was. The idea of federation was good, but uh, the Africans did not like this partnership between the horse and the rider. They didn't like being horses. The Federation was founded on the concept of partnership, which meant, of course, consultation and the consent of the people. Well, there was no partnership. There was no consultation. There was no consent. I think it was a classical example of British political expediency. Diplomacy, if you like. I'm one of those people who says diplomacy is a word special to the British Foreign Office. They coined it. To me, it is a polite word for deception, because that's certainly what happened to us over the Federation, and I think there are many other people in the world who would echo the sentiment which I have just expressed. In 1964, Nyasaland became independent as Malawi, and northern Rhodesia as Zambia. Southern Rhodesia continued under the rule of the white settlers. bring you the final episode of End of Empire next Sunday, when the 15-year rebellion of Rhodesia's whites is examined. And remember, the book of this series is available from the ABC shop in your capital city. Stay with us now for the mid-evening news, followed by Act Two of The Valkyrie in Wagner's Ring, simulcast with ABC FM.
were many, many, many people who said, what a fantastic thing, what a ridiculous thing, what a stupid thing to think that a few hundred thousand people like this can defy not only Britain, but really the United Nations and the rest of the world and get away with it. What a nerve. Who do they think they are? <laughs> well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've actually won. We have. We have won. Make no difference. By 1964, independence under black rule had been conceded for all Britain's African colonies, except one. In southern Rhodesia, 200,000 white settlers still ruled the colony's three million blacks and were determined to keep it that way. To protect their lifestyle, the most luxurious in Africa, they chose a new prime minister with instructions to fight any British move which threatened white control. The era of civilized control in southern Rhodesia isn't estimated in a period of two years, as some people have tried to. We don't even stretch the era of civilization in southern Rhodesia to a hundred years. As far as we are concerned, it has got to be for all time. <laughs> And of course, ladies and gentlemen, that means only one thing, independence. I went uh, uh, and saw them in 1964 uh, and was frankly horrified. Ian Smith and his cabinet seemed to me to be like a set of white ostriches. Nothing that I or Harold Wilson or anybody else said to them uh, made the slightest difference. I said they'd got minds like Polaroid sunglasses. Uh, only welcome information penetrated. Anything unwelcome simply didn't get through. Smith refused independence on his terms, resolved to seize it by a unilateral declaration of independence. His security advisers told him UDI would be too dangerous. In October 1965, he called them to a meeting. Ian Smith in the chair said that uh, it now had to be a political decision. His colleagues would make that decision. Uh, we were all to prepare for UDI, but await a favorable opportunity for its implementation. Uh, that opportunity came surprisingly within a couple of weeks. The British Prime Minister arrived in Salisbury, desperate to find some compromise to avoid UDI. But Smith rejected any plan that might lead to majority rule. The African leaders looked to Britain to stop Smith, if necessary, by force. I've had to tell them that their demand for Britain to attempt to settle all Rhodesia's constitutional problems with a military invasion. This demand is out. And if there are those in this country who are thinking in terms of a thunderbolt hurtling from the sky and destroying their enemies, a thunderbolt in the shape of the Royal Air Force, <coughs> let me say that thunderbolt will not be coming. I think it was insane. I simply cannot understand the Prime Minister letting Ian Smith know that we wouldn't intervene by force because in a situation where you've so few cards in your hand, uh, you mustn't tell the other side that you have no cards. Uh, this, in effect, gave the Rhodesian government their opportunity. Uh, because, if I remember, it was within a matter of hours that the Rhodesian cabinet met on the 1st of November and confirmed the decision to go for UDI. The following message was sent today from the Prime Minister 
I remind everyone in the services that first and foremost he is the servant of Rhodesia, his country and of its government. The British government will not hesitate to employ every device, legal or otherwise, that occurred to them to sow doubts in the minds of civil servants, members of the armed forces and of the prison service, and to detach these services from their loyalty to the government and to Rhodesia itself. Only Rhodesia could have dared a UDI. In other colonies, the British authorities could quell a settler rebellion, but Rhodesia was unique. They had their own police, civil service, and armed forces under the settlers' control. The only way Britain could stop UDI was by military invasion. But Harold Wilson had a parliamentary majority of only one, and a general election was coming. He feared the reaction of his electorate. An invasion could lead to a long and bloody war with their Rhodesian kith and kin. He asked his civil servants to come up with something else. We civil servants uh, uh, sat in our bath and the only thing we could come up with uh, was some middle course between the extreme of doing nothing, which Harold Wilson obviously wouldn't have, and the extreme of using force unacceptable for many reasons. So all we could think of in the middle was economic sanctions. We believed right from the beginning that sanctions were a farce and that they're not going to work. Joshua Nkomo, the father of Zimbabwe nationalism, had long been fighting for African rights. He had been rounded up along with the other nationalist leaders. The Smith regime kept them in detention for the next 10 years. Sitting in, the, in detention in our camps in Guanakudzingwa, where the railway line passed a few uh, meters away from our, our gate, we could see the tankers go past from Lorenzo Max. And as we had said to Mr. Wilson, when he said the sanctions were the trump card, and, and we said we did not believe they could be a sufficient trump card when Wilson himself had said nothing was going to be done to any uh, petroleum products coming from South Africa. We were worried for I suppose a month or so, uncertain. But nothing terrible happened. In fact, it was a little better than we had expected. And then it gradually got better, not worse. We became industrially self-sufficient. We developed a much broader base to our whole economy and our industry. It was a, a shot in the arm. Sanctions failed to bring the rebels to their knees. Black Commonwealth leaders demanded action Wilson, still determined not to use force, pursued Smith on land and on sea. He pleaded with him to promise the blacks majority rule so Britain could recognize white Rhodesia's independence and shed this thankless responsibility. Wilson made increasingly generous offers, but Smith turned down every one. In 1971, after six years of UDI, the new Conservative government went even further. Smith signed a deal with Sir Alec Douglas Hume. They agreed to remove some discrimination against Africans, but leave the whites in charge of the timetable for majority rule. Smith would go on ruling the country, and Britain would be shot of it. What do you think the Africans will think of the settlement? I think they're the happiest Africans in the world. <laughs> you think they'll approve of this settlement? Yeah. But British governments had always laid down one condition. The Africans must approve the deal. Morning. Britain appointed a royal commission, which dispatched teams across Rhodesia to discover the Africans' opinion. What? sections of the people in Rhodesia should be represented in, in the parliament 
The nationalists seized their opportunity to tell the world they would never trust Smith to deliver majority rule. A moderate, Bishop Muzarewa, was picked as the respectable frontman by the nationalists who were running the campaign. We had no money, we had no funds, we had no transport, but somehow word spread just like wildfire the, throughout the country. And for the first time, uh, you know, everybody was active and it was no independence before majority rule, no independence before majority throughout the country. There will be no mistake uh, in, in their report that this was a very unanimous and definite uh, no from us. To Hume's disappointment, the commission reported the Africans turned down the deal. The nationalists had stopped Smith gaining legal independence, but were no closer to removing him. Many believed this could be done only by force. Ten years earlier, black violence had erupted, but it had been sporadic and disorganized. A group of nationalists, including Robert Mugabe, unhappy with Nkomo's leadership, broke away to form a new party, ZANU. In 1964, they declared war on the Smith regime. Both parties sent guerrilla cadres abroad for training, but for 10 years, they had little impact. We were then in detention, and as these cadres returned from uh, training, uh, there was no real uh, base f within the country for them to operate. We hadn't actually prepared the people for the armed struggle. And now for them to entertain guerrillas who were armed was quite a new experience and uh, a frightful one. And so as these cadres return, having walked long distances from uh, Zambia, they fell just into the hands of the, um, of the security forces and they just came to surrender. Our intelligence was so good at that stage that we knew who was coming, where they were likely to be going. We frequently knew the dates in advance and the place of crossing. Uh, we accounted for any number of groups in that period. Some disappeared without trace because that was the nature of the terrorist war at that stage. Uh, our success rate was as near as damn it, 100%. The villagers believed the guerrillas had little chance against the superior forces of the Smith regime and frequently informed on them. The ZANU leadership realized they needed to change tactics. They turned to the teachings of Mao Zedong. The Chinese instructors in the various camps in Tanzania were educating and instructing uh, our cadres and using the Maoist approach that you must use the people. And amongst the people, you are like a fish in water. Outside the people, without them, you are like a fish outside water. <laughs> Zanu would come at dusk and require the villagers to attend meetings, lasting through the night. Mixing entertainment with politics, they taught the people that if they closed ranks behind the fighters, the Smith regime could be defeated. The major message we were bringing to the people was, now we want our country. We are no more politicians who speak by the word of mouth. We are people who want to fight for our country and get it back through the barrel of the gun, as it was got from us. Our sources of information began to dry up. Uh, a new pattern emerged. Uh, we were reacting to guerrilla activity 
more than in a position to preempt it or do something about it in advance. The Rhodesians were taken by surprise when just before Christmas 1972, the guerrillas launched a series of attacks on isolated farms. Over the next five years, the war spread throughout the country as thousands of guerrillas infiltrated. Rhodesia had been protected by its white neighbors, South Africa and Mozambique, leaving Zambia the guerrillas only route in. When the Portuguese left Mozambique, the whole of Rhodesia became vulnerable to attack from the east. With Nkomo's forces still infiltrating from Zambia and Mugabe's now coming from Mozambique, the Rhodesian security forces had over a thousand miles of border to guard. They could no longer stop the guerrillas coming. The guerrillas would strike without warning, only to vanish afterwards among the local people. Using anti-terrorist techniques learned fighting with the British in Malaya and Kenya, the Rhodesian security forces hit hard at villages suspected of sheltering guerrillas. The black population was caught between the demands of the security forces for information and the guerrillas' retribution if they talked. We don't think Rhodesia's about to collapse. No, I don't think so at all. I don't know why we should think that at all. We've had no indication that there's going to be any uh, a fear of religious what, what about the wall that's going on? Don't you notice the wall? Yes, I've got a sun in the wall. But um, doesn't that make a difference to you? Um, no, I don't like the wall. That's the one part I don't like, but it's essential. They ought to have known that we were losing. But because of the effects of propaganda in the country, uh, it probably wasn't fully enough appreciated by the bulk of the whites that uh, we had now moved into that not only no-win situation, but losing situation. The guerrilla war had accomplished what British diplomacy had failed to. The Smith regime was now ready to bring blacks into government, but not Mugabe. Released from detention, he fled across the border to ZANU's guerrilla base in Mozambique and joined forces with Nkomo in an uneasy alliance called the Patriotic Front. Ian Smith looked for a moderate black leader inside the country. We started negotiating with the internal black people as a result of a suggestion put to me by Alec Douglas Hume. He said, can't you get together with some of your internal blacks? Because if you can make a solution which clearly indicates that the blacks are in, and in fact that the blacks are in the majority, he said, I believe the whole world will have to accept that. Smith tried a clever trick. He agreed to form a government with a majority of black ministers, thus securing Bishop Muzarewa as his front man. But he ensured that real power stayed with the whites by keeping the civil service and security forces firmly in white hands. Smith and Muzarewa argued that with a black government in office, there was no reason for the guerrillas to keep fighting and the world should accept Rhodesia's independence as legitimate. I'm thinking that independence per there Salisbury is... There is, is no birth. independence in Salisbury and you know it. That is irrelevant to us. If you didn't know that, know it now. I, I know. That is irrelevant. I know that's your We argument. are fighting to get the transfer of power. If the two or three chaps decide to join Smith, they become part and parcel of the regime against which we are fighting. And it doesn't matter whether that regime has got black or white face. That's not what we are fighting. We are not fighting against Smith because he's a white man. We're fighting against Smith because his regime is unacceptable. It is a, a, it is a fascist regime, it is a racist regime, and that's all there is to it. responded to the call to lay down their arms by bringing the war to the heart of Salisbury. 
they ignited Rhodesia's largest petrol depot, destroying millions of gallons of fuel. Smith's scheme to end the war had failed. This is Earth of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. The time is nine o'clock. In Rhodesia, the illegal regime had adopted the name Zimbabwe Rhodesia. In April 1979, Smith held the country's first majority rule election. Bishop Muzarewa succeeded him as prime minister, but the regime remained an international outcast. They had only one hope left. Two weeks after Muzarewa, Mrs. Thatcher won her election. If she recognized Muzarewa's government, Rhodesia would be legally independent. No one questions that there is a majority of black traditions in Parliament, a majority of black ministers in the Cabinet, and a black Prime Minister. Now, starting from that basis, we believe that there is a possibility of getting some agreement on going forward. And I would say this very, very firmly. Unfortunately, there is still terrorism operating. But we must make certain that the bullet does not beat the ballot. Mrs. Thatcher seemed set on recognizing the Muzarewa regime, but her foreign secretary was not enthusiastic. In my judgment, that would have been really disastrous. I mean, I don't think it would have been, we'd have been driven to it, but what would have happened would be um, uh, that the war would have intensified. I think you would have found that the that the Soviet Union would have become infinitely more involved. And I think the Commonwealth would have broken up. Uh, I think there might very well have been sanctions against Britain in the United Nations. We shouldn't have had a friend in Europe. I mean, it's idle to deny that there were differences of opinion in the Conservative Party about what the, what the right thing to do was. And so it took a bit of time to get ourselves sorted out. Three months after the election, at the Commonwealth Summit in Lusaka, Britain announced that after years on the sidelines, she was going to take center stage. Mrs. Thatcher backed away from recognizing the Muzarewa government. Instead, she offered the Patriotic Front guerrillas, whom previously she had labeled terrorists, an equal place with the Muzarewa government at a conference in London. Mrs. Thatcher's U-turn infuriated the conservative right wing. They mobilized for attack at the annual party conference in Blackpool. I must say, I went up to Blackpool with a certain amount of, uh, of, of trepidation. Uh, you know, hang carrying some banners around the, around the and, and, and the hall filled up all during lunch. Uh, it, 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 there wasn't a seat to be had. Everybody forecast there was going to be blood on the floor and it was going to be mine. We all want peace in Rhodesia, but not peace at any price. The Conservative Party cannot weigh the pro-Soviet, totalitarian, terrorist patriotic front in the same scale as the pro-Western, pro-democratic government of Bishop Muzarek. I ask you to face the fact so long as the British government supports sanctions and continue sanctions, we are supporting the patriotic front and we are supporting the drive of Soviet imperialism in Africa. Think what it would mean if we threw over the chance of a settlement at this stage. I believe that the government were right to try to get a settlement were right, even at this 11th hour, to seek to get the parties together, were right to get the backing of the Commonwealth, were right to take this chance, once and for all, of ending the war. I give you my word that it will not be the fault of this government if we fail. Lord Carrington and Mrs. Thatcher carried their party, but their biggest problem still remained. 
When the Lancaster House Conference opened on the 10th of September 1979, the Rhodesian War came to London. With diplomacy their only weapon, the British hoped they could bluff each side into believing it would form the government of independent Zimbabwe. Bishop Muzarewa came to Lancaster House because it was his only way to win legal recognition. It was not clear he was in charge of his team. His colleague, Ian Smith, had outwitted the British before. The Rhodesians hoped the PF would walk out, leaving Carrington no option but to settle with them. Patriotic front leader Joshua Nkomo hoped a deal could be reached, leading to fresh elections, which he believed he would win. He was reluctantly accompanied by his partner, Robert Mugabe, who thought victory in war more likely than the conference to bring his party to power. Our position is that uh, we are the genuine and authentic representatives of the people of Zimbabwe. And we haven't acquired that title by some, some monkey tricks. It's been by dying in battle. And we have that obligation. Some of us see mass graves as we sit in that conference. Everybody viewed it, the, the conference, as the greatest possible distrust. I mean, and me. I hated every minute of it. It was, it was a, 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 an appalling, uh, nerve-wracking business because the consequences of it going wrong, I mean, not just for the people who were fighting the war, not to, to just because of the, that, but I mean, the consequences to Britain and British policy were really rather frightening. Carrington wanted a British governor in charge while new elections were held. But first, he had to get Muzarewa to stand down. The bishop had sent for me some time after midnight. It was about two o'clock in the morning, I think, that I arrived to find him in his bedroom in what I would describe as a prayerful mode. Fortunately, he didn't ask me to get down and pray with him, though he had done on other occasions. He was worried that, uh, as he put it, he was on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, whether to accept now what the British were proposing, which was in effect that he should stand on as Prime Minister and accept a British governor during the elections. We discussed it, and neither of us could think of any precedent in the history of Africa where any African leader had relinquished power and ever been able to recover it. Well, uh, to, to be honest and frank, I, uh, I did not like it, thinking humanly. But um, after some thought and prayer overnight, I decided to step down. The Bishop Mazareva told us that he had made the decision based on political intelligence and his own understanding of what the British had in mind for him and for the country that he was uh, looking to the Foreign Office in Britain and to God to see him right, which perhaps was expecting a little bit too much from two such unlikely collaborators. I could see through the Lancaster House agreement early on. I remember telling them, Carrington as well, that that constitution they were trying to sell us would give us a PF government. At that time, remember, Mugabe and Nkomo were together. They accused me of being an alarmist. This was the talk in the corridors. Uh, I remember Lord Carrington saying to me, but my dear Mr. Smith, the whole thing has been planned to ensure that that will not take place. Smith, unable to persuade the Salisbury delegation to heed his warning, left for home. He was succeeded as the figure the white Rhodesians relied on to safeguard their interests by General Walls. Suspicious of Foreign Office assurances, he sought a meeting with Mrs. Thatcher. She said certain things to me which made me think that the kind of political solution for which we had always hoped, uh, non-racial, multi-interest, anti-Marxist, that kind of political solution, was going to triumph. And uh, unhappy though we may have been, one had to accept those assurances that it was that was the general flow, the way it was going to work. 
Having secured the Salisbury delegation's agreement, Carrington tried to make the PF follow suit. This evening, Lord Carrington pretended that all had been well, pretended that there had been progress. As far as the Patriotic Front is concerned, there have not been discussions at all with anybody in respect of the substantive matters regarding the ceasefire. And we insist that there can never be any agreement. This is just rubbish, absolute rubbish. Nobody will take cognizance of it. With our government's acceptance of the British proposals, I believe there's a way open uh, for a fairly quick return to normality as far as the political scene is concerned. But with or without the Patriotic Front? Uh, with or without the Patriotic Front. Thank you, you've answered it. I don't care. But if the front doesn't come in, General, the war will go on. That's right. And then the front will be demolished. With the conference still in progress, the Rhodesian security forces launched an all-out assault. They unleashed destruction on both Zambia and Mozambique in a final attempt to demolish the Patriotic Front. They carried out very extensive raids all the way down the Limpopo Valley, very nearly to the capital of Mozambique. The military temperature was rising all the time, and unless we did something fast to bring things to a conclusion, everything that had been gained in the conference would be thrown away. Carrington and Mrs. Thatcher took an enormous risk. They sent Lord Soames out as governor, even though no ceasefire had been agreed. Carrington gambled that if he moved forward with Musarewa's government, the PF would not want to be left out. For the first time in its history, Rhodesia was ruled by a British governor alone. His only warm welcome was from a small group of loyalists outside Government House. It didn't change my mind. I was going to a very tricky situation. It didn't alter that. And of course, the fact that I was arriving before Lancaster House was finished made it a lot harder. With his governor a sitting target in Salisbury, Carrington tried to push the Patriotic Front into signing. We've been given an ultimatum for 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Is it 11? Yeah. For 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. The answer is a clear and eloquent no to Carrington. The answer is no. And he and his governor can go hang. There is a limit to power. And here, Carrington's power ends. If he wants to wreck it, let him go ahead. He has a British governor stuck in Salisbury. And as far as we are concerned, our orders to escalate the armed struggle stand. And if need be, we will issue fresh ones this week. And it will be all out war with a British governor in place. The final session of the conference ended in failure. Mugabe, not trusting the British, raised objections to details. He believed that if he continued the war, he would eventually win independence on his own terms. But he needed the support of one man, President Samora Machel, who provided his base in Mozambique. For eight years, the Marxist leader had been Mugabe's crucial ally. The Foreign Office made this appeal to the President. There was a chance, and there wouldn't be another one, for Mozambique to escape the consequences of the war continuing. Uh, President Machel had exerted his influence with the Patriotic Front before. Um, if ever there was the moment to do so, it was, it was now. Mozambique had a representative at the conference. He relayed the British appeal to President Machel and received fresh instructions. I eventually had to convey a message to the Patriotic Front that we, the Mozambican government, did not feel that there were any issues at stake at that stage of the conference which would justify 
uh, the, the breaking of the conference, that we were not willing to accept the blame for the conference breaking on such minor issues. And I think it was a way of, of, of assuring the Zimbabweans, of assuring Mugabe and Komo that they could take this plunge. We were with them for that plunge. But if they did not take the plunge, then um, things were not going to be as they had been before. Machel's message arrived as Mugabe was leaving London to take his case to the United Nations. He abandoned his flight and accepted the agreement. Yes, even as I signed the document, I, I was not a happy man at all. I felt uh, we had been cheated to some extent, that uh, we had agreed to uh, um, a deal which would, to some extent, rob us of uh, the victory we had uh, hoped we would achieve uh, in the field. Nos levou em em breve. É que a Magreta é corajosa. Não tem vergonha de ler as páginas da história. Enquanto outros governos não. Eles poderiam perguntar por que que apoia um, um, uma senhora que é do conservador, mas quando tem a razão e quando tem a força para isso, quando tem a razão e quando tem a força para isso, nós apoiamos. E já resolveu o problema rodiziano. Portanto, não falhamos. To get agreement on paper had been difficult. To get it implemented on the ground would be even harder. Lord Soames had to conduct an election under the guns of two armies. He had to rely on one, the Rhodesian security forces, to keep order, with no way to make them obey. I mean, I didn't have command as commander-in-chief of the forces over the security forces that a governor would normally expect to have. I mean, I had to persuade and cajole and carry along and, and just interfere where I thought it was all right to interfere and sometimes close my eyes to what um, I, I would normally have liked to interfere with if I felt I'd really had the power so to do. The governor's only troops were a few hundred lightly armed Commonwealth soldiers waiting in 16 remote assembly points to which the guerrilla commanders had promised their men would come. British intelligence repeatedly said that uh, there was something like six or eight thousand uh, Zanla guerrillas inside the country. But when we were now asked to declare uh, how many guerrillas we had, uh, we chose to declare 20,000. If everybody thought we had 8,000 and were willing to deliver 20, then clearly we didn't have anybody else left. In fact, we had um, a very large army left uh, who remained as political commissars in the country, just simply to assure that uh, uh, we would win the election. By this morning, another thousand or more had checked in, bringing the latest total to over 17,000 men from all over the country, but mainly in the east and northeast, men of Robert Mugabe's Zanla forces. As of this time, the numbers now exceed both British and Rhodesian estimates of how many nationalist guerrillas there are inside the country. The Rhodesians are claiming that many of those coming forward are women and children, quickly recruited to boost PF numbers. They sent in their Mojibas, that's the sort of youth league. Uh, they sent them in with a few anteaten old muskets and a few rusty old weapons uh, that couldn't possibly have been the, the, the terrorist weapons and equipment. Uh, and meantime, the, the terrorists themselves mingled with the population and made damn certain which way they were going to vote in the forthcoming election. <laughs> The Whites placed their hopes on Bishop Muzarewa to defeat the Marxist Mugabe and show the world that a moderate government was the genuine choice of the people. He launched an extravagant campaign under the slogan, I have achieved the peace, back me, I'm the winner.
but this time the opposition was more formidable. The Patriotic Front were no longer a united team, and Como kept the title PF for his own party. Mugabe's ZANU had decided to fight the election separately, to sort out once and for all which of them would be leader. Nkomo's supporters from the minority Ndebele tribe closed ranks behind him. Soon they began to complain of intimidation. To say intimidation is to put it very low. It was not just intimidation, we lost people. We lost the candidate, we lost about 18 to 20 uh, party workers killed by the, the, the young men who were deployed by, by ZANU uh, outside the assemble points. We learned later that they never were uh, committed to assemble points. They were given a task that uh, during elections they would see to it that everyone in that area voted ZANU. Amidst growing accusations of ZANU intimidation, Lord Soames delayed Mugabe's return for three weeks. The biggest crowd ever seen in Rhodesia welcomed home the candidate most feared by the whites. We are the party that fought against the rebellion, the party that fought for legitimacy. We made it possible for Lord Soames to come to Salisbury as governor, but today we have become Lord Soames' number one enemy. I had the same picture that everybody had had, that he was a, something of a Marxist ogre, and that uh, he'd as soon start to try to look at you and all that, and that, uh, that he was... Um, in quotes, a bad man. I mean, that was, that was uh, the image that uh, he'd carried. I want to see the freest and the fairest elections possible in this country, with as many political parties who want to take part in it. But intimidation is rife, violence is rife, and I've got to do everything that I can to minimize this. And hence my ordinance yesterday. Lord Soames gave himself the legal power to ban any party guilty of intimidation. I should warn that should he use those powers to ban ZANU from participating in, in election, then ZANU would hold itself absolved completely from the commitment to the Lancaster House Agreement. I'm saying, Lord Soames, choose. Is it war or peace? It was really the most important decision, I think, which I had to take throughout the whole of the two months leading up to the election. Lord Soames knew that his men in the assembly camps were virtual hostages to thousands of guerrillas tensed for action if he decided to ban ZANU. But the Rhodesian security forces had the power to seize control if they didn't get their way, and they wanted Mugabe banned. There were quite enough people who you know, didn't think like we thought and were prepared to do almost anything to keep uh, Rhodesia under white control. As he drove away from an election rally, Mugabe narrowly escaped assassination when a bomb exploded under his motorcade. This is another instance of the least said the better. But as Mugabe himself said at a later stage, we had spent years trying to kill each other. There were things went on during the elections uh, that would not have been happening in normal times. A series of bombs exploded across the country. A bus filled with Mozarewa supporters was hit by a rocket. Evidence pointed to clumsy attempts by the security forces to incriminate ZANU. I think it became apparent towards the 
end, I mean, the last week or so, that uh, Mr. Mugabe was going to win, um, I think that it was, uh, at that time, it was not a solution which I thought would be as well received as, <laughs> as some of the others. Some of the governor's foreign office officials advised him to ban ZANU in a few areas of high intimidation. This should take enough seats from Mugabe to stop him coming to power. We got word from within Lord Soames's team that there was a group which wanted us banned. Um, but Lord Soames was said to be resisting this. Among my staff, there was a difference of view here, yeah, a perfectly understandable and acceptable difference of view, but I had to take the decision. I believed he was going to win anyhow. And I used to say, well, you must remember, this is Africa. This isn't little Puddleton in the marsh. And um, they behave differently, and they think nothing of sticking ten poles up each other's whatnot, you know, and doing filthy, beastly things to each other. It, it does happen, I'm afraid. It, it's a very wild thing in a, in a, an election. Lord Soames decided that a partial ban was not worth the risk, because Mugabe was heading for a landslide victory. As polling day dawned, it became clear he was right. Well, I think we realised then that uh, uh, what we'd predicted all along had come to pass. The uh, massive intimidation had had its intended effect. And there was no way this was going to be a free and fair election. There was no way that uh, a, a political solution which any anti-Marxist people could favour could flow from it. I suppose all the times that was the most dangerous. And um, the, the most dangerous thing, I suppose, was the, a coup, a, a white coup. And uh, this was very much, I know, in uh, Lord Soames's mind during the whole of this period. On Sunday the 2nd of March, while the votes were being counted, General Walls, still in control of the army, summoned the governor's top officials to Rhodesian Security Forces headquarters. We reminded the governor's staff of the uh, terms of the agreement, uh, and we asked that the elections be set aside, declared not free and fair. We said that we had promised a free and fair election. There had been an election which, broadly speaking, was free and fair, and we were going to help the government which emerged from it in every way we could. Typical diplomatic language as to why nothing could be done, a wringing of hands and a, well, oh, we can't do anything, and, uh, you know, it's terribly difficult. The United Nations have been here, and people from all over the world are watching us now, and how can we possibly stop it at this stage? We certainly felt that the people we were talking to were beneath contempt. It was a very tense meeting, but there were people who realized fully, and in fact, I believe that Walls also realized that any imprudent action would result in real disaster for the white community. When push came to shove, Walls took the right decision right the way down the line, including deciding that he would not support a coup at the end. And there was much pressure, I have no doubt, put on him for that. Finally, I will recap on the results and the state of the parties. ZANU PF, 57 seats. The Patriotic Front, 20 seats. The UANC, as ZANU supporters celebrated, many whites were packing their bags. Mugabe had to do something to reassure them. He flew to Mozambique to consult President Samora Machel. Samora felt we should also include Ian Smith in the government. But um, we said, OK, we'll think about that one. Uh, so as to kind of uh, 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 
avoid any uh, possible uh, rift in the unity of the nation. But when we went to President Nyerere, President Nyerere said, oh, no, Ian Smith, of course not. Uh, uh, we couldn't go that far, but we felt uh, that uh, we should include some whites in, in, in the government. The governor, now working closely with his prime minister, also advised reconciliation. Mugabe should meet the general he had been fighting for seven years and invite him to stay on as his commander. During the course of the discussion, I said to him, uh, but how can I, uh, as an avowed anti-Marxist, work for a person like you? And he said, well, you must know, General, that the teachings of Karl Marx are identical though, to those of Jesus Christ. And I said, I, I can't possibly accept that, but I, I, I can't argue with you on an intellectual thing like that now. General Walls agreed to serve independent Zimbabwe. Here, as throughout the empire, once British rule was over, the whites who stayed on continued to prosper. It was the minorities at odds with the new regimes who suffered most from the end of the British Empire. That was the final program in our series, End of Empire. Next week, the start of a 13-part documentary series on a very grand scale indeed. It's Soldiers, hosted by author Frederick Forsyth. A preview in a moment.